Chapter 226. Old Revenants. Part 4. I planned on making the decision after Kealia comes back. I want to see what she's able to achieve. I just know that I plan on fighting Atane. I plan on going against his will. Aside from that, I have no concrete plan. Are you feeling conflicted about fighting your father? In truth, I am feeling conflicted. Why? Saibane hesitated for a brief moment before he asked his question. Why are you opposing my father? His plan doesn't suit my style. I know your personality too well to question that answer. I've always been like this. However, my father has the same goal as before. Only his method of achieving his goal has changed. It isn't the same. Regus was firm in denying Saibane's words. Every being born into this world has the right to choose their fate. I don't care about the details of his plan. I just know that he is trying to steal that right from others. Regus was a being that didn't believe in the idea of good and evil. Most in nature lived according to their instinct. The concept of good and evil wasn't something that could be applied to them. For example, carnivores weren't evil for eating herbivores. However, free will was innate. It was a given right that allowed one to defy fate. It didn't matter what species one was born to. This was Regus's belief. During the Dragon Demon War, he had served Atane as his king. Regus had observed the tragedies and turbulence caused by humanity. He had reasonably assumed that this was a byproduct of human nature. Atane had wanted to break this hellish death spiral caused by humans. He wanted to create a utopia. Regus willingly gave his life to the cause. He thought it was something worth attempting. Atane might be right. At some level, I sympathize with the despair he feels. I have lived a really simple life, and you get to see a lot of people. At some point, everyone starts to look like they're in the wrong to me. One had to believe in the concept of evil rather than good if one wanted people to be respectful towards each other. Atane thought a system where everyone feared an outsider would make people respect each other. He thought it would make the humans act more virtuous and moral. Atine's answer for the world had a foundation based on this concept. I don't think the ideal world should be like a farm where the god feeds you for eternity. There are times when one needs to traverse a path, even if it leads to bloodshed and resentment. If we take away the freedom to commit evil, will good really grow in its absence? Saibane was at a loss for words for a brief moment. He just stared at Regus. He was impressed by the content of Regus's words, but it wasn't the sole reason for his reaction. Somehow, you don't sound like yourself, Sir Regus. Kook, you probably thought I was an empty-headed brute. Are you surprised by the fact that I'm able to speak coherent and logical thoughts? No, I didn't mean it like that. Of course, you did. I know I don't sound like myself. In truth, this is a conversation I had with Atane a long time ago. You spoke about it with my father. Yes. He always liked to speak about boring specious arguments. I could write several dozen books about it. It is time for me to make him eat crow. Regus asked a question as he stroked his soul hammer. What are you going to do, Saibane? I made a compact with Albert and Nim. I cannot interfere. It doesn't matter what happens in the outside world. Even if your daughter decides to fight Atane. Saibane's expression crumpled. He looked tormented. The fact that he was able to reunite with his daughter was a miracle in itself. His heart ached when he found out about the life his daughter had led. He felt guilty for abandoning his daughter, but he was just happy that she was alive, and he was able to reunite with her. Niberus didn't blame him. However, complex emotions had developed between the two. It was creating difficulties between the father and daughter. A good amount of time had passed after she arrived here. However, there was an awkwardness between the two of them every time they crossed path. Regus scratched at his cheek. It seems I asked a churlish question. No, it is a problem that I have to own up to. Sibian let out a sigh as he looked up at the sky. However, the feeling of gloominess didn't abate at all. Kealia didn't hide anything when she told her story. She talked about how she died during the Dragon Demon War. She talked about what kind of existence she was right now. Her true nature was very surprising. Her true self was placed within the great darkness, and she was able to project herself to any point in the world. 
there are a lot of restrictions. This became especially true once I decided to go against Atain. The great darkness was too big of a system for one being to monopolize. Of course, Atain possessed the highest administrator privilege even if he couldn't do as he wished with the entirety of the great darkness. For example, Atain could only watch as Regus defected from his side. Atain had given Regus the soul hammer, the ability to transform and other powers. He couldn't take those gifts back from Regus. It was the same for Kaalia. If Atain wanted to eliminate the two of them, he would have to physically fight them. However, he could restrict my actions to a certain degree. Regus Opa was given his body, so he was unaffected. However, I'm still within the great darkness, and I have to project myself into the world. That is why I've run into various problems. Until Kaalia decided to oppose Atain, she was able to use the magical energy of the great darkness. There had been no restriction. Currently, there was a constraint on how much magical energy could be used by Kaalia. Also, I was restricted from viewing the information that were being sent into the great darkness. The only information I'm privy to is the one I gather by projecting my image. That is why my movement has been restricted too. She could immediately project herself to any place on this continent, so spatial restriction had been meaningless to her. She had almost limitless power to do anything she wanted. The where and when hadn't mattered. She had been an absolute being. This was true until Atain revoked her access to those powers. Currently, Kaalia needed reference points to project herself. It was akin to humans having to swivel their head to see where they were. Moreover, she had to gather all her magical energy in order to project her image. If she were to be attacked, her image would be destroyed. However, after hearing her out, Azel queried her. Why are you revealing your weak point to us? I think it is necessary. Do you think I'll accept you? Because you told us about your weak point. Everything you told me might be a lie. Even if you did tell me the truth, it isn't grounds for me to accept you. I guess that's true. When Kaalia just accepted his words, it somehow drained the energy out of Azel. He had put in great efforts for his arguments, yet she just accepted everything he said. What was she trying to pull? Kaalia spoke. Then I have only one card left. If this doesn't work, I'll go back to Regus Opa. What is it? Azel Opa. Azel's expression turned cold. Did she think he'll gloss over everything? Because she called him Opa. It was a ridiculous notion. You told me not to call you by RGC. When did I say that? People treated me with contempt for being cursed, but I was told that I had a unique constitution that would allow me to become a good magician. I was told not to care about the opinions of other people, and that I should live. What? Kaalia ignored Azel's reply. His expression was full of surprise. He had spoken those words to someone before. He had met countless people over the years. He had saved some, and he had watched others die. However, there was one memory that had left a deep impression in him. Even if it wasn't me, I'm sure there were others willing to wipe your face when it became dirty, right? Azel Opa has always been popular. Are you playing with me? He had been looking at her with a stupefied expression on his face. In a flash, Azel revealed his anger. It felt as if she had dirtied a precious memory of his. How did she know about that incident? How can she speak as if it was a first-hand experience? Kaalia had a sad smile on her face as she spoke. It happened a very long time ago. There was a tribe of dragon demon that had been revered as gods by the humans. It was a story of a magician that wanted to exist forever. She hadn't been satisfied with her long life. She had been afraid of her life coming to an end. It was a story about her trying to transcend life and death. At the same time, it was a story about a girl. It was about a girl that believed in hope when she was saved by one person. However, she had died in the end as she felt despair towards humanity. Kaalia spoke about the story she had told Regus. She told Azel about her life. In the distant past, she had created a reincarnation technique. She also told him about how a first-generation dragon demon became the dragon demon king's third wife. She told him about the very long process in between. She told him about the last link leading up to everything. Then, Azel asked his question as if he was in disbelief. 
You were that child. Kealia nodded her head. A knight named Azel saved me. And that is why I was able to live on. She was the girl that had been saved by Azel. She was able to enter into an institution that trained magicians for the human alliance. It was done through Azel's backing. In that place, she was no longer persecuted. She was no longer called the cursed child. It was as Azel had said. Everything had occurred. Because she had the potential to become a magician. She had worked hard. She was an orphan. So there was no one she could lean on. Each day was arduous. Yet she worked to become an excellent magician. I want to help him someday. If it was Azel, he would be able to survive the brutal battlefields. It was a baseless belief. Yet she had armored herself with it. She wanted to become a respectable magician. It would allow her to help Azel. It was a simple dream. However, her dream was broken into pieces by her cruel fate. When surrounded by the dragon demon king's army, the despairing humans had turned on each other. They showed their ugly nature, and the girl had been pushed towards her death. Azel was at a loss for words. The girl he had saved suffered such a horrible death. Azel became aghast, but Kealia spoke to him. Don't be sad. How? Why? My story was all too common during that era. The world was overflowing with tragedies, and mine was just one of many. It was an era overflowing with tragedy. At times, humans were pushed into an extreme situation, and their metal was tested. Most of these tests ended in tragedies. This was the norm. The fact that I suffered such a death, and the fact that I became the enemy of humanity as the third queen of the dragon demon king. It isn't your fault. Azel swayed in place. He felt faint. After awaking in this era, this was the first time he felt such a powerful wave of doubt. He knew it. It was as she said. It wasn't his fault. Azel wasn't a god. The only thing he could do was give hope to a despairing girl. Her life had ended with a tragedy, but that was the territory of fate. It couldn't be helped. Despite knowing this, he felt part of his heartbreak. He had treasured this memory, and it felt as if his belief towards the world was trampled. The proof was standing in front of him. At such times as this, I really hate that I am dead. Kealia extended her hand towards Azel's face. However, he couldn't feel her touch. Her hand would pass through him even if she tried. At the very least, I wanted to hug you. Kealia, you. I know nothing has changed. Kealia let out a shy laughter. Then she spoke with a bright voice. It doesn't matter what past we shared. I was the third queen to the dragon demon king. I killed countless people with my hands. I am Kealia of the Dragon Demon King's army, who fought against you. I'm not asking for forgiveness, and I won't say I'll atone for my actions. I won't purposefully say something that I do not believe in to make myself feel better. I won't do something so revolting. At the end of her life, she felt doubt. However, she didn't feel doubt, because she felt the ideals of the Dragon Demon King's army was wrong. She had become tired of the continuous war and slaughter. Above all else, she hated the fact that she had to fight Azel, who had saved her before. At the time, she had been tormented. She couldn't stand that they had to try to hurt and kill each other. You can hate me. You can denounce and insult me. I don't mind. Kealia spoke the exact opposite of what she was feeling. She spoke as if it didn't bother her. But the girl from the distant past was part of her. The girl, who was saved by Azel, was crying within her. Please don't hate me. I don't want to be hated by you. I can no longer stand being hated by you. I just wanted to talk to you about the situation we find ourselves in. She had a lot she wanted to talk with him. She wanted to talk about her life after she parted ways with Azel. They could stay up all night, and it wouldn't be enough. I oppose what Atain is trying to achieve in this era. Please believe me when I say I want to fight on your side. She had a dream. She had a dream of walking by his side. If she worked hard, would she be able to change her fate? What would have happened if she had been able to become a respectable mage? Would that have prevented her from dying by his hands? She knew it was fruitless to have these idle thoughts. Despite her knowing this, she kept imagining it. What if that incident never happened? Would it have prevented her from developing hatred for humans? She was constantly having these thoughts. 
she couldn't stand humans, but at times, she wondered if she could see aspects of herself with the humans. Whenever she had this thought, his face came into mind. She really hated them, but in the end, she couldn't hate them. She couldn't stand this contradiction. Will you accept me? Kealia buried her true feeling as she asked the question. Azel looked tormented. He answered her with a hoarse voice. I. Chapter 227. Father and Daughter's Choice. Part 1. Nibiris was deep within her thoughts as she walked through the field of flowers. After arriving at the Alberton Forest, she continued to enjoy an unbelievably peaceful life. She was having a hard time remembering the last time she had lived such a life. It brought stability to Nibiris' heart. It would be a lie to say that she didn't hold any resentment towards her father. However, she had learned about his story. She heard about the process in which he had been pushed towards despair. Even when he was in such a state, he had tried his best for his daughter. She was happy that she was able to reunite with him. However, her heart turned gloomy when she thought about the future. She had escaped from the plane of darkness on an impulse. Now her actions had to be made according to her will from here on out. Nibirus. Suddenly, Kieran called out to her. His attitude had remained the same as before. He was the heir to Baldazark. He acted bold and confident in front of others. He only turned into a shy young man in front of her. He had put aside everything, and he had put his life on the line for her. He should be a bit more bold with her. They were finally able to shed the yoke that had been placed around their necks. However, he was unable to be brave when it came to her. He made no moves towards her. Sir Regus said everything has been resolved. Nibirus had continued to reside in the Alberton Forest, but it hadn't been solely for Sybane. She was waiting for the result of one event. It would allow her to make her decision in regards to her future actions. Kealia Nim was accepted by Azel Kazark. I see. He is an amazing man. Nibirus didn't know about the true story between Azel and Kealia. This was why Nibirus thought Azel had accepted Kealia, who had been his enemy in the Dragon Demon War. Azel's bold action made a deep impression on her. Then we... Nibiris was about to talk about what they should do from here on out. However, she caught sight of Kieran. He looked tentative. It was as if he wanted to say more, but he was having a hard time formulating his words. What is it? It's nothing. That is. If it is a problem that is too difficult to tell me, I'll go check it out for myself. I understand. Nibiris. Kieran let out a sigh. Nibiris' eyes widened when he unloaded the information he had been holding back. Laura is here. Sybane spoke. It is nice to meet you again, Ms. Laura. I want to congratulate you on reuniting with your daughter. Thank you. Sybane looked a bit surprised at Laura's words. A slight questioning look appeared on her impassive face. Sybane let out an awkward smile as he tried to explain himself. It hasn't been long since I saw you last but it seems you've changed a lot. I never expected to hear such words from you. It had been four months since Azul's party had left the Alberton Forest. At the time, Laura hadn't cared about observing common courtesy like she did right now. She was still like a doll that had no expression, and she didn't reveal much emotion. However, for some reason it felt as if she had changed. I see. It seemed Laura liked his assessment, so she put on a small smile. She had changed after meeting Azel. She was still changing right now, and she hoped she would continue to change in the future. She was happy that her change had been confirmed by someone else. When I saw your dragon demon weapon, it made me curious as to what has happened since we parted ways. Laura had arrived with Arietta. She had traveled the long distance using the crying phoenix. Sybane recognized the crying phoenix at a glance so he became surprised that someone other than Azel was using it. Even if she was his comrade, it wasn't something he would easily give up. Something must have happened. Laura lowered her head slightly. I'm sorry. I understand. Sybane accepted her answer. Alberton Forest had revealed their neutrality in the fight. Since they weren't clear allies, Laura couldn't give them any information. Sybane understood this. I feel a familiar energy. Suddenly, Arietta mumbled to herself. Laura spoke. It is Nibirus. I see. 
From Arietta's perspective, Nibiris had made her suffer an unforgettable humiliation. This was why she was able to recognize Nibiris, who was approaching them from a distance. Soon, Nibiris and Kieran revealed themselves. Kieran awkwardly raised his hand, and he gave his greeting towards Laura. Laura, Nibiris' eyes narrowed. She was trying to press down on the hostility and annoyance she felt towards Laura. It was something that naturally arose within her. Nibiris was no longer part of the plane of darkness, so there was no reason why she should feel hostile towards Laura. Moreover, hadn't she incurred a debt to Azul's party in the process of running away from the plane of darkness? Still, her ill feeling towards Laura had been built over the years, and those feelings were hard to shed. She was having hard time keeping her composure. There was another factor that was bothering her. Arietta was glaring at her from behind Laura. Dragon Demon Princess. I never expected to meet you again like this. I see. Laura wasn't showing any emotions. On the other hand, Arietta was overtly glaring at Nibiris. Arietta knew she shouldn't be hostile towards Nibiris, but the sight of her reminded Arietta of the humiliation suffered under the hands of Nibiris. She couldn't help it. Arietta was trying hard to calm her emotions as she had this thought. No matter how I think about it, she isn't a good person. However, she didn't have much of a choice. In their current situation, it was better for Arietta to come here rather than Azel coming here. The two women had been glaring at each other, but the first one to back down was Arietta. I'm sorry, I failed to act like an adult. Laura, I think it would be best for both parties if I fall back for now. Yes, Arietta was well aware of their current situation. Her pride wouldn't allow her to jeopardize their mission. Nibiris mumbled to herself as she watched Arietta fall back. It makes me wonder if she really is the dragon demon princess I know. She has changed a lot. When they fought in the past, Arietta hadn't been a threat to her. She had been a weakling that Nibiris could easily kill if she wanted to. However, that wasn't the case anymore. Nibiris could sense the amount of dragon demon magic possessed by Arietta. Moreover, Nibiris could tell that Arietta had the skills to back up that power. Nibiris could tell at an instinctual level. When Arietta stepped aside, Nibiris spoke. Our relationship isn't good enough for us to have an amicable conversation. Just get to the point. I want to tell you about Kaalia. I've already heard about that. Did you really need to come here yourself to tell me that? I also have to deliver something to you after I hear your intentions. What do you mean by that? Nibiris furrowed her brows. Laura spoke in a calm manner. I heard from Kaalia that she was able to sever your connection to the Great Darkness. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that Kaalia knew the most about the Great Darkness after Atene. She was able to completely sever Nibiris and Kieran from the Great Darkness. She did the same for Cybane. Cybane's connection to the Great Darkness had deteriorated during his stay in the Alberton Forest, but he still had the link. Kaalia severed the connection for him. In the case of Laura, Euron had severed her link when he liberated the Vitans Chalice from the Great Darkness. Euron had done this because he had no idea how Atain would use these connections once he was fully revived. It was unknown as to what method Atain would use to read the information of beings connected to the Great Darkness. I know that Sir Regus has decided to go against Atain. At her words, Nibiris flinched. It wasn't the content of her words. Nibiris flinched because Laura had spoke Atain's name. They had always referred to Atain as king before and now Laura had called him out by name. It was a simple gesture, but Nibiris could see the determination behind the eyes of the usually expressionless Laura. Laura had accepted Atain as a true enemy. She had thrown away her past where she had worshipped Atain as a god. She would be able to fight Atain with every ounce of her strength. In truth, Nibiris was very impressed by this. At the same time, she felt really annoyed. It seems you are always ahead of me. Even this time, it had always been like that. From Nibiris' perspective, Laura was an annoying rival. Laura had more achievements as an officer, and she had been able to acquire a dragon demon weapon before her. Moreover, she had abandoned her life as a member of the Plane of Darkness, and she had chosen to walk her own path in life. 
Laura spoke. Nibirus. Kieran. Do you guys plan on joining Sir Regus? Why should I tell you that? I have to make a judgment call based on your answer. I have to choose whether I want to tell you something important or not. I don't know what it is, but I don't need it. Above all else, will you be able to believe my answer? I'll believe it. Nibirus' eyes widened at Laura's answer. Nibirus, you aren't the type of person that'll lie about your own position. Nibirus was momentarily speechless. She spoke. I plan on joining the fight. You'll do this despite knowing a time's goal. I know it. All of our beliefs were ugly distortion of the truth. It was made up by the old ones that wanted power, and I know they are the ones that deserve my enmity. Yet you'll fight him. He, he is my grandfather. I used to feel proud about being his direct descendant. That is no longer the case. Nibirus spoke with a cold expression on her face. He loves the world, but I don't think he loves anyone within it. When she found out the entire truth, Nibirus had realized that all her beliefs were an illusion. She had floundered in the shock when she had learned the truth. However, she was able to somewhat recover from the shock when she met Sibane. Afterwards, anger surged up from within her. Did she harbor resentment towards those that made the plane of darkness? Of course. Nibirus felt a deep anger and hatred towards them. She'll gladly slit their throats when she came across them next. She would exact a price for their sins. However, she despised Atain more. Atain had denied responsibility for the madness that had arose within the plane of darkness, and he was still preaching his ideals. He experimented on those that were still alive from the war. His purpose was to see if his followers could overcome their base nature. I cannot forgive him for that. Nibirus had learned the truth from Kaalia. She learned about the truth of Atain. He gathered the dragon demon king's army under the flag of his ideals, yet he foresaw his plan failing. That was why he decided to revive himself in the distant future. He didn't take any responsibility for the results he had created through his actions. He completely ignored it. His followers had believed in him. The defeat had been devastating, and it had left behind deep wounds within his followers. However, Atain didn't even think about how the deep psychological wounds caused by him would change his followers. He went straight to the next experiment where he tried to ascertain the nature of his followers. Doesn't that sound like something a god would do? He denies being a god, yet he acts like one. In the old tales, the ancient gods required endless sacrifice from their followers. It was required that people prove their sincerity towards the gods by sacrificing their lives towards the gods. Even if it led to a bankrupt life, one had to prove one's faith. Instead of giving a helping hand to those that walked the arduous path of following the will of the gods, the gods continued to give arduous trials that required them to prove their faith. They made unreasonable demands. How was Atain's action any different from those gods? He had supernatural powers that allowed him to overcome death. Instead of soothing the wounds of his followers, he imposed an arduous trial on those that were hurt and despairing. When those people failed to overcome his trial, he had labeled them as being evil. He has a double standard when it comes to himself. He is truly selfish. He's afraid of the possibility of corruption within himself, yet he immediately reincarnated himself. He shoved the whole world into the brazier of war, and he was the very reason why countless people had lost their lives. He didn't deserve to make such a choice. Chapter 228. Father and Daughter's Choice. Part 2. He has a double standard when it comes to himself. He is truly selfish. He's afraid of the possibility of corruption within himself, yet he immediately reincarnated himself. He shoved the whole world into the brazier of war, and he was the very reason why countless people had lost their lives. He didn't deserve to make such a choice. Nibirus had been born in the plane of darkness, and she had been shackled by the madness of the dragon demon king worshippers. The plane of darkness had been a ground experiment for Atain. This was why she couldn't forgive Atain. She accepted it now. The world had pointed their fingers towards the plane of darkness for being evil. It was well deserved. However, Atain was the only one that didn't have the right to condemn the plane of darkness. I don't want to entrust the fate of the world to such a being. In truth, 
I don't know how the world will change if the freedom to act out evil is stolen from everyone. I'll have to think more deeply on the subject if I want that answer. However, I know one thing for sure, it didn't matter what kind of world Atain wanted to make. Nibiris couldn't accept it. I will fight him even if I lose my life to him. Her promise was as cool and hard as an ancient boulder. Laura could feel Nibiris' resolve through her words. As expected, I wasn't wrong. What do you mean by that? You'll find out soon. Sibane Nim. Sibane had been blankly listening to his daughter talk. He woke up from his haze, and he turned to look at Laura. Laura spoke. Would you excuse us, please? Him. All right. When Sibane excused himself, Laura spoke. Nibiris, there is a weapon we need if we are to resist against a Tyne's will. What do you want to say to me? That is. Laura spoke about Jer's true purpose in coming to the faraway Alberton forest. Nibiris' face was filled with shock. Larua and Arietta stayed for an entire day before they left the Alberton forest. After they left, Sibane sought out Nibiris. You've already made up your mind. You are going to fight him. Yes. It took twenty years for the reunion between the father and daughter to come to pass. They looked at each other with a truly complicated expression on their faces. Nibiris' current resolve to act worried Sibane the most. If he was honest with himself, he wanted to stop her. He had finally reunited his daughter again, and he couldn't stand watching her walk back into danger. He hesitated before he spoke in a laborious manner. Can you not give up on this idea? He is my father, and he is absolutely out of our league. He is an absolute being that the dragon demon generals didn't dare to go up against. He will no longer rely on anyone to carry out his work. He plans on making his vision into reality, and anyone that opposes him will. Father, Nibiris spoke in a quiet voice as she stopped Sibane from speaking. I loved you and mother. I still love both of you. If I said I understood your despair, it would be an arrogant statement. You have lived much longer than me, and you still carry many wounds you suffered during the Dragon Demon War. Sibane had despaired for a very long time. He despaired at the fact that others were worshipping Atain as a god. He despaired at the fact that he couldn't stop the plane of darkness from descending into madness. Above all else, he hadn't been able to protect his wife. It would have been laughable if someone said they understood his feeling of pain and helplessness. He had worked desperately for a couple hundred years, yet his efforts brought no results. How could he express this feeling? He had nothing left after working so hard. It'll be a lie if I said I don't resent you, father. As much as I missed you, I resented you an equal amount. However, that is no longer true. I now understand how deep and heavy your burden was. I understand your choice, and I forgive you. Despite all of this, I want to walk a different path from you. Nibiris. I know I can stay here. I'll be able to ignore what goes on in the world. She could bury the anger she had towards Atain and his followers. She could live a peaceful life within this place. She didn't know about the distant future, but at the very least, she won't have to put her life on the line in fighting a god-like magician called Atain. However, my heart cannot put up with it. Even if the path I take leads to death, I do not want to compromise my pride. Even if I'm alive, I won't truly be alive at that point. I won't be able to face Duran, who gave up his life for me, in the afterlife. Sibane was at a loss for words. He had abandoned his responsibilities as a parent. While he was on the run, his daughter had grown up to be an individual that possessed a brilliant soul. It would be a lie to say that he saw his wife in his daughter. Their appearance might be a bit similar, but their personality was drastically different. In fact, Nibiris reminded him of his comrades in the Dragon Demon War. These were people that had willingly put their lives on the line for their principles. Sibane had fought desperately for such people. He wanted him to find true happiness, yet in the end, no one had found happiness. I, Sibane raised his hand, but he hesitated. He wanted to, to grasp his daughter's shoulder, but why couldn't he carry out such a simple gesture? Why was it so hard for him? He wanted to stop his daughter. At the same time, he couldn't stop her. I'm a failure as a father. It is the same now as in the old times. No, 
Nivirus approached Cybane, who was hesitant. She hugged him. You stayed alive, and you waited for me. That is the reason why I was able to run away, and find a place to rest. That is enough. Cybane felt like crying, but he desperately held back his tears. His reddened eyes looked straight into Nibira's eyes. Her eyes were beautiful like frost gems. It was cold, yet there was a hardened resolve behind her eyes. I am a father with no redeemable quality, yet I want to do something for you. Please give me a couple more days of your time. Father, I, I will teach you everything I know about the Book of Darkness. Cybane looked at her with earnest eyes as he spoke. Even if you don't plan on fighting my father, you need power in this world. Even if you go through intense training for the next couple days, you won't be able to dramatically increase your power. However, I'll be able to show you how to use your tools properly. As he spoke, a new resolve became etched in Cybane's eyes. Kealia's ability to peruse the information within the Great Darkness had been taken away by Atane. Despite this fact, she had great insight into what Atane was planning to do. Atane already started his work on copying the Guardian Shadows. Why was Atane not working harder to protect the Road of Emptiness? He needed the Dragon Demon King worshippers to sacrifice their lives. He needed time to construct the enormous magic ritual, and at the same time, he needed more of a particular resource. It was a plan where he was killing two birds with one stone. I'm talking about those that are connected to Great Darkness. They made their contracts, because they agreed with Atine's will. When they die, their souls will be infused into the Great Darkness, and it would generate more power for the Great Darkness. In the end, their souls will become ingredients. It will allow Atane to create a system that'll enforce his will. It wasn't just the transcendent beings that were inside the Great Darkness. Countless souls were being incorporated into the Great Darkness. The magical energy, the thought process and memories of the Dragon Demon King worshippers were being retained by the Great Darkness as information. Even their souls became a resource that added more functionality to the Great Darkness. Currently, Atane needed his followers to sacrifice themselves at a higher rate. In the short term, he needs those, who are contracted to the Great Darkness, to supply their souls. The Great Darkness will be more powerful than ever before. In the long term, Atane will start creating beings that are similar to the Guardian Shadows. These beings will become a force that'll enforce Atane's will. In order to protect the pillars of the Great Darkness, Atane had sealed powerful monsters within the Great Darkness. It was an example of what Atane could accomplish with ample time. It was easy to imagine the terrifying result that would occur if Atane was allowed to work. Azel opened his mouth. That means. Ah, wait a moment. Kealia interrupted him. When Azel put on a perplexed expression, she gave an explanation. From now on, you shouldn't tell me any crucial information in regards to your plan. Just give me orders while minimizing the information you give me. I'll just carry out your orders. Why? Atane might find out about it. Kealia became restricted by Atane, but she still possessed a good amount of authority within the Great Darkness. This was why she was able to sever Nibirus, Kieran and Cybane from the Great Darkness. She was also able to shield information about Regus and herself from Atane. However, I cannot guarantee that my abilities are foolproof. If Atane and I are looking at each other's information at the same time, I might not be able to completely stop him from seeing my information. Atane and Ainsera could gather information through the Great Darkness. Unlike Ainsera, Atane was able to be more tactful in using the Great Darkness. He could search for the specific information he needed before viewing it. If he tried to learn everything all at once, Atane knew his mind and sense of self would be damaged. It was dangerous to read the emotions and memories of other people. A powerful experience could unconsciously change one's personality. He can't immediately take in all the information like Ainsera. He must qualify what he wants to learn, and he has to go through the process of finding that information. This is why his search for information takes longer, but the information he finds is much more detailed. Ainsera immediately accepted all information into herself, so she couldn't filter out the truly important information she had to learn. Atine's way was slower, but his results were more precise. 
This was also true in regards to Carlos. Why are you bringing up Carlos? Azel sounded agitated when she mentioned Carlos. Kealia explained herself. Carlos was so talented that even Atain had been surprised by his use of the Great Darkness. However, even Carlos couldn't hide all of his information. Euron had told Azel about the arrangements left behind by Carlos. Atain had used Belrun's ability to read Carlos' information in the Great Darkness. However, I think Carlos intended that to happen to a certain degree. He had come up with a plan. He knew he couldn't hide all of his information. In order to protect the truly important information, he revealed everything else to Atain. Atain and Kealia knew that Carlos had succeeded in recreating the extreme extinction. However, they didn't know the exact details of the technique. I see. Until the end, he really. He was almost moved to tears as his words trailed off. Even after death, his friend had the talent to deeply move him. If you have any questions, you can ask me. However, you shouldn't tell me anything important. You should be careful. Because you might say something important without realizing it. Understood. I'll be careful. Azul's party accepted Kealia's advice. This was why Laura had traveled to the Alberton Forest, even though Kealia had the ability to be anywhere in an instant. Chapter 229. Father and Daughter's Choice. Part 3. Up until that point, Azul's party couldn't understand Atine's attitude. However, they were able to decipher Atine's intention through the information given to them by Kealia. Why hadn't Atain been more aggressive in defending the waypoints to the Road of Emptiness? He needed the death of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, who were contracted to his cause. They were connected to the Great Darkness, and their deaths were necessary in advancing his plan. This didn't mean that the Road of Emptiness wasn't important either. However, Atain didn't plan on fighting whole world like he did in the past. Atain was going to use the souls of the Dragon Demon King worshippers as a resource to create a massive magic ritual. That was much more important to him. We still have to destroy all the waypoints. Chiron spoke. He knew Atain's intention, yet he decided that they should continue their plan of destroying the waypoints. It might be best to give the appearance that we are obsessed with destroying the waypoints. It'll give us legitimate cover until we decide to attack them. Anyways, they needed to destroy all the nearby waypoints before they could destroy a pillar of darkness. If they want to invest fully in a battle, they had to eliminate the possibility of being hit from behind. The only problem that remain is which pillar we should destroy first. The Great Darkness was being propped up by twelve pillars, and they had destroyed three of them. Moreover, Azul's party knew the location of all the nine remaining pillars. Carlos hadn't known all the location, but the missing information had been filled in by Kealia. Azel spoke. The most vulnerable one is located within the Balran forest. It was where they had lost Euron, and in the end, Atain had been able to reseal the tree god. However, Azul's party had been able to destroy all the defenses that had been placed around the seal of the tree god. According to Kealia's information, Atain hadn't been able to restore the defense yet. Atain could have started restoring the defense after Kealia's authority to view information was revoked. However, a defense of that nature couldn't be put up in a short amount of time. It mean they'll guard it more securely with troops. Isn't it better to hit a different place? No, we have to hit that place. They'll tolerate losing waypoints, but they can't afford to lose pillars. We'll clear the nearby waypoints as fast as possible to set up the attack. Let's keep pushing before they come up with a new countermeasure. Chiron continued to make plans in his head. He had been frustrated up until that point, because he hadn't known what Atain was planning. He would be able bloody Atain's nose with this time around. Chiron let out an evil smile. Count Lacardi of the Rio's Kingdom. His nickname was the Count of the Thousand Swords. Bakad Lakadi was a dragon demon, and he had been working as a member of the Guardian Shadows for a very long time. He garnered respect from the royal family of the Rio's kingdom, and he was known as being one of the legendary figures of this era. In many ways, his career was remarkably similar to Chiron's career. He was a dragon demon, yet he was a lord of a human kingdom. He had lost his parents to the dragon demon king worshippers, 
so he had joined the Guardian Shadows to get his revenge. He hadn't learned any forgotten techniques, yet he was one of the subject of caution for the Plane of Darkness. Of course, there were differences. He had three other dragon demon siblings that were in the Guardian Shadows. They were named Sarah Licardi, Eileen Licardi and Jirans Licardi. I've talked couple times with you through correspondence, but he was the oldest of his siblings, and he was a count. However, he looked to be in his mid-twenties. There was a scar made by a sword on his cheek, and he had long thick brown hair. He was an 80-year-old dragon demon, yet he was basically at his prime. This is the first time meet you face to face, Marquis Azel Kazakh. He wanted a handshake. Azel spoke as he shook his hand. It is a pleasure to meet you, Count Licardi. I've heard about your many exploits. Azel's identity had been revealed to everyone within the Guardian Shadows. After Carlos passed away, the command of the Guardian Shadows was given to Chiron, and he had chosen to reveal the important truths to the members. The members of the Guardian Shadows had put their lives on the line to fight the Dragon Demon King worshippers. They had the right to know the truth. However, this didn't mean everyone believed the information. Azel asked in a playful manner. Tell me the truth. Do you really believe that I'm Azel Kazakh? In truth, I'm on the fence right now. Bakud Likardi was truthful with his answer. It might have been believable to those that had traveled with Azel. It was asking too much for strangers to believe his claim. They had no frame of reference. Bakud Likardi continued to speak. Your identity is hard to believe, and many stories related to you sound implausible. I do know that Atain and the Dragon Demon Generals have been revived. Yes, I think I can believe that the Archmage Carlos made the Guardian Shadows after exiting from history. However, anything beyond that is pushing my limits. Bleak and gloomy truths were overflowing in this world. The news that the hero Azel Kazakh had revived in this era was like a ray of hope. It doesn't sound believable, but I want to believe. At the very least, I will treat you with respect as the Marquis of Kazakh. You are honest. You've given me techniques. This is just good manners for what you did for us. I don't care what your identity is. I'll never forget your goodwill. Azel had conversed with Bakud Likardi, because he had wanted to give Bakud the forgotten techniques. It was way less effective than teaching it to him. Azel and Laura taught them how to deal with the hidden techniques, and it had increased the abilities of the members of the Guardian Shadows. The Licardi siblings were ones that showed exceptional growth amongst the members. Their team was made out of two warriors and two magicians. Even high-ranked officers of the Plane of Darkness couldn't defeat them easily. They were quite a fearsome party. Sarah Licardi, who was the third sibling, asked a question after she listened to their conversation. Why are you insisting on fighting with us? Moreover, you insisted on coming alone. She looked to be around the same age as Bakud. She was an haughty-looking beauty. You'll be hard to find a group like us. We don't need your help. The members of the Guardian Shadows knew that Azul's party was achieving incredible results. They were constantly being kept up to date with information about Azel party's progress. However, the Licardi siblings didn't really need much help in carrying out their tasks. Of course, the information regarding the target, and the support from the ghost-like figures of the Guardian Shadows were valuable. However, once the battle started, the four Licardi siblings did most of the heavy lifting, and they achieved great success in battle. So why did Azel go out of his way to help them? If the entirety of Azel's party had come, the siblings might have been excited at the prospect. Maybe, Azel's party might have been planning on luring out a dragon demon general. However, Azel had come by himself. From the perspective of the Licardi siblings, they were a bit offended. It felt as if they were being told that they were unreliable. Azel spoke. Please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not here, because we thought you would have trouble in this battle. Then why? I wanted to witness your skills with my own eyes. Him. Does that mean you came here to verify our skills? Bakud asked him a question. Azel nodded his head. It is as you've said. What is your reasoning for doing this? We are fighting all over the continent. However, at some point, there will come a time when we'll have to concentrate our power in one place. I'm choosing members that'll participate in that battle. 
Interesting. It has been a while since we've been evaluated by someone else. However, you do realize that we'll be doing the same to you. Of course. It seemed Bakard wasn't offended after hearing Azul's goal in coming here. However, his attitude would change drastically if Azel didn't show his ability and competence in this battle. Azel didn't plan on hiding his skills. I wonder if Laura is doing well. Laura and Arietta were traveling towards the Alberton Forest. If he counted the time they would spend there, it would take them around two days to get back. The party wanted to use that time efficiency, so they decided to check up on the skilled members of the Guardian Shadows with their own two eyes. Azel had come by himself to check up on the Licardi siblings. Their party was very well balanced. Chiron, Leticia and Kealia went to check on the other candidates. Well, let's. Azel usually didn't wear a helmet, but he wore one that completely covered his head. He also didn't wear his normal white dragon armor, and the long sword on his hip wasn't the dragon sword. He was trying to hide his identity from the Dragon Demon King worshippers. He wanted to evaluate the abilities of this party. This was why he would be put in a bind if Almeric suddenly made an appearance. The fight with Almeric had to go according to Chiron's plan. The perfect stage would be prepared at a later date. Shall we start? Since Laura wasn't here, he couldn't use his extreme extinction to destroy the waypoint at the beginning of the fight. Azel let the siblings dictate the battle as he ran into the battlefield. When attacking a waypoint, one had to go out on an all-out attack. As more time passed, there was the danger of the enemies sending reinforcements. If the reinforcement was led by a dragon demon general, the fight would end as a failure. At that point, they would have to extract themselves from the battle. Their goal was to end the fight before the third support force could arrive. When the battle started, a single guardian shadow usually kept an eye on the waypoint as a lookout. If enemy support troops appeared from the waypoint, they had to immediately make a decision. Despite using these precautions, many members of the Guardian Shadows had died. Fortunately, their losses had decreased in recent days. It was, because the Plane of Darkness weren't sending any high-ranked officers with their reinforcement. We'll break through them in one fell swoop. Please don't fall behind. Two of Licardi's sibling were high-ranked dragon arts practitioners, and the other two were high-ranked magicians. Each sibling possessed great ability, and they've been working together for a very long time. This was why the power of their team play was truly powerful. The first to jump in was Bakard. He knew it would be hard to evade detection from their enemies using the concealment technique. This was why he immediately used the instantaneous movement to appear within the midst of his enemies. After being attacked numerous times, the Dragon Demon King worshippers became much more adept at searching out their enemies. Moreover, they were much more prepared for a fight now. A distance of 100 meters had to be traversed if Bakud and his siblings wanted to ambush the Dragon Demon King worshippers. It just wasn't a feasible to pull off the attack before they were noticed. The Dragon Mage and Warrior on patrol easily blocked Bakud's ambush attack. The patrol had three members. Another dragon magian attacked Bakud, and the magician activated a spell as he looked at his surrounding. Bakud blocked the frontal attack with the shield in his left hand. Afterwards, Sarah Licardi clashed with the enemy magician with her magic. Sparks formed in the air. However, she wasn't the only magician in her party. Jiren's Licardi was the youngest sibling, and he sent out a spell towards the enemy magician and warriors. A mental wave bomb detonated, and it messed with his enemy's senses. Bakud had already expected this attack, so he was unaffected. The two enemy warriors faltered, and Bakud took advantage of this opportunity. Bakud was locked swords with a warrior. He kicked the midsection of the warrior. He used the rebound to change his stance, and Bakud's sword took off the head of the other warrior. The female warrior Eileen Licardi moved a beat later as she chased after the warrior that had been sent flying by Bacardi's kick. She brought down her steel mace as she ended his life. Afterwards, Sarah and Jirens worked in tandem to kill the magician. They are amazing. Chapter 230. Father and Daughter's Choice. Part 4. Amazing. Azel was impressed. Each one of them were powerful, but they fit so well together. 
They were like individual blades to a rotating buzz saw. It took them around 10 seconds to dispatch the three enemies. Their enemies hadn't had the chance to get off a signal flare. We'll head in immediately. Moreover, their ability to assess a situation was outstanding. Even if the signal flare hadn't been lit, their enemies would have found out about the attack in short order. This was why they had to charge in before they could get organized for defense. They continued to rush through the forest at full force. They killed the second patrol in a flash. However, when they met the third patrol, their enemies had gotten wind of what was going on. Their entire force descended on the siblings. When he saw this, Jiren's Likadi didn't hesitate as he detonated a signal flare. It's the signal. It is time to fight. The hundred guardian shadows, who were on standby, were mobilized. In a fight against numerous enemies, the siblings didn't hesitate to borrow the power of the guardian shadows. They used their overwhelming power to push straight towards the waypoint of the road of emptiness. They pushed until they destroyed the waypoint. This was the basic strategy used by the four Likadi siblings. A warrior got in the path of the running Bakad. The enemy warrior was sent flying by Bakad's shield strike. The warrior that was flanking Bakad was struck down by the steel mace of Eileen. Sarah and Jirens monitored their surrounding as they tirelessly poured out spells. Azel followed behind them, and he barely had to do anything. It was a testament to how well balanced the attack and defense of the siblings were. It was flawless. However, the Dragon Demon King worshippers didn't go down easily. A powerful thunderbolt detonated, and it slowed down Bakad. The information regarding the Likadi siblings were known to the Dragon Demon King worshippers. This was why three magicians combined their powers to create a powerful lightning bolt. Even the Likadi siblings had to come to a halt when faced with such an attack. The Likadi siblings came to a halt, while pushing through a large number of enemies. It immediately led him to being surrounded by their enemies. Of course, the four Likadi siblings planned for such an eventuality. They immediately changed their formation. The five party members stood back to back, so they could face five directions. Afterwards, they started attacking their enemies. They were like a spinning saw. While the two magicians tried to break through the enemies closing around them, Bakad changed his weapon. He used his dragon arts to float his long sword and shield into the air. He unsheathed the great sword on his back. He grasped it with his two hands as he concentrated his power into it. Roar! Oh! Earth Dragon! After he let out the cantrip, Likadi brought down the great sword. When he did so, his sword strike created a shockwave as it split open the ground. It was the same phenomena that occurred when Ragus brought down his soul hammer. It was just smaller in scale. As several dozen meter of earth was overturned, enemies were sent flying. Bakad used the same attack three consecutive times as he separated his enemies from each other. Then he once again took up his longsword and shield. This was why he was called the Hundred Sword Count. His martial arts allowed him to use multitude of weapons. He changed his fighting style based on the situation. At times, he went strong. On other times, he was steadfast. He was constantly changing. At this rate, I might be a distraction. Azel wasn't standing by and doing nothing. He followed the Likadi siblings, and he killed the enemies coming up from the rear. After being surrounded by their enemies, he had slain three foes. However, he continued to observe the four siblings working as a whole. He wondered if it would be better if he fought further away from them. Since we have Kaalia, we aren't short of a magician, but it makes me want to recruit them. Of course, each of them were excellent. However, their ability to work as a whole amplified their abilities. It impressed Azel. They are coming again. Bakad yelled out, while his party was taking care of the warriors rushing towards them. The three enemy magicians were starting to create another thunderbolt. Bakad concentrated his power in his shield, and he got ready to defend. At that moment, Azel slipped away from his position, and he got in front of Bakad. Bakad was taken aback and he was about to object. Azel spoke before Bakad could speak. You can leave the defense to me. Get ready to attack. Afterwards, the thunderbolt detonated. Bakad's eyes widened. It was a stronger thunderbolt than before, 
Yet the barrier created by the combined might of the four siblings felt no impact. That's. The sword in Azul's hand swallowed up the lightning bolt. The blade burned with a blue-white light. Horn of the Thunder Dragon. Afterwards, Azel brought his sword down. The thunderbolt emitted from the sword was several times stronger than the thunderbolt sent by the magicians. It went through his enemies. The enemies didn't even get to scream before they were swallowed up by the thunderbolt. An open space of 30 meters was cleared in front of Azel. That's pretty good. Their enemies were concentrated in one location, and they had used their defensive skills. This was why the effectiveness of the horn of the thunder dragon was reduced. Only 10 warriors were killed instantly. Azel had been a shadow up until now, but he had stepped forward. The reason was quite simple. Let's end this before the second reinforcement comes. The guardian shadows had informed him about the first reinforcement that had been dispatched. From this point on, the waypoint would stop working for 10 minutes. Him, Bakud was taken aback, but he didn't forget their mission. His countless experience in battle allowed him to overcome any childish emotions he felt, and he was able to make the optimal choice. Rage. Oh, light dragon. When he swung his sword, a beam of light cut through his surrounding. It was a weaker attack than the great sword, which had overturned the earth. However, he was able to attack his enemies repeatedly, and he was able to knock them back. When their enemies were knocked back, the four siblings worked as one to slaughter their enemies. While they showed off their phenomenal power to break through enemy troops, Azel released his dragon demon magic. Come Dragon Macon. He had already seen enough of Lakadi siblings. Since their enemies had sent in their first wave of reinforcement, he no longer had to hide his identity. He immediately split open the heavens as a brilliant light appeared in front of him. Sky Splitter. Azel held the sword that was bleeding out blue light. He moved away from the Lakadi siblings. At the same time, he jumped through space to appear within the midst of his enemies. The light from his sword looked like fire and thunder at the same time. It cut through them. Great Sinner Azel Kazark. The screams of the Dragon Demon King worshippers rang out. His clones had presence, and they could appear anywhere he wanted the clones to appear. He just needed to choose a spot, and they would engage the enemies. Moreover, the Sky Splitter had transformed into light. The Dragon Demon King worshippers couldn't even react before the sword cut through them. On top of it all, the Guardian Shadows were participating in the battle too. It was a slaughter. Azel and the four Lakadi siblings were able to easily enter the waypoint. My god, Sarah Lakadi couldn't hide her surprise. It wasn't just her. All four siblings expressed the same emotion. Of course, they were capable of slaughtering and breaking through their enemies. However, when Azel revealed his power, everything became so easy. It was so easy that it was messing with their battle sense. When they received the information regarding the arrival of the first reinforcement, they were only at the halfway to the waypoint. However, they were able to reach the waypoint in 30 seconds after Azel revealed his power. Is he really the hero Azel Kazark? When they experienced Azel's overwhelming power, they wanted to believe that Azel was the legendary hero Azel Kazark. They were starting to lean towards the idea that it might be a difficult truth to believe, but in the end, it was the truth. Azel Kazark, you are using such a cheap tactic. They had pushed through their enemies so fast that the newly arrived reinforcement troops hadn't had the chance to go out. The tunnel was filled with all kinds of trap, but they were ineffective. Azel used his cloning technique and his dragon demon weapon to destroy all the traps. Azel grinned within his helmet as he spoke. This isn't the first time I've done this, so why are you so upset? Azel confirmed his suspicion when he saw the dragon demon king worshippers barring his path. The plane of darkness hadn't sent the reinforcement. Troops from another waypoint had come when they received a signal for help. The forces stationed outside are being used like consumables. They have to die quickly for the ritual. Azel felt disgusted by Atine's plan. He took a step backwards. His enemies flinched at his action. Why did Azel suddenly move backwards after he appeared in front of them? They found out why when the four Lakadi siblings shot forward from behind Azel. Roar. Oh. 
brave fire dragon. Bakud was in the lead as he put all his strength into swinging his great sword. A dense flame erupted from his sword, and it detonated between his enemies. Extreme heat filled the building. Sarah, Eileen and Jirans followed up with an equally powerful attack. There was no room to dodge their attacks. It was a calamity that erupted in a localized space. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were slaughtered easily. At the moment of their deaths, their thoughts were full of disbelief. How can this be? They didn't die from carelessness. When they found out their opponent was Azel, they had accepted their deaths. It was inevitable. However, they planned on wounding him. On the other hand, they were completely taken unawares by the four siblings. It wasn't as if they hadn't sensed the Likadi siblings focus their massive magical energy. However, unbelievably powerful attacks had been used against them. It shouldn't have been possible. Unbelievable. Bakud was amazed as he mumbled to himself. The previous attacks were their killing technique. These destructive techniques were used when they wanted to kill everyone without destroying a building. In order to use these techniques, they had to go through a preparation process. However, they were able to ambush their enemies with their techniques. It was all thanks to the dragon demon weapon that was summoned by Azel. Dismiss dragon demon weapon. Brand of Paradise. Azel dismissed the Brand of Paradise, which he had been hiding behind his back. When he entered the waypoint, he had summoned the Brand of Paradise. He accelerated the localized time around the four Likadi siblings, so they were able to prepare their skills. Azel was already quite adept at using the Brand of Paradise now. Him, suddenly, Azel furrowed his brows. A dark reverberation appeared from the destroyed waypoint, and it touched Azel. There was a presence within this reverberation, and it whispered to him like a wraith. The dragons will disappear first. What the hell is this? Then the humans will walk the same path as them. Attain. Azel defended his mind when he realized that there was a master behind the sinister thoughts. If it was Attain, he could use even such a faint reverberation in a vicious manner. When he put up his defense, the quickly diminishing voice sounded wistful. Azel Kazark, you are the antagonist to my fate. You have to awaken to the fate of your race. What nonsense is this? Azel mumbled his words. Bakud asked the question in puzzlement. What's wrong? It is nothing. I just felt a foreign presence. Azel shook his head as he started to walk. The party went outside, and they killed all the remaining enemies, who had been fighting the Guardian Shadows. When the battle finished, Bakud spoke. Marquis Karzark. Yes. Let me correct myself. You are the hero Azel Karzark. I believe you. He looked at Azel with a heated gaze. It makes me quake to ask this question. It has been a very long time since I've been afraid to ask a question. Bakud took a deep breath. It wasn't just him. All the Likadi siblings were nervous. They were legendary figures in the Rio's kingdom. Usually, they were the ones giving out the tests. It had been a very long time since they've been tested by someone else. They were having flashbacks to their childhood. Did we pass? Instead of giving an answer, Azel grinned as he put out his hand. Bakud looked puzzled for a brief moment, but he realized the meaning behind Azel's gesture. He vigorously shook Azel's hand. Of course. Please join us in the fight when the time come. The day of decisive battle was already decided. Chapter 231. Dragon Demon General. Part 1. Rishu was named as a Dragon Demon General. However, it was merely a symbolic position. Atain no longer wanted to build a kingdom. He no longer wanted to rule over the world as its king. However, he needed the Dragon Demon King worshippers to follow the orders of Rishu. This was why Rishu needed an established title that gave him authority. The title of Dragon Demon General fit the criteria. However, the troops under Rishu didn't look kindly at Rishu, who was named the Dragon Demon General. The Dragon Demon King worshippers worshipped Atain as a god, and Rishu was chosen by Atain. However, Rishu had appeared out of nowhere, and they had no prior information in regards to him. Of course, animosity arose within the ranks. I know why you guys don't like me. However, I would like you guys to stop looking at me with openly hostile eyes. It gets on my nerve. Even if I'm an understanding man, 
I might explode someday if you continue to annoy me like this. Rishu was dispatched after being named the Dragon Demon General. He threatened his lieutenant. Currently, he was given 100 men to command. Each one of them were elite soldiers of the Plane of Darkness. In reality, the one that actually commanded the men was an old dragon magen. He was placed under Rishu as his second in command. His name was Chains, and he had been Regis's lieutenant in the past. Until Atain had revived, he had been one of the top leaders within the Plane of Darkness. Chains let out a fake cough. Hum hum. I'm sorry. I'll pay more attention to it. You better. If you don't, I'll end your life in a miserable manner. I don't care what exalted position you used to occupy. It might have been better if you were a magician. You were a dragon arts practitioner, and you were old. It had been a long time since you've participated in a real battle. If you aren't a good commander, I have no reason to humor your bad attitude. Chains stood under the glare of Rishu. He realized that Rishu was being serious. Moreover, Rishu was right. Even a magician deteriorated as one aged. As a dragon arts practitioner, he had to use his body, and the effect of age on his body had been massive. Chains was a decrepit old man, and he had long since given up his dragon demon weapon and his spot in the front line to his descendants. He couldn't even remember the date when he participated in a live battle. It was that long ago. Rishu knew Chains didn't have any worth as a fighter. His role was to use his experience and knowledge to command the troops. Kook kook kook. Why do you insist on keeping that old body? Why suffer such humiliation? If you chose to become undead like us. A dragon demon undead had just entered into the barracks. Something flashed in front of it. Do you really think it would have mattered if he chose that path? He probably would have died, forgetting himself like you. In a flash, Rishu had taken hold of the dragon demon undead by his neck. The dragon demon undead was a dragon arts practitioner when he was alive. He had lost many things when he became an undead. However, he had gone through readjustment training after awakening in this era. He had adapted to his new body. Rishu had him by the neck and he couldn't do anything. I don't really put much importance on discipline. However, it seems I'll have give you a guiding hand. Are you wallowing in your past glories that you achieved in the Dragon Demon War? Is that why you are ignoring the established order of rank? If I kill you now, do you think the others will learn their lesson? Rishu continued to glare at him with cold eyes. When Rishu put strength into his hands, one could hear bones starting to break. The dragon demon undead struggled to get free, but it was useless. When Rishu grabbed his neck, the flow of his magical energy became dominated by Rishu. Please forgive him. It was another dragon demon undead, who had spoken up. When a commotion occurred inside, he had come in. The new dragon demon undead bowed his head. Rishu asked with a cold voice. Why should I? He was always a bit dumb even in the old days. However, He'll fix his attitude if he knows that his unsightly behavior will be reported to the king. You want me to lean on a Tyne's authority? I am well aware of the fact that you are the general chosen by the king. However, your authority doesn't come from the fact that you are a dragon demon general. It comes through to you from the king. All right. Rishu snorted as he threw the dragon demon undead away. The dragon demon undead was thrown out the barracks at a terrifying speed. An explosive sound rang out when he impacted on the ground. It surprised the troops on standby. Rishu was indifferent. I'll forgive him this one time. There will never be a second time. Thank you for your generosity. Give me your report. Rishu sat in his seat as he spoke. Even if the dragon demon undead didn't like the fact that Rishu was the dragon demon general, he wouldn't have entered the barracks without a cause. There must have been something that needed to be reported. Rishu's guess was right. We've detected the movements of our enemies. Him. Was my guess right? Rishu's eyes shone. From a Tyne's perspective, he only had two dragon demon generals. They were Rishu and Almeric. They were the ace up his sleeves, since both of them were capable of facing off against Azul's party. There was only one reason why one of them would be deployed outside. It was in defense of the pillars of the great darkness. Azul's party was trying very hard to hide their plans, but it wasn't too hard to guess what their targets were. 
Azul's party was destroying the waypoints, so reinforcements couldn't reach the pillar. Basically, one just had to see which waypoints were being destroyed to find the target. However, Azul's party weren't idiots, so they started using a diversion tactic. They split their targets into three. There was the tree god sealed in the Rulan kingdom, the sanctuary god in the bear's kingdom and the infinite beast in the Galen kingdom. When they did this, a Tyne's side had to divide their forces too. Currently, it was most likely that Azul's party was targeting the tree god, or the sanctuary god. There were a good amount of waypoints left near the infinite beast, so they could easily send reinforcement towards that location. This was why Almeric was dispatched towards the tree god. Rishu was sent towards the sanctuary god, and the elite troops including the survivors of the dragon demon war were sent towards the infinite beast. The dragon demon undead shook his head from side to side. No. What is it then? General Ragus appeared in the Galen kingdom. No. Ragus has appeared. Oh my, he is quite bold. Is he daring us to attack him? Ragus was bold. He hit a place where reinforcement could be sent. However, it was too bold. The fact that it was too bold meant that this might be a feint. This puts us in a bind. What shall we do? The elites of the Plane of Darkness had no chance against Ragus. Of course, Ragus couldn't completely kill the sealed beings Ikazel. However, the seal merely had to be broken for Atain to lose a pillar. Instead the world will be met with a calamity. From Atain's perspective, that probably wasn't the worst possible outcome. If a calamity that could end the world arrived, their opposition would be too busy fighting this calamity. It would buy Atain some time. However, Rishu couldn't remain a spectator as the calamity was released into the world. Even if Atain's goal was righteous, Rishu couldn't stand seeing countless innocents lose their lives. The problem comes down to what Ragus thinks. It wasn't confirmed if Ragus had joined hands with Azul's party. However, Ragus had declared hostility towards Atain, so it would be wise to assume that he was in league with Azul's party now. If Ragus was like Rishu, he wouldn't like unnecessary deaths to humans. This meant there was a high probability that this was a feint. Azul's party was probably waiting for Rishu or Almeric to converge on Ragus. They would probably attack the location vacated by Rishu or Almeric. However, what if Ragus didn't care about the collateral damage to innocent lives when it came to stopping Atain? I've only heard hearsays about Ragus. I need opinions from people that knows Ragus. What do you guys think about all of this? Rishu gathered chains and the other dragon demon undeads that had participated in the dragon demon war. He asked him a question. Ragus Nim. No. If it is Ragus. You can use the honorific. I don't care about that. Chains had used an honorific when referring to Ragus. It was done out of habit. Chains let out a sigh when he heard Rishu's words. He doesn't care if he dies in a fight but he wouldn't use any despicable tactics. I am of the same mind. I see. That means this might be a feint. Rishu was in a pickle. If he went out to stop Rayugs, Azul's party would most likely attack this location. Atain knew that Azul's party was using the Guardian Shadows to surveil them. The surveillance couldn't be stopped unless the entities of the Guardian Shadows could be destroyed. Moreover, the White Flame Phoenix had been stolen so Azul's party could demonstrate incredible mobility. Even if Atain's side increased their ability to detect Azul's party, Azul's party could move to any location in a very short amount of time. On top of it all, Atain can't move right now. Atain was carrying out a very important ritual within the Dragon Demon Castle. Until the ritual was stable and on schedule, he couldn't leave. I guess we have to depend on the reinforcements to stop the assault. Ragus's defection is causing a lot of trouble. The place being attacked by Ragus still had a good amount of waypoints nearby. Their troops just had to retreat into the already prepared defense facility. They just had to wait for the reinforcement. General Rishu, a dragon magen rushed into the barracks. He was breathing hard. As soon as he saw Rishu, he delivered the shocking news. Ragus broke the seal to infinite demonic beast. What? Rishu became surprised. He reflexively looked towards Chains. 
Chains also had an expression of disbelief on his face. Resu mumbled to himself. He made it look like a faint operation. But he chose the most heavily guarded location. Jeffers Almerick was in a state of despair. It was the same for all the young generations that had been competing with each other for their whole lives. A Tyne's declaration had been too shocking. Jeffers' beliefs were undercut in one fell swoop. It took him a while to recover from it. However, Jeffers had someone he could rely on unlike Kieran and Niberus. It was his great ancestor Almerick. Almerick was steadfast in following Attain, so Jeffers was able to eventually write himself. The road I'm walking on is righteous. When Attain appeared, he just corrected the course. In his life, Jeffers never chose an enemy for himself. As always, his enemies were chosen by others. He just put his life on the line to carry out his mission. The Almeric tribe used despicable methods to create candidates that'll become the heir. After fighting the other candidates, Jeffers had gained the title of heir. Then he competed against Laura, Kieran and Niberus for achievements. Until this moment, he always walked down a path chosen for him by others. He never felt any regret before. He was always given a new path when he reached the end of a road. He never thought about searching out his own path. This was why Jeffers wasn't despairing at the fact that he might be on the wrong path. Ragus, do you realize what you've done? It was caused by the actions committed by the giant undead in front of him. His surrounding had been hopelessly destroyed by Ragus. Ragus had been bold as he attacked from the front. He defeated all the elites using his overwhelming destructive capabilities. The dragon demon weapon Soul Hammer was the worst weapon to face when one had to defend a single location. The earthquake caused by the Soul Hammer broke apart the magic circles. The elite troops were sent flying into the air like like toys in front of Ragus. After being attacked in such a way by Ragus, they desperately tried to attack him. However, the result was turning out to be horrendous for the dragon demon king worshippers. They had to somehow detain Ragus before he could transform. However, Ragus was able to transform as time passed. He was able to use his dragon demon magic, and his power was unimaginable. The loud sound rang out deep within the ground. The light of magic dispersed into the surrounding, and a very thick darkness appeared from within. It rushed out like a geezer. I woke up a monster that wants to eat the whole world. Ragus chuckled. Chapter 232. Dragon Demon General. Part 2. The damage to the force of Dragon Demon King worshippers was smaller than expected. Ragus's attack obliterated the surrounding, but in the end, he only destroyed the magic circles and the defensive structures placed around the waypoint. As expected of elite troops, less than 20% had died. However, their fight against Ragus was unimportant. Their first priority had been to defend the seal, yet it had been destroyed. These guys are fun to beat up. You are like a boar that had its tail lit on fire. No matter how strong you are, the sealed being cannot be killed. Do you really think I caused this mess without knowing that? Shit. It is like talking to a wall. Your actions have dire consequences. We aren't capable of sealing that being now. The troops, who were defending the seals, were given spells by Atain. They were to be used in emergency situations where the seal was broken. It would allow him to place another seal. However, Ragus had destroyed all the magic circles they had prepared. They had no way of resealing the infinite beast once it made its appearance. What a funny little cub. Is your lofty sense of duty blinding you from reality? Ragus pushed the soul hammer towards Jeffers' face. Jeffers groaned. Jeffers had expended all his power in an attempt to protect the seal. If Ragus wanted to do it, he could crush Jeffers' head. Jeffers had turned pale as he continued to monitor the darkness that was surging up from the ground next to him. When Rayug saw this, he became baffled by Jeffers' reaction. He withdrew his soul hammer. Ha! You are more worried about failing your mission than dying. Geez, it seems they really trained the young generation to become madmen. At that moment, the darkness nearby resolved into a monster. It was an enormous monster that dwarfed Ragus, who was three meters tall. It was made out of darkness, but there was a dull red light streaking through the darkness. The monster resembled an alligator. 
It let out a roar as it charged towards Ragus. Ragus didn't hesitate as he brought down the soul hammer on the monster's head. Then he jumped on the back of it, and he brought down the soul hammer again. The impact widened as it destroyed the ground for several hundred meter radius. However, monsters kept crawling out from the collapsed ground. Some looked like humans, and others looked like wolves. There were monsters that looked like a mixture of several different beasts. It was a very odd sight. They were the monsters prepared by Atain. They were placed here to protect the seal. Ragus, who had destroyed the ground, let out a heroic laughter. If it wasn't for me, you would have become exhausted fighting these guys. The monsters appeared as soon as someone threatened the existence of the seal. However, Ragus possessed the soul hammer. It was a dragon demon weapon capable of destroying and controlling the earth. Normally, he was able to create a massive earthquake but he was capable of focusing his power at a single point. As a result, Ragus broke the seal with a single strike. This was why the sealed infinite beast awakened at the same time as the monsters, who were supposed to protect the seal. I believe there is a fierce battle happening underground. Suddenly, a woman spoke as she approached Ragus. Jeffa's eyes widened. Niberus, it has been a while. Sir Almeric, no, should I just refer to you as Jeffers? Niberus had summoned her Book of Darkness, and there was a dense darkness emanating from her entire body. While Ragus charged into the fight, Niberus had held back. She had conserved her energy. She did so, because she would have to prevent the Dragon Demon King worshippers from interfering with the upcoming fight. What's on your mind? You are his blood descendant. Did you lose pride in that fact? How can you be part of this? Jeffers was sincere in his criticism. Niberus just looked at him. There was an unpleasant feeling wriggling within her. However, it wasn't directed towards Jeffers. Jeffers, you are another version of me. What? I would have been just like you if I didn't have Duran by my side. I would be like you if it wasn't for the existence of my father. From the time of their youth, they hadn't been given any choice. They were grown as tools by beings that had been overcome by madness. They didn't have a clear view of the world and madness had been consistently injected into them. It robbed them of the ability to look back upon the world with a critical eye. The result of such conditioning was in front of her. It was Jeffers. Niberus would have turned out just like him. The only reason she didn't turn out like him was the fact that she had always questioned why Cybane, who was the son of Atane, had left the plane of darkness. Cybane had to leave behind his daughter in the process, and she had always wondered why he had done that. Moreover, she had Duran. If he hadn't given up his life to uphold her pride, she wouldn't have had the opportunity to change her mind. She had received a blessing. She was able to look back on her past actions with skepticism, now and she was given the opportunity to make her own decisions in life. She hadn't received this opportunity, because she possessed excellent ability and will. She was gifted this opportunity, and that was the reason why her current self existed. Laura, Kieran and the others. At one point, she hadn't been able to comprehend the choice made by Laura. No, it would be more accurate to say that she hadn't been able to forgive Laura for making that choice. However, Niberus could understand her now. Then there was Kieran. Kieran had always been with her since childhood. He had always looked towards her. Niberus shut her eyes for a brief moment before she opened them again. She let go of all other thoughts as she looked towards Jeffers. She spoke. If I look back on it, I was able to make this choice thanks to the people close to me. They were too good for me. Jeffers, that is why I don't hate you, and I won't condemn you. I don't have that right. What are you talking about? In the past, this was what Azel Kazark wanted to say to me. I understand it now. I am sad. We are speaking the same language yet we aren't able to understand each other. It is coming. At that moment, Ragus spoke as he looked below. Niberus replied, Please leave your back to me. I'll put all my faith in you. Even if I'm attacked from behind, I won't blame you, so don't worry about it. Niberus looked puzzled by his words. He said he trusted her, and he was making jokes with her. She was unaccustomed to it. Ragus laughed uproariously. Well, Shall I go see the transcendent being that was sealed before my time? Soon, 
The ground cracked open, and a monster of peerless size appeared from the hole. Dragons were known as being the biggest living creatures on the surface of this world. This monster was bigger than the dragons. There was a human that hated the reality of humans being threatened and killed by other beings. It was unknown as to what kind of human he had been. However, he had lost his humanity when he encountered the demon race. Something had changed in that encounter. He was being horrified by the malice and murderous intent displayed by the other species, and he wondered why it had to be like this. He felt lost as he tried to find a way to permanently solve this problem. After torturing himself over it, he arrived at an answer. There are too many species that exists in this world. Each species fought for the benefit of their own kind. In doing so, an endless amount of murderous intent and malice arose. Would the problem be solved if the number of species was decreased? There are too many of them. It is inevitable for them to fight, because they are too different from each other. Even if one looked at humans as a species, there were too many of them. There weren't too much differences between those in the same species, yet everyone only focused on the difference. The differences created ill will and killing intent people in large quantities. I just have to leave one alive. He had mulled over it for a very long time before he came up with an answer. If the high number of species were a problem, he just had to make sure that there was only one left. Even if he left behind one species, the diversity within a large population would also cause problems. He just had to leave one behind. I'll eat him all, and I'll combine them all within me. All the possibilities that exist in this world will be within me. I will become the world itself. He abandoned his human form, and he turned himself into a monster that specialized in gluttony. He decided to eat all of the living beings in the world. He possessed an endless appetite, and he started to eat all the living beings. However, he had been sealed by two magicians named Atane and Ornsaurus. The beast roared after awakening from its long sleep. Just its roar caused the ground to shake, and the winds picked up. At a glance, it looked like a black dog. However, there were over ten pairs of red eyes on its face, and its tail was like a whip. It possessed four legs and it had human-like feet with six digits. Above all else, it was huge. It was twice as big as a dragon. It really was akin to a moving castle. Ha! Really, I might get completely crushed. Ragus sounded as if he was having fun as he mumbled to himself. Atane had told him about the infinite beast long ago. In the fight against Atane and Ornsaurus, the infinite beast had lost most of its bulk. When it was sealed, its body was one hundredth the size of the it original size. It used to be one hundred times larger. Atane and Ornsaurus did well in defeating it. It is regretful that I wasn't there. There is a high probability that it became so large, because it ate all the monsters as it climbed to the surface. Niberus had a stiff expression on her face as she spoke. Ragus nodded his head. I see. It exists to eat everything in this world. Anyways, let's beat it before it can eat more. Ragus kicked off the ground. He wore a white armor, and he shot off the ground like a cannonball. He impacted on the roaring monster's head, and the sound of explosion rang out. It had been sealed for so long that it was still groggy. However, it lasted only for a brief moment. The swaying beast raised its front paw, and it took a swipe at Ragus. After swinging his soul hammer, Ragus had still been in the air. He was sent flying after being swatted. The ground exploded when he hit it. You bastard. You are quite spirited. Ragus ran forward before the dust could even settle. Niberus held her breath. It has amazing regeneration ability. The half-destroyed head of the beast regenerated instantly. The nearby monsters of darkness, which had been protecting the seal, attacked the infinite beast. The beast roared. The front paw with long fingers brushed the monsters of darkness off of its body. It grabbed one of the monsters, and it stuffed it into its mouth. How dare you eat when you are facing me? At that moment, Ragus charged forward to strike the head of the beast. The beast fell to its knee, and Ragus used the recoil to move higher into the air. He brought down the soul hammer more violently than before. Blow it away, soul hammer. The ground collapsed on itself. The nearby region was obliterated. 
The infinite beast and the monsters of darkness had already destroyed the surface of the ground as they crawled up from below. The infinite beast tried to move deep into the ground. Ragus didn't let it do as it liked. I hate beings that attack me as they hide in the ground. The soul hammer impacted on the caved in ground, and the ground exploded outwards. As a massive dust cloud rose, the enormous beast rolled across the ground. Ha 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 ha. Ragus was having a blast as he chased after the beast. He swung his soul hammer. Each strike caused an explosion as the ground shook. Each strike was powerful enough to destroy a mountain. Blood and flesh shot out in all direction as the beast's body was destroyed. It was like a fountain made out of blood and gore. When people saw this, they became speechless by Ragus's overwhelming power. Ragus was large, but he was a mice when compared to a dragon or the infinite beast. However, he was dominating the beast. The beast cried out as it was beaten to a pulp. It feebly swiped with its legs. However, Ragus didn't dodge the attack as he struck down the its legs with his soul hammer. Its legs were ripped off, and they were sent flying. It opened its mouth. Light exploded forth. A frightening beam of light exited the beast's mouth. Ragus was in the air, so he couldn't dodge it. He was swallowed up by the light. In a flash, several hundred meters around Ragus was engulfed by light. It was a beat late, but intense heat hit all sides. The demonic beast swayed on its remaining legs before it fell to the ground. The beast possessed peerless regeneration ability, but Ragus's fierce attacks had caused a lot of damage. Its body was a mess. Blood was leaking out everywhere. The whole region was dyed red with its blood. However, it just needed a brief moment of respite for it to heal from its wound. Of course, there was a price for such a miracle. As it regenerated its body, the size of its body was slowly getting smaller. It was a wonder that the beast was still alive. The beast started to eat its own severed legs. Normally, its appetite was endless. Its hunger increased exponentially. It felt as if it would go crazy if it didn't eat something. Its eyes headed towards the monsters of darkness that was charging towards it. The monsters of darkness were brave as it attacked the beast. They stuck to the body of the beast, but it used its remaining hands to stuff the monsters into its mouth. As soon as it ate the monsters, they were digested. Each time the beast ate a monster, the body of the beast started to get noticeably bigger. I told you you shouldn't eat while fighting me. The beast was eating and conducting a battle at the same time. From high in the sky, Ragus was dropping towards the beast like a meteor. He hit the beast's head, and half of its head was blown away. Its neck broke as it was bent in a L shape. It was a pretty flashy attack. However, you'll have to hit 100 times harder if you want to destroy this body. Ragus got onto the back of the swaying beast. He brought down the soul hammer on its spine. The impact went straight through the beast's body. It wasn't like the beam of light sent out by the beast, which had been done out of desperation. Ragus's attack was focused. The force created by the attack didn't travel far out. It was focused all on the body of the beast, and it shook the earth right underneath the beast. I love bashing it into a pulp. Struggle a little bit more. Ragus was having fun. As he was about to raise his soul hammer, he suddenly tilted his body away. A beam of light impacted on his body. Chapter 233. Dragon Demon General. Part 3. Have you mustered up the courage to fight me? The one that sent the beam of light was Jeffers Almerick. Numerous Dragon Demon King worshippers were moving in the background. Jeffers Almerick, who held a Dragon Demon weapon, was directing him as their leader. While Ragus was fighting the demonic beast, the Dragon Demon King worshippers had finished positioning themselves. At once, they attacked Ragus. The elite troops focused their attack on Ragus, and a radius of several dozen meters were raised to the ground. We can't allow him to use the soul hammer. Be ready to give up your life. Keep pushing him. An old dragon demon exercised his right to command. He yelled out his orders. He wasn't one of the figures stationed at the seal. He was one of the reinforcements that came through the road of emptiness. His name was Galton. He had participated in the dragon demon war, and he had been one of the figure of authority within the plane of darkness. Galton knew how dangerous Ragus was. 
This was why he didn't recklessly attack Regus. He had positioned his troops, so he could take advantage of the best opportunity to attack Regus. He had placed his troops around Regus in a circle, and the troops capable of long-ranged attacks used a three-shift system to continuously attack Regus. Several hundred troops were carpet-bombing him, so Regus had to go on the defensive. He turtled up. While the regular magicians did this, the high-ranked magicians prepared a great magic. We have to get get rid of Regus and Infinite Beast at the same time. This was why they had remained quiet in the background up until now. The Infinite Beast was immortal. They had no way of killing it. However, they would be able to seal the Infinite Beast if it used up most of its power against Regus. They could place the seal without the magic circles that had been prepared beforehand. This was the calculation he had made. You guys are the same as always. You were too arrogant. It was as if her voice had poured cold water all over them. At the same time, a hail of darkness started to descend upon them. Niberus. Galton became surprised. In order to focus on their fight against Regus, he had dispatched troops to kill Niberus. Twelve dragon arts practitioners and a dragon demon undead from the dragon demon war was sent towards her. Ten magicians were added to this group. Galton already knew how skilled Niberus was, and he determined that he had to go above and beyond to kill Niberus. Niberus broke through the troops as she participated in the main battle. What's going on? Did Kieran Baldazark already join up with her? Kieran had betrayed the plane of darkness with Niberus. If he was with her, it would have been possible for her to overcome his troops. However, Kieran had been nowhere to be seen when he had given his order. While Gatan was flustered, Niberus had activated her great magic called Queen of Darkness. After her abilities were boosted in an explosive manner, Niberus used another great magic. Round Table of Cursed Demons. Twelve enormous corrupted bodies arose from the darkness. These familiars were called the Corrupted Bodies. They were created through the resentment and negative energy left behind by the dead. The use of these familiars had been Niberus' specialty even in the past. However, the current corrupted bodies were displaying a presence that was on a whole different level than before. It felt as if one's soul would be ripped apart just hearing the sound of their cursed scream. Each twelve corrupted bodies were as big as Regus, and each of them had unique features. One had an enormous sword, and another one held a spear. There was one with dual swords. There was one that held a long sword and a shield. Another one held a chain. Only a small number of people in the battlefield recognized Niberus magic. Isn't this Sibane Nim's technique? Galton was one of them. As the offspring of Atain, Sibon had been on another level in terms of dragon demon magic when compared to the other dragon demons. This spell was the round table of cursed demons. It was a great magic that Sibane had been proud of. Twelve corrupted beings were gathered in one place, and each of them moved as if they were warriors that had mastered their own respective martial arts. They were able to fight exquisitely, and they were capable of slaughtering even a dragon. They could even use dragon arts techniques when provided with magical energy from their owner. The most frightening part was. Don't be rash in attacking them. You have to absolutely avoid the darkness, and you have to hold back using certain magic depending on their specific attributes. Each of the twelve corrupted beings reacted to a different element of magic. Galton gave the right order, but he was a step too late. The magicians used the spells they were most comfortable using. It was done on reflex. Flame, lighting and whirlwind converged on the corrupted beings. However, the spells changed course before they reached their target. What the hell? While the magicians were flustered, six of the twelve corrupted beings let out a dreary grey light. The six corrupted beings sucked in the fire, thunder and whirlwind into their bodies. Shit. Stupid bastards. Galton expressed his frustration. The corrupted beings swallowed up the magical energy that matched their own attribute. The spells were turned into their own power. If one wanted to avoid this result, one had to separate the corrupted beings. One had to use the opposite attribute or one had to use physical force to destroy them. They have decent features, but in the end, they are mere corrupted beings. There is no need to be afraid of. 
A pompous dragon mage and warrior shouted those words as he used instantaneous movement to charge forward. However, the warrior couldn't finish his words. The corrupted being equipped with the dual blades moved unbelievably fast for a three-meter giant. In a flash, it blocked the dragon mage and warrior's sword. Moreover, it had only used one sword to block the attack. It used its flexible body to shift its center of gravity, and it ruined the dragon mage and warrior's balance. It cleaved the dragon mage and warrior in half with its opposite sword. Its cursed roar assaulted the dragon demon king worshippers. A corrupted being with a great sword appeared behind the dragon demon king worshippers. Lightning was concentrated in its great sword, and it swung its great sword. While the focused lightning hit its enemies, the corrupted beings with the spear ran behind the corrupted being holding the large shield and sword. Block them. The magicians were a beat too late in materializing purely physical magic arrows. The attack shook the ground, yet it was useless. The corrupted being with the large shield led the charge. The spear equipped corrupted being jumped out from behind the large shield equipped corrupted being at the right moment to skewer the nearest magician. This makes no sense. How can the corrupted beings pull off tactical maneuvers? Shock spread amongst the ranks. Each corrupted being was so power that they were breaking common sense. Moreover, they moved as if they had learned advanced martial arts, and they used tactics to move as a team. Even Nibirus was surprised. I never expected him to be this strong. If it wasn't for Atain and the dragon demon generals, Cybane would have been in the running for being the greatest mage of his era. Cybane had imprinted all his spells into the Book of Darkness. Currently, Nibirus could only use half of the spells. When Nibirus expressed her will to fight against Atain, he taught her how to use the most dangerous spells within the Book of Darkness. He had done so, because she would be fighting a being that was basically a god. Round Table of Cursed Demons was a spell created to deal with a force that had large number of magicians within their ranks. Nibirus. You foolish girl. Do you not realize how noble a destiny you were entrusted with? Galton raged when the progress of battle had turned against his forces. It was a mess. Nibirus glared at him with cold eyes. I am well aware of that fact. At the same time, something black hit Galton. Galton was shocked. The dancing Macon. You even learned that spell. She knew this spell too. It was one of the spells favored by Cybane. The cursed swords were made out darkness, and they were flying around Galton. The swords were moving twice as fast as arrows, and they assaulted Galton. The spell was a powerful curse at its core. However, if Nibirus wanted to, she could infuse it with other types of spell. Galton's defensive magic was being torn into shreds, so he desperately retreated backwards as he shored up his defense. Is this how you killed them all? He now understood how Nibirus was able to annihilate the troops that had been sent against her. Very good. Stylish. A nightmare-like voice rang out. When the focused assault of the dragon demon king worshippers lightened a little bit, Ragus was able to escape their bombardment. Even if Nibirus was powerful, she wouldn't be able to face the several hundred elite troops gathered here. Her goal was to sow chaos, so Ragus would be freed. Ragus had messaged Nibirus beforehand, so she had moved the corrupted being towards one side. She had created an open lane for Ragus, and it led straight towards Galton. That was perfect, miss. Ragus brought down his soul hammer. The ground was overturned in its entirety, and the shockwave spread a distance of several hundred meters. Jeffers Almeric knew his death was close at hand. He had safely avoided the earthquake caused by the soul hammer. He also used his dragon demon weapon to create a gale. It had protected him from the large fragments of rocks. As a result, he had used up all his power. A silhouette of a knight appeared in front of him as it burst through the cloud of dust. It was the corrupted being with the great sword. When Jeffers blocked the great sword, he was sent flying. It was as if he was a kite with its string cut off. If he hadn't consumed most of his reservoir of power, it wouldn't have been a problem. The round table of cursed demons was a powerful spell, but each cursed corrupted beings were weaker than Jeffers. On top of that, this spell was more effective against magicians. Even now Jeffers wasn't going down easily. 
He was forced into a corner, yet he was trying to find a way to escape. He kept dodging the sword of the corrupted being. The sound of screams and explosion rang out from within the cloud of dust. His allies were being slaughtered within the chaos. Regus's single strike had caused this chaos, and it had turned this place into hell for the dragon demon king worshippers. You have a pretty good backbone. Jeffers had been fighting desperately, but he heard a familiar voice behind him. At the same time, someone grabbed his collar, and Jeffers was thrown backwards. The man blocked the great sword that was meant for Jeffers. Jeffers adjusted in midair, and he righted himself before he hit the ground. He was shocked to see a dragon demon youth with shabby blue-white hair. He wasn't equipped with any weapon, and he was gripping the great sword with his bare hand. General Rishu, this is the second time I've saved your life, Almeric heir. I want you to take a step back, and gather yourself. Rishu was looking towards Jeffers, so the corrupted being tried to take advantage of the situation. It slightly tilted its sword as it let out a terrifying kick. For a moment, Jeffers had no idea what had happened. When the explosion was heard, Rishu had already travelled several metres forward. He remained in his stance with his fist extended. A corrupted being was flying through the air behind him with its arm blown off. It is extremely sturdy. I've never seen such a corrupted being. Rishu clicked his tongue, and Jeffers felt all the hair on his body stand on end. He felt a wave of dragon demon magic that was on par with Ragus. It was as if a shooting star had appeared in front of him. Release dragon soul. The image of a half-translucent red dragon appeared around Rishu's body. The dragon quickly expanded its size as it bit into the corrupted being. Afterwards, Rishu kicked off the ground. No, he was gone as soon as it looked like he was about to kick off the ground. After a beat later, the ground exploded and a light pierced through the sky. The lower body of the corrupted being with the great sword was blown off. It was the result of Rishu passing through it like a meteor. However, the corrupted being wasn't dead. It righted itself in the air as it tried to hit Rishu. It is quite extraordinary. Rishu was surprised. After living for several hundred years, he had seen all kinds of magical beings. He had never seen one like this. However, Rishu's surprise did not hamper his actions. He continued to use instantaneous movement. It was as if he was teleporting between short distance as he kept hitting the corrupted being. The corrupted being was unusually sturdy, but it couldn't stand up against Rishu's assault. It broke apart. Rishu clicked his tongue. This was completely specialized to use against a large force. Of course, anyone other than Rishu would have had a very hard time destroying even one corrupted being. These were powerful magical familiars capable of killing the elites of the Plane of Darkness. Rishu focused on his breathing for a brief moment. Jeffers couldn't tell, but Rishu was a bit out of breath. When he heard the seal of the infinite beast was broken, he had left the place he was guarding. He had come to this place at full speed. He had arrived as soon as possible, but the area around the waypoint was completely destroyed. Aside from him, no one else would make it there on time. An unexpected bottleneck had been created at the waypoint, and it had caused him trouble. There was a limit to the number of people capable of passing through the waypoint at one time. The plane of darkness was using the nearest waypoints to bring in troops. This was why Rishu had to run a very long distance to reach this place. Even Rishu became tired after running for such a long distance. Rishu took a brief moment in the chaos of the battlefield to put his breath and the flow of his dragon demon magic into order. It is done. After he had calmed his breath, Rishu gestured with his one hand. The dragon's soul twitched as it let out a gale. Chapter 234. Dragon Demon General. Part 4. A thick cloud of dust was suddenly split into two with Rishu at the center. The sight was a grand miracle. For a brief moment, the whole battlefield came to a halt, and everyone's gaze was focused on Rishu. Geez, I have to fight someone else now. You should just give up. Only one person didn't stop. It was Ragus. Even in the chaos, Ragus had continued to beat up the infinite beast. In the beginning, the infinite beast had been twice as big as a dragon. Now it was the size of a large house. 
What the hell? Jeffers felt a sense of dissonance as he watched the battlefield. He had no idea why he was having such feeling. Something is off. The infinite beast itself wasn't odd. He felt a sense of dissonance when he watched the absolutely wrecked surrounding. If he thought a little bit more on it, he thought an answer would be forthcoming. However, Rishu opened his mouth before he could come up with one. As expected, the notoriety of the dragon demon generals was well deserved. Absolutely wonderful. Rishu laughed as if he was having fun. At that moment, Ragus kicked the infinite beast. It was sent flying into the distance before it crashed to the ground. He turned around to look at Rishu. Him. By the look of your unusual hair color, it seems you are my new peer. Are you Rishu? I'm scheduled to become one. I'm not your peer yet. I see. This is quite surprising. I heard if from Atane, but I never expected to meet someone that possessed as much dragon demon magic as me. Rishu clicked his tongue. Azul's assessment of Rishu had been accurate. In terms of dragon demon magic, Rishu had a bigger reservoir than Atane. Rishu had known he would become enemies with Azel, so he hadn't shown the full extent of his power when Azel visited the Alberton Forest. His power had grown in the past 220 years. However, Ragus was letting out a resonance of dragon demon magic that was on par with Rishu. It was all possible, because he was in his transformed state. When he was transformed, he was able to generate power that was twice as large as his undead self. He had surpassed his past self in terms of power. You have a small body, but you have stupidly large amount of dragon demon magic. For your information, I don't use such words lightly. I'll think of it as an honor. Rishu grinned. Ragus got into his fighting stance as he raised his soul hammer. The presence of these two beings was overpowering the battlefield. Nibiru's voice interrupted the two of them. Please stop, Sir Ragus. At the same time, the stalled battlefield came back to life. The round table of cursed demons were still killing the dragon demon king worshippers in the chaos. Their screams rang out. Ragus ignored their screams as he spoke. Oh, miss, you know my personality, right? You want me to hold back when there is such a tasty morsel in front of me. Moreover, don't we have to fight him eventually? Did you forget the promise you made to my father? At her words, Ragus let out a groan as if he was in pain. He had made a promise with Sybane before he left the Alberton forest. While he was with Nibirus, he promised he would protect her. Nibirus spoke coldly as she reminded him of his promise. You should only fight if it is necessary. I trust you won't go against your word. A real man won't go back on his words. Jeez, you are poking me at a sore spot. I'm sorry, but you don't get to choose if we fight or not. Ragus had been scratching his head when Rishu charged towards him. In fact, he was already in front of Ragus. Everyone, who was watching the fight, couldn't believe what had just happened. Every one of them had activated their senses to the extreme, yet they hadn't been able to register Rishu's movement. When Rishu was about to reach Ragus, an explosions rang out. It was as if Ragus and Rishu had switched places. Ha ha ha. This is electrifying. You really are strong. I'll have to destroy you here and now. If not, you'll be a big headache in the future. Oh, I like your decisiveness. However, you won't get the result you want. Because you are decisive, we'll see. The sound of explosions rang out. The two fighters kept switching locations in a dizzying fashion. The one to take the initiative was Rishu. The dragon made out of red light was wrapped around Rishu's body as it performed a fierce attack against Ragus. He kept using continuous instantaneous movement to attack Ragus from all sides. Ragus couldn't keep up with Rishu's speed. Rishu was already using his next attack when Ragus reacted. The acceleration was so abrupt and fast that it looked as if Rishu was skipping time. It wasn't just one or two attack. He used continuous instantaneous movement, and the technique was fear itself. The attacks were faster than the speed of sound, and it was never ending. Ragus couldn't close the gap in speed. Rishu executed a powerful kick, and the red dragon let out a roar. Flame erupted from the dragon's mouth. A man should decide the outcome of a battle through one attack. Ragus had been on the defense this whole time. 
as if everything before had been a lie, the soul hammer lashed out. The ball of flame was met head-on with the soul hammer, and it caused an explosion. Rishu hadn't expected this counter-attack. He thought he had created the perfect opportunity, and he had used his ace in the hole. How could Regus volley his attack like this? Moreover, the one to dominate the next sequence of events was Regus. Regus pushed through the flame created by the explosion, and he swung his soul hammer towards Rishu. He was using instantaneous movement. It was something that Regus hadn't used since the battle had started. Rishu flew high into the sky. Regus was so large that he gave off an impression that he was slow. However, he had used instantaneous movement, and even Rishu couldn't dodge his charge. Regus had acted as if he had no solution to Rishu's speed, and he had been waiting for the perfect opportunity to counterattack. Ha 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 ha! Regus righted himself in the air, and Rishu was below him. He brought down his soul hammer. You shouldn't put down your guard, because you are in the air. The sound of explosion rang out. Dirt and rocks shot into the air as if shot by a cannon. Rishu had been so surprised that he had escaped towards the air, and Regus had struck him down. Rishu gave up on avoiding the attack. He kicked off the air as he changed direction. Then he started punching everything that was thrown at him. Rishu and Regus bounced off each other in opposite directions. Rishu impacted on the ground at terrifying speed. He skidded several dozen meters before he came to a stop. It was as if someone had scratched the ground. He wiped the blood away from his lips. I compared you to a boar with its tail lit on fire, but it seems you are craftier than I gave you credit for. I thought you were a cheap bastard that only relies on his speed. It seems you have quite the manly side to you. Regus let out a heroic laughter. Rishu tried to regain his breath as he coldly assessed his current situation. I'm sure of it. He's experienced fighting someone faster than me. Rishu had created the continuous instantaneous movement technique, so his attack speed was beyond common sense. It wasn't something that one could react to. Regus had avoided serious damage by strengthening his body, and he had protected his vital parts. His defense was so precise that it gave Rishu goosebumps. It was proof that his body couldn't follow Rishu's attack, but Regus's consciousness was accurately seeing his attacks. As expected of the legendary dragon demon general, I see why he is respected by the old man Alberton. He deserves it. There had been countless powerful beings within the Alberton forest, and Rishu had fought against all of them. Moreover, he had spent 200 years of his life, wandering the world, and he had fought against all types of foes. Despite having these experiences, Regus's powerfulness was unique. Rishu asked him a question. Regus, why did you betray him? You fought in the Dragon Demon War for Atane. You even chose to stay with him through death, so why? Let me ask you a question too. Why are you cooperating with Atane? You have enough power, so why? You answered a question with a question. Ah ha ha. You don't have to give me a serious answer. I know I'll regret this. My heart hurts that I have to hold back with such a powerful enemy in front of me. However, I made a promise. My honor as a man is on the line. What? Rishu's eyes became wide at that moment. The nearby darkness, which was made out of magic, started to surge into the sky. Niberus had placed an enormous magic of darkness over the battlefield, and part of that darkness was surging into the sky. The distracted participants of the battle suddenly realized something. They are moving the infinite beast. The surging darkness had imprisoned the weakened infinite beast, and it was being moved through the air. Rishu was shocked. Oh no, is he here too? He knew it had been a possibility. Azel was probably waiting up high in the sky. While Regus distracted everyone, Laura probably used the Vitten's maze in the air. What happened if Azel shot the extreme extinction after completing it within the Vitten's maze? Wouldn't Azel be able to easily achieve his objective of killing the infinite beast? No. Rishu instantly realized that he had guessed wrong. There was a being in the sky that had been masked by the presence of Regus and Niberus. This being was waiting for the right time to attack. Rishu had been right about that. However, it wasn't Azel. The one to show up was a dragon demon youth with long blonde hair. 
It was Kieran Baldazark. When Rishu spotted him, he became confused. What the hell are they trying to pull? When Regus broke the seal, he assumed that Azel was aiming for this place. What if Azel hadn't come here? If so, why did they break the seal of the infinite beast? Does he not care about the fate of the world? He shouldn't be doing this. If he wanted that to happen, they wouldn't have weakened the infinite beast. They would have let the infinite beast do as it liked. They would have killed the dragon demon king worshippers, who were capable of sealing the infinite beast. At this point, Rishu could only think of one reason that could explain their actions. Are they planning on separating the infinite beast from the great darkness? What if they are trying to seal it themselves? However, it wasn't easy sealing a transcendent being that had achieved immortality. If they had the ability to seal the infinite beast outside of the great darkness, they had to do it someplace that Atain couldn't reach. If it was so easy, Atain would have already relocated the seals to the dragon demon palace. He couldn't decipher their intentions. However, Rishu no longer had the time to think over this problem. Kieran was flying high in the sky, and he was talking to himself. I didn't even practice this spell, yet I have to use it in a live battle. It really is nerve-wracking. However, a human magician pulled this off before. There is no way I'll fail. His voice was shaking from the nerves. He desperately concentrated his mind on the blood-colored ball above his head. He was using the dragon demon weapon called the Bleeding Star. It had absorbed a massive amount of blood, and the ball of blood was 20 meters in diameter. It was directly correlated to the amount of bulk lost by the infinite beast. Jeffers Almerich looked up from the ground, and he finally realized what had bothered him earlier. I didn't see any blood. That was it. In the battle against Ragus, the infinite beast had lost tons of blood. In the immediate aftermath, the battlefield had been dyed red with blood. However, when Rishu pushed the cloud of dust aside, the battlefield had become unusually clean. Of course, there were blood shed afterwards, but it was a drop in the bucket compared to the amount shed by the infinite beast. Kieran had hidden in the sky, and he had absorbed all the blood on the battlefield. Before he arrived there, Kieran had already slaughtered animals and demonic beasts in order to fill his reservoir of blood. Now the bloodshed within the battlefield was added to his already large reservoir. A frightening amount of magical energy emanated from Kieran. Jeffers yelled out, everyone run. The bleeding star could create magical energy by using blood as fuel. The dragon demon weapon's power was directly proportional to how much blood one had. With the amount of blood he had gathered, he was basically a god of destruction within this battlefield. Everyone realized their current predicament. Everyone used all their might to disperse and run away. Scatter. We'll be slaughtered if we don't run away. They weren't running away in panic. They knew what was coming, so they made a tactical decision to retreat. It was an attempt to minimize the damage. They had been trained on how to react when they found themselves in such a situation. Kieran smiled as he looked at the ground. It is going as planned. Chapter 235. Dragon Demon General. Part 5. Kieran looked at the situation below, and he smiled. It went as planned. Everything had gone as planned. Rishu's appearance had been a surprise, but Azul's side had taken such variables into consideration. Rishu had to retreat. At that moment, the magical energy in Kieran's hand was so massive that even Rishu was afraid. It was unknown as to how much destruction such a large amount of magical energy could cause, and he had no plans on finding it out. Rishu didn't need to clash against the spell to know that the result would be horrific. A wave of heat started to overtake those that were running away. This phenomena made them run harder. However, it wasn't a phenomena created by Kieran. Nibiris detonated a spell that she had prepared beforehand. She had purposefully detonated the round table of cursed demons to create a massive wave of heat. The power of Ragus's soul hammer added earthquake to the fire. The attack spread outwards. If this move was pulled off in the middle of a city, the humans within the city would have been wiped out. It was a calamitous attack. The Demon King worshippers were desperately running away, so Rishu was the only one capable of asking the question. What the hell? What are they aiming for? Rishu hadn't stopped running away. 
If the horrifying amount of Kieran's magical energy was added to this attack, something unimaginable might happen. However, Rishu felt that something was off. Why hadn't Kieran immediately attacked them? A massive cloud of dust had risen up, thanks to the earthquake, so Rishu couldn't see the answer to his question. The blood of the infinite beast had risen up into the sky, and it had been swallowed up by the bleeding star. Finally, Kieran activated his magic. Extreme extinction. The bleeding star possessed incredible amount of mana. The ball of blood started to burn white starting from its center. As the magical energy combusted, the pressure reached its max. Finally, an extreme destructive event occurred as the infinite beast was erased from this world. Earlier, after Euron sacrificed himself to save his party, Azul's party learned something new. Carlos had handed a magic tome to Laura, and it detailed the process in which a magician could recreate the extreme extinction. Carlos hadn't put any safeguards on the magic tome when it came to Laura. She could read everything within it. However, there were hidden contents within the book, and it was released when Euron had died. It seemed Carlos had been wary of Euron's identity to that extent. When she found out this truth, Laura thought hard on it, and she came to a decision. She wanted to teach extreme extinction to Nibiris. Laura had to convince her party. Her party didn't react too favorably to her suggestion. Leticia expressed her discomfort with the idea. I was willing to help her, but I do not think I can trust her. You are asking too much of us. It was the same for Chiron. Extreme extinction is a secret card that Atain must never attain. It is a technique, yet a big sacrifice is needed to use it. That is why we'll only use it when absolutely necessary. Even if Nibiris decided to go against Atain, will she really be able to sacrifice her dragon demon weapon in the process? He had to come up with the battle plan, so he tried to look at the situation from a cold and logical point of view. Carlos had used the extreme extinction technique through his magic tome. He had developed it further after he used it against Belrun and Ixeru. The prerequisite was much less onerous than before. However, the fact that one had to sacrifice a dragon demon weapon in order to use it hadn't changed. Arietta let out a sigh. I can't separate my emotions from my answer in regards to this problem. I'll bow out. Arietta didn't know much about Nibiris. That is why she didn't have much to add to conversation. Moreover, she still held a huge grudge against Nibiris. The only one not to give his opinion was Azel. Azel was deep in thought before he asked a question. Laura, what is the reasoning behind your proposal? I've already told you. Laura's reasoning was quite simple. It wasn't unreasonable to ask Regus, Nibiris and Kieran to travel together. The Guardian Shadows could be used as a means of communication. They could attack multiple locations to carry out joint operations. However, the other groups other than Azul's party could only be used to distract or occupy their foes. It would be better if each group had a member that was capable of dealing the decisive blow. This would allow Azul's party to maximize their utilization. Azel asked again, give me the other reason. At his words, Laura became silent. She looked hesitant as she opened her mouth. I trust Nibiris. It is based on my personal feeling. That is enough for me. However, others might need more convincing. At his words, Chiron, Leticia and Arietta looked at him in surprise. It meant Azel had faith in Laura's opinions, and he supported her. Laura spoke. I've watched Nibiris for a long time. I've always hated her, but there is one truth I do know. Nibiris is an idiot. Everyone was taken aback by her words. They thought she would make a serious argument, yet she called Nibiris an idiot. She has an excessive amount of pride and self-respect. You can threaten her with death, yet she won't compromise. If needed, she would throw away her life for her pride. Azel agreed with what was being said. When he delivered Sybane's message, he was able to get an accurate measure of Nibiris. Nibiris that I know is like that. You've seen this side of her. I did. Leticia had rescued Nibiris not too long ago by controlling the Guardian Shadows. She had gathered the nearby Guardian Shadows in one location, and she had monitored Nibiris for a time. Laura had been accurate in her characterization of Nibiris. Nibiris knew she might die. She knew she was making a foolish choice, 
yet she didn't go down any road that she found unacceptable. She possessed an unbending pride. Laura spoke. I know the risk is high. I'll go meet her, and we can make a decision. Afterwards, the discussion continued on for a long time. However, they eventually decided to follow Laura's suggestion. After everything was resolved, Azel decided he needed some air, so he went out to scout the nearby region. Laura came looking for him. Thank you. About what? Azel asked with a playful smile on his face. Laura felt a little bit embarrassed, so she avoided his gaze. Thank you for supporting my opinion. I only agreed, because I thought it was a decent idea. However, I have a remaining question left. What is it? Why did you have that idea in the first place? At its surface, Laura's suggestion seemed to have a rational reasoning behind it. However, Azel could see that there was clearly an emotional component to her decision. It existed beneath the surface. Even if she considered Nibiris to be a trustworthy person, she wouldn't have come up with the idea of letting Nibiris learn the extreme extinction without an emotional component to it. When Azel pointed this out, Laura looked off into the distance for a brief moment before she answered him. Nibiris and I share the same burden. Same burden. It is such a large burden that I can't live my life without resolving it. There was a nostalgic look in her eyes as Laura thought about her past. Both of them had been born and raised in the plain of darkness where madness reigned. The two of them lived their lives as tools, and they were constantly reminded as to why they had to live such lives. Their lives were being dominated by the mythos of the dragon demon King Atain. At an early age, Laura decided to walk her own path. It was different for Nibiris. When Atain chose to reject the ways of the plane of darkness, Nibiris could have chose to support Atain. However, Nibiris didn't choose to go down this path. She broke through the madness that had kept her penned in, and she decided to make her own future. From this point on, Laura felt a sense of kinship with Nibiris. We have to see this fight to the end. Only then we can think about how we'll live our future lives. Laura's life was a series of fight. She had been a tool that was used to fight the world. She was groomed to be a weapon, and she had kept fighting and fighting. She never had the opportunity to think about what she wanted to do with her life. It was the same after she betrayed the plane of darkness to become Azul's comrade. She always had enemies that she had to fight. It was the same where it was before she betrayed the plane of darkness or the day when Atain was revived. She was always fighting against the world. The plane of darkness had been her world. Now she had to fight against them. She had changed side, but the fact that she had to fight hadn't changed. However, she realized something when Atain finally revived himself. The long fight was coming to an end. However, I still know nothing. After the fight comes to an end, she had no idea what kind of life she wanted to lead. She had only been able to find the meaning in life when fighting. What was she supposed to do when her sole reason for living was gone? It must be the same for Nibiris. The only meaning in life was to fight. That was why it was hard for her to imagine a world without enemies. Despite everything, we have to see this to the end. Then we will be able to step forward. Even if the future was a hellish wasteland, she had to see this to the end. Afterwards, she was able to start her life anew. Azel had been silent as he listened to her. He opened his mouth. I'm surprised. Why? Your story is surprisingly similar to mine. Azel looked sheepish as he laughed. Laura's story surprisingly made him think of the days when he held similar sentiments. From Azel's perspective, this fight was like settling an old debt. He had been thrown into the future, so Azul's soul still felt stuck in the past. If he didn't settle this, he would never be able to move forward. Still, I'm better off in one aspect. I have something I have to do after I finish my fight. What is it? Didn't I tell you before? I'll establish the county of Kazark. I'll wipe away its bad name. I'll make it so that people will want to live there once again. After he won the fight for the fate of the world, Azel still had plenty foes to fight. When she heard his words, Laura just looked at him as she spoke. I can help you. What? When the fight ends, I don't really have much to do. I am indebted to you, so I can help you. Her expression hadn't changed, but she was discreetly avoiding his gaze. 
It seemed she was embarrassed. Azel held back his laughter as he asked her a question. Since you are out of work, you are asking me for a job. You told me that a high-ranked magician like me can name a price when it comes to finding an employer. Chiron will probably hire me for a lot of money. Laura sounded coy. He cackled at Laura's extremely reasonable reply. It is as you said, magician Laura Nim. I have nothing, so I can only give you a pittance until I achieve my goal. If you don't mind that, please help me. Only if I have nothing to do. Laura continued to act coy until end. Present time. It was a success. Kealia was the first one to realize that Kieran had succeeded in pulling off the extreme extinction. She was restricted from accessing information through the Great Darkness, but it didn't matter. The being that was considered to be the Pillar of the Great Darkness had been released from its seal, and it had ceased to exist. Kealia could feel it on an instinctual level. Azel spoke. Kieran Baldazark is excellent. I dismissed him as being a cub. I'll have to apologize to him. Kieran hadn't made much of an impression on Azel. He looked similar to Baldazark, and his abilities were decent. That was it. However, Kieran had chosen to put his life on the line to follow Nibiris. He chose to go against Atane. As if that wasn't enough, he had willingly sacrificed his dragon demon weapon in order to strike a grievous wound against Atane's plan. Azel expressed his respects towards Kieran. At that moment, he had accepted Kieran. If we meet again, I'll express my thanks to you. Kieran wasn't the only one fighting for his life. Azel was also fighting for his life. Almeric, how long will you hide inside? You are being timid like a coward. This isn't like you. Come out. Azel's party had went to the point guarded by Almeric. Azel's party was going all out as they aimed for the tree god of the Balran forest. Chapter 236. Clash of the Legends. Part 1. It happened when Regus and Kealia had left. They had declared their opposition towards Atain. Almeric searched out Atain, and he asked the question. Why did you let them go? Even if he possessed the highest authority within the Great Darkness, Atain couldn't coerce Regus and Kealia to stay. However, wouldn't it be possible for Atain to imprison them? Atain gave his answer. There are two reasons why I didn't do it. There is a rational reason, and there is an emotional reason. Which one do you want to hear first? I'll hear the rational reason first. Why? If I hear the emotional reason first, I think I'll get mad. I see. I made a deal with Kealia. A deal. Kealia is the first being that had transcended what I had designed. It might have something to do with her experience of living multiple reincarnated lives. I believe it created a new variable. When she stood in front of Atain once again, he realized she possessed transcendent power. Her current power couldn't be compared to her past self. The core of Atain's plan revolved around the Great Darkness, and from his perspective, she was someone that deserved to be feared. Since she is dependent to the Great Darkness, I might be able to subdue her. The probability of success is high, since I possess a higher authority than her. However, she is an existence that has become one with the Great Darkness. My body is alive, and I am merely connected to the Great Darkness. In the process of fighting her, she might cause massive damage to the Great Darkness. She could do this if she wanted to be reckless. Atain didn't want to take such a risk. This was why he had made a deal with Kealia. He would let Regus and Kealia go. He would give them the chance to fight him as free-willed individuals. In exchange, Kealia would place restrictions on her authority within the Great Darkness. It was a deal that was acceptable to both parties. Kealia also didn't want to resolve the fight at that moment. There was a chance that she might perish without being able to cause any harm to Atain. This was why the two of them had made a deal. Almeric accepted that answer. I see. What about your emotional reason? This fight might be the last fight between me and humanity. Atain spoke as he looked into the empty air. There was a faraway look in his eyes. As long as Almeric could remember, Atain had been like this. Atain fought the current reality in front of him. Yet his gaze was always far away. He was always looking at places that others couldn't see. Even if he won this fight, Atain's fight wouldn't end. This was merely the first button being buttoned up in Atain's plan. If he wanted humanity to last forever, 
there were countless problems he had to fix. However, when one was putting an enormous plan into action, there was nothing more important than the first step. This is why I want to see all the possibilities. I want to do it before the fight against humanity ends. I want to see all of it before I make the irrevocable choice. He was basically trying to place a fence around humanity in order to keep them safe. He wouldn't completely take away their free will, but he would take away their choice to choose evil. He would stop them from self-destruction. Regus's revolt. Yes, if I'm to be honest, I expected it. That's the type of man he is. Atain truly felt regret. He knew Regus's personality, yet he had chosen to hide the decision he would make in the future. This also didn't mean that he had tried to hide the truth in order to delay making a decision. Atain had conducted an experiment with the plane of darkness, and his hopes had been high. He knew in the corner of his heart that it was hopeless, yet he desperately wished the plane of darkness would give him hope. However, the result was what it was. Rishu realized that no system created by humans could prevent tragedies. He despaired at this truth, and he agreed to join my cause. Rishu had told Azel about this in the past. The world made by humans lifted up those that were evil and greedy. They were punitive towards people that were good and selfless. If a person with evil intentions harmed a good person, there should be a punishment. However, this common principle wasn't often followed. Even if the principle was kept, it wasn't as if the one that had lost one's life would come back to life. A fundamental solution was needed. It would be an ironclad rule with no loopholes. Rishu had experienced countless tragedies, and he had come to a decision when Bayon met his death. Almeric, this might be abrupt, but I want to hear your answer to this question. Why do you continue to follow me to the end? Atain hadn't decided to revive the four dragon demon generals, because he had absolute trust in them. He had done it out of respect for the four of them, who had lived through the same era as him. Even if all four of them turned against him after being revived, Atain wouldn't have regretted his decision. This was why Atain felt thankful towards Almeric, who had decided to remain next to him. Almeric spoke. As you probably know, my aim in life is different from Regus. As I've told you before, I believe true order is needed if the world is to find peace. Long ago, Almeric had been a king of a region, and he had lost to Atain. It was the same for Regus. The two of them ruled their lands differently. They were polar opposites. The only thing common was the fact that they had ruled through the absolute charisma they possessed. In the eyes of the normal people, they were gods walking amongst men. Regus's country was lawless, and everyone lived a freewheeling life. If a tribe was living like that, it might have been understandable. However, he was in charge of a small nation. It was almost unbelievable that Regus had been able to maintain his society. On the other hand, Almeric had been strict in enforcing his law and order. There was clear ranks in his society, and a person was punished if they acted out beyond what their station allowed. It was obvious as to why Regus and Almeric had been on bad terms before they served under Atain. Numerous fights had occurred between the two. However, no rule I can think up can bring perfect order. Even nature is unpredictable. That is why my choice might have been inevitable. Almeric looked like a fierce beast. At a glance, he didn't look like someone who followed societal norms. That wasn't true. For example, one just had to watch wild beasts form a pack. There was a clear hierarchy and order within the pack. The peace of the pack was only disrupted only when the leader of the pack starts to lose its authority. It brought confusion within the pack. I cannot live by myself. I build my own pack, and I put in place a clear hierarchy. However, neither the humans and the dragon demons could escape their base nature. Almeric had lived for over a thousand years. He believed that humans weren't that different from beasts when it came down to it. They possessed more intelligence than beasts, but he also observed humans show more ugliness than good. That is why I want to see it once. I want to see true and eternal peace. I want to see the absolute order. You are with me because you want to see that. I am green compared to you. Still, I've lived for a long time. No matter how hard I worked at it, I was unable to achieve my ideals. I have a chance to do so right now, 
and I believe it is a cause worth risking my life. What do you plan on doing after that? Atain sounded amused as he asked the next question. Almeric was speechless for a brief moment. He never thought about what he would do after he achieved his ideal world. If Almeric could achieve his ideals, it would be akin to an end to an epic story. I'm not sure. If your majesties is able to create the ideal world, wouldn't a swordsman like me be useless? It might be really late, but maybe I'll study magic. No, you will still be an important asset to me. Even if our fight against humanity ends, there are countless problems we still have to solve. We'll have to fight. Atain smiled. Almeric looked at him for a brief moment before he spoke. If I really don't like the ideal world, I can go against you. I'll become your majesty's enemy. At that point, it'll be a meaningless fight. You won't be able to win. Yes. Almeric didn't hesitate as he gave his answer. Atain nodded his head. I see. I have one request. Almeric. What is it? Please survive until the end. I want you to see me make the ideal world. This time Almeric didn't answer immediately. He thought over it for a brief moment, then he spoke. Laughter was infused within his words. If my fate allows it, I'll willingly do so. He could hear consecutive explosions outside. Almeric had been deep within his thoughts. He immediately broke out of his thoughts when he felt the ground shake. He mumbled to himself as he looked at the seal that was layered with magic circles. We were made a complete fool. The news about the other seal was delivered through the great darkness. From the perspective of Azul's party, they were probably jumping in joy. Things were turning out exactly as they had planned. A member of Ragus's party had the ability to use the extreme extinction. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were taken unawares. Rishu was supposed to be guarding this site. However, Rishu had headed towards the other seal, so it was the worst-case scenario for Almeric. When Rishu left, both sites were attacked simultaneously. The nearby waypoints had already been destroyed. The waypoints that were moderately close were being attacked by the members of the Guardian Shadows. Azul's party appeared at the location of the seal. Azel, Laura, Chiron, Leticia, Arietta and Kaalia were participating in this battle. It wasn't just them. The strongest members of the Guardian Shadows were there too. The Dragon Demon Prince Saiga, Akmij Biorin Michael and his disciples were present. Moreover, the White Sword Count Ricardi, who was considered to be as dangerous as Chiron, was here alongside his family. On top of that, over 2,000 Guardian Shadows were present. Basically, they were planning on settling the fight here. It was an all-out assault. Almeric realized that he had been their target all along. It wouldn't have mattered Rishu hadn't moved from this place. Even if he comes to my rescue, they made it sure that I'll be dead. That is the goal. The problem right now was the fact that Azul's party had seized the initiative. The pillars of the great darkness couldn't be moved even by Atain. Kaalia's betrayal meant that Azul's party had gained information that Atain had wanted hidden. Moreover, Azul's party hadn't even given Atain's side the opportunity to respond. They had put everything on the line in order to win this battle. They are my enemies, yet they made an excellent and decisive decision. Hugh, Hugh. It has been a long time since I've been pushed to the edge of the cliff. This wasn't the first time he had experienced this. In the Dragon Demon War, he had been driven into a dead end, and he had been killed. However, if he looked back on his long life, he had faced many life-threatening situation. He was able to spurn the allure of the Grim Reaper until he finally met his end in the Dragon Demon War. This is great. Almeric let out a ferocious laughter. His heart started to beat faster. His escape route was blocked, so he would have to fight powerful enemies with his life on the line. His life had always been a series of fights. How could he not be excited for this fight? On top of that, the foe waiting for him was Azel Kazark. Azel had been the culprit behind his first death. This was the best stage for this fight. He could wish for nothing more. How much time do we have left? Almeric asked his underlings. Ten magicians were sticking close to the seal, and they were desperately carrying out the task. Whether they could finish their repairs would determine the fate of Almeric. At the very latest, it'll be done in ten minutes. I guess I'll have stay alive until then. 
I'm guessing you don't need my dragon demon magic anymore. Yes. I pray for your success. The magician was resolute as he answered Almeric. His underlings were dying outside, yet he had been stuck here. His dragon demon magic had been needed to continue the repairs. However, the step where the magicians needed his dragon demon magic was at an end. He had no reason for staying here. It would have been fun if Ragus had come here. On the other hand, Azel Kazark is a more extravagant meal compared to that dead bastard. I have no complaints. Almeric mumbled to himself as he exited the building, which had been hastily constructed with magic. Come dragon demon weapon. A frightening wave of dragon demon magic swept over the battlefield. Almeric appeared at the heart of the battlefield, and he raised his great sword. It was half translucent as if it was made out of glass, and blue lightning started to erupt from the sword. Storm's Scream. Chapter 237. Clash of the Legends. Part 2. The wave of dragon demon magic surged forward like a storm. Those that were exposed to this power trembled, and a stillness descended upon the deep reaches of the decimated Balan forest. However, it lasted only for a moment. Soon, the battlefield started moving again. The combatants had been fighting a fierce battle with the opponents in front of their eyes. Some unknown power had appeared, and it had overpowered their senses. However, they didn't have the luxury to be distracted. This was especially true with those that were fighting the Guardian Shadows. Unlike the living foes, the Guardian Shadows weren't subject to changes in emotions. The Dragon Demon King worshippers, who showed an opening, were ruthlessly cut down. Your ass has gotten heavy, Almeric. Azel moved towards Almeric. He had been fighting the Dragon Demon King worshippers, so there was a couple hundred meters of distance between the two of them. However, it didn't matter. During the Dragon Demon War, the two of them were known for being the strongest in terms of using the clone technique. It was an extremely difficult technique that could only be used by Spirit Order and Dragon Arts Practitioner. The possibility of pushing the Incarnation technique to such levels was unimaginable to others. Both of them had transcended time and space in terms of battle concept. I'm sorry for making you wait. I had to carry out my duty as a commander. I got swamped by a heavy workload. You should be understanding since you're less busy than me. You are also young. Almeric laughed like a fierce beast as he blocked the sword swung by Azel's clone. When the swords clashed, lightning exploded forth. Almeric destroyed a clone with one strike. Yet another clone of Azel attacked from the back. Almeric didn't even turn to look. Azel's clone was pushed backward as an explosive sound rang out. One of Almeric's clones had been deployed to block Azel's clone. At the same time, Almeric's true body was starting to push forward. Azel also was walking forward. His red hair was blowing in the wind as he walked through the pandemonium. I owe you a debt from our last fight. Since you gave me a very warm welcome, I'll have to give as good as I got. Azel spoke. There was over 200 meters between him, but it didn't matter. The two of them were speaking through their clones. The clones clashed at the midway point. Explosions and lightning bolts detonated. Several dozen clones kept appearing and perishing. The process kept repeating itself. I see. It was a poor welcome. Yet you thought it was a warm welcome. It really hurt my heart that I can't extract the interest from the debt you incurred to me. Almeric retorted. In the past, Almeric had lost to Azel, and he had suffered a critical wound. In the end, he lost his life to Duke Qua Nidal. In this era, Almeric had pushed Azel to the brink of death twice. However, it wasn't enough to wipe out the debt. One of them had to die to settle the debt owed to each other. The two were taking big strides towards each other. Their epic battle started to dominate the battlefield. The air shook each time the clones clashed. Fierce gale was swirling around the combatants. Every combatant, who had been fighting, looked over to check out the fight. Their mouths fell open from shock at what they saw. The sky. There was even a change to the weather. Dark clouds were quickly gathering above them, and there was an increase in precipitation within the wind. A beam of light split the darkening sky. Almeric spoke. Sky splitter. The king really wants that weapon, but I'll have to commit an act of disloyalty. I'll destroy it. 
Azel didn't back down as he gave his retort. Storm's scream. I bet you want to hand it down to your descendants as a legacy. It symbolizes the long years you've lived. Unfortunately, it will disappear from this era. The two of them put on a smile full of killing intent. They hadn't stopped moving. Clones kept appearing and disappearing around him as they conducted a fierce battle. However, Azel and Almeric were calm. As they controlled their clones, they kept a steady pace. This sight was awe-inspiring. The fight hadn't started in earnest. The clones, who were fighting around them, were mere warm-ups to the main fight. Despite this fact, they were dominating the battlefield. The tension was making it hard for others to be Bria to H. It was as if they would be flattened by the pressure. My god, this is the power of those that took center stage at the Dragon Demon War. The White Sword Count Bacchard Licardi, and Chiron were called living legends in this era. They had lived in an era where a vast majority of the techniques had been lost thanks to the machinations of the Plane of Darkness. Still, they had been overflowing with talent, and they were able to reach a supernatural level through never-ending effort. When they were young, they had admired the heroes of the Dragon Demon War, but on the other hand, they were sure that they weren't too far behind in power compared to those that fought in the Dragon Demon War. The only difference was the era they were born in. This prideful belief continued to grow as they fought for the Guardian Shadows. It grew when they took on the mission to protect the world. When they were able to meet and accept Azel as who he really was, they couldn't hide their admiration towards him. Anyone in this era would have reacted the same way. On the other hand, their competitive spirit was lit on fire. Would their powers work against the legendary hero? We are still too far off. At that moment, they realized how childish their thoughts were. Azel and Almeric finally reached a distance where they could exchange sword strikes. Almeric spoke. It seems we've warmed up. Why don't you show me the power that killed the king? As you wish. Azel let out murderous intent as he laughed. The blue longsword clashed against the translucent great sword. The shockwave shook the battlefield, and it was the start of the true battle. Azel was known to be the best in the Dragon Demon War when it came to cloning technique. It was an era filled with genius fighters. Despite this fact, not many were able to learn the incarnation technique. Amongst those that were able to learn it, no one could give substance to their clones like Azel. This was also true for Almeric, who was better at the cloning technique than Atane. Almeric could simultaneously create 16 clones. Azel could manifest twice that number. This didn't mean Azel could dominate Almeric in the Battle of Clones. The last fight between Almeric and Azel had been a desperate struggle. Almeric had run away after suffering a severe injury. Duke Kwa Nidal had to track down and kill Almeric instead of Azel. It turned out that way, because Azel had also suffered serious injuries in the battle. He hadn't been in a state where he could track down Almeric. Light and thunder clashed against each other as sparks flew. Azel's clones were made out light, and Almeric's clones were made out of lightning. As the clones clashed, it shook the firmament. As the consecutive explosions rang out, the true forms of Almeric and Azel ran across the ground. They used instantaneous movement to change location each moment as they clashed, and the shockwave shook the ground. Come Dragon Demon Weapon, Moon Sword. In the middle of the battle, Azel summoned another Dragon Demon Weapon. It was the sword he inherited from his third teacher Liglan. It had an insidious ability of taking control and absorbing the magical energy near its vicinity. The sword shone in the hands of a clone. Clumsy. At that moment, Almeric's clone appeared in front of the clone holding the moon sword. The arm of the Azel clone was severed, and it was blasted out of existence by a lightning bolt. Another Azel clone appeared as it stabbed towards the Almeric clone. However, an expression of surprise appeared on the face of the Azel clone. The Almeric clone had cleaved the arm of the Azel clone, yet it didn't hold any substance. The Azel clone had stabbed empty air. Instead, the false clone on the side was suddenly infused with substance, and it struck out with a powerful attack. The lightning swallowed up the Azel clones as it attacked the true form of Azel. This was a destructive power that exceeded Azel's thunder dragon's horn. As expected, he is formidable. 
Azel could only grit his teeth when faced with the calculated attack. In terms of number, Azel should be able to overwhelm Almeric, but victory was elusive. The two of them were fighting a battle that had a razor-thin margin. A single mistake could cause one to take a grievous injury. As a clone technique practitioner, Almeric was much better at giving and taking away substance to his clones. Azel continued to maintain a certain number of clones with substance, and he dismissed the clones when needed. Then he recreated the clone with substance at a different location. He repeated this process. Almeric didn't need to dismiss his numerous clones. The clones slid between substance and no substance in a seamless manner. Moreover, each clone held more power. Azel was able to generate overwhelming power through dual banding, but Almeric had a bigger container. Almeric's clones were able to hold more power. Almeric held an upper edge in those aspects. Basically, Azel was superior in terms of generating power in short bursts. In terms of maintaining power through a longer period of time, Almeric was better. I know humans have a surprising ability to evolve, but your skills haven't grown much. Is it because you've already reached a too high of a level? The true bodies clashed against each other. Lightning erupted when their swords met. The gale was so fierce that it was hard to breathe, and the consecutive thunderbolts detonated as they caused the firmament to shake. Azel broke out in cold sweat. This bastard's technique has gotten better. In terms of handling the clones, Almeric's technique had developed magnificently. The ability to transfer substance between the clones had already been displayed during the Dragon Demon War, but there had always been a slight hitch when he used it in battle. However, the transfer happened naturally now. The clones slide between substance and non-entity like flowing water. He disguised himself as an old man to spend the past 50 years in retirement. Did he just work on his technique during that time? Almeric's cultivation of the technique had grown so much that Azel had such thoughts. At some moment, the equilibrium was broken. Azel staggered on his feet. For a brief moment, the control over the lightning was lost by Azel. Almeric used this opportunity to kick Azel. An explosive sound rang out, and Azel was sent flying into the sky. It was as if the dark clouds were swept up by a current, and a thunder fell from the sky. The thunder wasn't able to reach the ground. It couldn't pierce through Azel. His sword took hold of the thunder before it could do that. Almeric didn't land his attack, yet he was undeterred. In the first place, the attack was merely a strategic move. Sword that cuts through the storm. It was one of the secret techniques that made everyone tremble during the Dragon Demon War. The thunder, which originated from Almeric on the surface of the ground, shot into the sky. For a moment, the whole world was dyed in white. The thunder that surged up from the ground struck Azel. The thunder exploded as it ripped apart the sky. The storm was ripping apart the surrounding as the aftereffects of the attack hit the surface of the ground. Shit. This is ridiculous. Chiron gritted his teeth as he protected himself with the dragon soul. In his initial fight with Almeric, Chiron had taken the initiative. He didn't give Almeric the time to use his power so he was able to fight on even ground with Almeric. This time Almeric was able to deploy his clones in the beginning. When Chiron saw the full extent of Almeric's power, he was at a loss for words. If one had mediocre skill, even the secondary effect of the fight could kill them. Azel had become strong, but he said he couldn't guarantee a victory against Almeric. Chiron now knew why he had said that. Azel, Laura's face turned pale. After using the Calamitous attack, Almeric hadn't stopped. He calmly readied the next attack. I have to stop him. It happened when Laura was about to use her dimensional distortion. Something stopped her magical energy from forming the spell. Laura's shocked eyes took in the sight of Almeric's clone. It seemed Almeric caught wind of Laura's meddling, and he had stopped it. Laura, I do not take you lightly. No, it is the same for all of you here. This was why clone technique users were terrifying. They could be in multiple locations, and they could monitor several locations concurrently. They could do it without messing up their movements. Almeric's clone kept attacking Laura. She was being pushed backwards. The nearby enemies recognized Almeric's intent, and they started focusing their attacks on Laura. No, 
Laura's heart sank. She saw the exploding lightning, and the irregular flow of power. The lightning should be spreading out in a random pattern, yet it was sucked into Almeric's sword. It was an unnatural sight. Thunder gods. The translucent blade burned white, and in a flash, it turned into an enormous sword burning with lightning. This was a technique he had used against Urin. When Azel and Almeric clashed, a storm of lightning had formed. Almeric used this power for his own use, and he created a calamitous attack that could wipe out tens of thousands of lives. Sword. The destructive sword divided the sky. It was like taking a hot knife to a butter. Everything within the sword's path was cleaved. The dark clouds burned up, and the clear sky could be seen. Then, it was as if the sword had cut until it reaches the boundary of heaven, and the after-effects of the attack turned the battlefield into living hell. Chapter 238. Clash of the Legends. Part 3. At that moment, everyone was desperately trying to stay alive. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the attack by Almeric was akin to an iron mace of calamity swung by a god. One had to use all of one's power to survive against the after-effects of that attack. Bullseye. At the same time, Almeric was sure of it. Azel hadn't been able to dodge his attack. Almeric was able to see what the others missed. In the beginning, Azel was able to dodge half of the lightning bolt, and the other half had been absorbed by him. Afterwards, Azel used the absorbed lightning to boost his thunder dragon's horn by dozens of magnitude. The sword that cuts through the storm was mostly neutralized by using the thunder dragon's horn. Almeric had predicted Azel's move until that point. This was why he had prepared the thunder god's sword. The rebound from using the thunder dragon's horn had made Azel come to a halt for a brief moment, so he wasn't in a position to respond to Almeric's attack. Is he dead? Despite seething, Almeric wasn't sure about the result. The probability of Azel surviving that strike was almost nil, but his opponent was Azel Kazakh. The fact that he was having such thought allowed him to dodge the attack that was sent towards him. The beam of light had been shot towards him. It was merely the beginning of the attack. Several dozen beams of light came at him from all directions. While Almeric was dodging, a much more dangerous attack revealed itself from beyond. An Azel clone appeared in the rear, and he brought down his sword against Almeric. Explosive flame erupted from the sword. It was a technique that was on par in power with the Thunder Dragon's horn. It was the Fire Dragon's horn. As expected, as if Almeric had expected such an attack, Almeric controlled the gale to push aside the attack. He didn't know where Azel's true body was located at, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter where the attacks would come from. He planned on crushing all of it. Flame continued to rage around his surroundings. Azel clones surrounded Almeric and all of them used the flame dragon's horn at the same time. Ridiculous. He is able to generate this much magical energy at one go. A hell-like heat was burning up his surrounding. The flame dragon's horn was able to absorb the heat in the surrounding to create its terrifying might. Moreover, eight clones were simultaneously using it at the same time. Even Almeric couldn't help, but shudder at the attack. Almeric charged out of the exploding flame. He accelerated using the instantaneous movement, and he cut down the Azel clones. Azel had manifested eight clones, and only three of the clones were successful in pulling off the attack again. The other five was destroyed by Almeric clones. It happened at that moment. A ray of light pierced through Almeric's chest. What? Almeric's eyes widened. The sound of an explosion rang out a beat late. This was the first time Almeric had lost his balance since the start of the fight. He couldn't withstand the explosion, so he was sent flying. He couldn't understand what had happened. Almeric had his guard up. His surrounding was too chaotic, so it was hard to read the flow of power. However, he had been prepared for a sneak attack. It shouldn't have mattered where or when the attack was sent by Azel. He should have been able to block it. However, a thin beam of light had pierced through all his defense as if it was paper. A finger-sized hole had appeared on his chest. What the hell was it? The size of the wound was small, but he had taken the full brunt of the attack. There was a hole in his heart, so it was a critical wound. However, 
Almeric was someone that possessed life energy in abundance. It was as big as a mountain, so he was able to use dragon arts to stop the bleeding from his wound. His power mimicked the function of the problematic organ. Azel, you made a mistake in not being able to hit my head. If the attack had pierced through his head, the fight would have ended. However, it had hit his heart. If the damage was localized, there were ways to patch up the damage. Almeric was barely able to regain his balance, and he was breathing roughly. An Azel clone with the moon sword appeared in front of Almeric. A fierce attack was unleashed. Don't underestimate me, Almeric yelled out in anger. The moon sword could absorb magical energy, so it was the worst type of attack for Almeric in his current state. Just facing the moon sword caused disturbance in the flow of his magical energy. However, Almeric was like a typhoon as he pressed his attack against the Azel clones. Almeric cut off the head of a clone. Other Azel clones kept attacking Almeric, but his defense was like a steel wall. He was injured, yet he used his storm-like rage to beat back Azel's attack. At the same time, Almeric's clone had moved into the sky as he checked what had happened. Sun lightsaber. It was as if an enormous tree of light was sprouting from the ground to the sky. As the light dispersed, he could see Azel at the center of this light. His armor was broken, and his entire body was bloody. When he saw this, he understood what Azel had used to attack him. Extreme extinction. I see. This is extreme extinction. This was different from the extreme extinction shown by Azel in the Dragon Demon War. However, the existence of the extreme extinction had been confirmed through the Great Darkness. This was why Almeric had been wary of it. However, he had never expected Azel to use the attack in such a way. Almeric hadn't given Azel the time to manifest the Sun Lightsaber. He had worked under that assumption. However, Azel had transcended his expectation. A new variable had allowed this to happen. Brand of Paradise. Ha ha ha. Euron Rizester, you are a scary human being. I never expected to be caught unawares thanks to his majesty's reincarnated self. Azel had used Sky's Fortress, Master of Raging Wave, Defender of Dawn and the Sky Splitter. Azel had chained together five of his dragon demon weapons to defend the Thunder God's sword. However, he couldn't block the entirety of the attack, so his body was a bloody mess. He had almost lost consciousness, and he was barely able to stop himself from falling from the sky. Danger soon turned into opportunity. Almeric had used lightning bolts, which had erupted during battle, to manifest his ultimate attack. Azel could do the same thing. Above all else, the aftereffects of the attack was so large that even Atane would be able to decipher what was going on here. He was too far away. This was a golden ability. He pushed the brand of paradise to its limit as he accelerated time, and he used the light being generated in his surrounding to manifest the sun lightsaber with the sky splitter. He used all the leftover energy in his body to create clones, and he had distracted Almeric. In the confusion, he was able to land the extreme extinction on Almeric's body. As expected, you really are ridiculous. Almeric laughed as he pushed aside the fierce attack being carried out by Azel clones. Almeric could hear the footsteps of the Grim Reaper creeping up from behind his back. He was in danger of losing his life. This truth was felt vividly by him. Still, Almeric laughed. Azel's true body rushed forward, and he arrived in front of Almeric. The sky splitter had resolved into its light form, and it cut through the chaotic space. The light sword clashed with the sword in Almeric's hands. Lightning erupted at the point of impact, and the lightning was sucked back into the two swords. Then they clashed again. As the explosion rang out, both combatants became bloody, and they both took a step back. They regained their balance at the same time. It was as if both of them had forgotten each other's existence. They disengaged at the perfect moment, and they swung their swords towards their backs. A shockwave detonated. Both fighters had thought the same thing. As soon as they clashed, they sent a clone to each other's backs. They had read this truth, and they had reacted at the same time. How about this? The next round of attack was the same. They acted simultaneously. Almeric's clone could flow between substance and non-substance like water. 
When Almeric's clone attacked from behind, Azel accelerated forward to dodge the attack. Azel had created a clone with the small time difference, and he mounted a counterattack. Is this all you got? Let's see you deal with this attack. Azel had rushed forward, and the clone had appeared in front of him. It was as if the two figures were superimposed to each other. When Almeric was about to block the attack, the tip of Azel's sword turned immaterial. Azel had used perfect timing to dismiss his clone. Almeric's balance was thrown off, and the delayed attack of Azel struck out at Almeric. Almeric dodged the attack by a hair. However, it was as if Azel had been waiting for this moment. A powerful light detonated in the air, and Almeric's barrier was half destroyed. It made him stagger. Azel rushed in as he swung his luminescent sword. There was a frenetic energy behind his attack, but on the contrary, his form was eerily clean. There wasn't a single inefficiency as Azel swung a beautiful arc with his sword. Ah! Almeric's eyes widened. He was off balance, yet he was able to block the attack. He immediately tried to give substance to his nearby clones to mount a counterattack. However, he had been mistaken. Azel's sword was like an illusion, and it had sliced through his body. This. Almeric staggered as he retreated. Azel's strike had cleaved Almeric from his left shoulder to his right side. It was almost miraculous that his body hadn't fallen apart. It was an extremely deep cut. Blood fountained forth from his wound. I was wondering what you were planning to do, but you had been holding this back. Almeric spoke. His eyes headed towards his own sword. He had spent over a thousand years with the dragon weapon named Storm's Scream. It was basically another form of his soul. It held the powerful ability to control storm and lightning. It had been broken in half. Azel looked ghastly as he answered Almeric. I didn't plan on using this, but you are an outrageous bastard. This was his hidden card. It was the third form of the extreme extinction. After successfully hitting Almeric with the second form of his extreme extinction, he had resolved his sky splitter into its light form. Then he fought with his moon sword. He had done this, because he wanted to gather the scattered light for the sunlight saber. He needed time to form the third form of the extreme extinction. Azel had hidden this technique, and he planned on only revealing it in his fight against Atain. However, he had no choice. He had to use this technique to defeat Almeric. Ha! Almeric looked dumbfounded as he stared at Azel. Then he broke out into laughter. Ha 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 ha. He let out a heroic laughter. The blood from his wound continued to flow out. He was close to the point of no return. His death was near. He felt this to be true. Yet he strangely felt no regret. He felt unburdened. Suddenly, his laughter stopped. He spoke as he looked up at the sky. Azel, the king called us the children of hate. The demon race was born through human hatred. The dragon demon race was born when the dragons and demons tried to fill their deficiencies by combining the two races. In the end, the dragon demon race originated from hatred felt by humans. Since their existence was rooted in hatred, the dragon demon race didn't fall far from the tree. They possessed high intelligence, ability and longevity compared to humans. However, their base nature was similar to humans. It was inevitable. He is a sage that found the truths of this world. He must be right. However, it really is amazing. What is? I don't hate you. Azel. His flame of life was close to being extinguished, yet Azel saw Almeric smile. Azel watched Almeric as many emotions crossed his eyes. He was a foe worthy of his hate. At the same time, there was a connection between the two of them. They had lived and fought in the same era. In their fights, they had transcended all emotions. Both of them had reached heights where they were able to ignite each other's soul as ultimate competitors. Suddenly, Almeric moved his gaze towards Laura. As always, the battlefield was loud with the sounds of the battle. However, they met each other's eyes as if it had been promised. They didn't exchange any words, but Laura felt as if she had exchanged countless words with him. Almeric was someone she had to kill even at the cost of her life. He was her enemy, but at the same time, he had been her benefactor. When she was being raised within the madness of the plane of darkness, he had been the only person that had given her comfort. 
Elder, Laura respectfully lowered her head towards Almeric. She expressed her respect towards him. Almeric slightly nodded his head as he spoke. In this moment, I really can't hate anyone. There wasn't a single ounce of lie in his words. He had lived for over a thousand years. When he greeted the end of his life, he couldn't hate anything in this world. You are the fated victor. Take the blessing of vanquished. Almeric closed his eyes. I wish for your success in the war. Even as his life ended, he didn't fall over. He died as he remained upright like a sculpture. When Almeric was defeated, the outcome of the battle was decided. The slaughter started. The elite troops of the Plain of Darkness desperately struggled for their lives, but their demise was just a matter of time. When the tide of the battle tilted completely in their favor, Azel started getting ready to break the seal. He was going to completely destroy the tree god. However, the aftermath of the battle made it hard for him to find the trace of the forest. The landscape had changed too much. At that moment, darkness surged upwards in the middle of the battlefield. Azel felt a familiar energy within the darkness. It was an ominous and dangerous energy. Darkness incarnate. It was a Tyne's dragon demon weapon. It was the darkness incarnate. The darkness continued to erupt like a geezer, and a person appeared from within it. He had long black hair, and his black eyes looked as if he was looking far away into the distance. He was a dragon demon youth possessing a thick black horn. It was Atane. It's okay. At that moment, Kaalia flew to Azul's side. She looked more hazy than usual. He can't manifest his true body here. This was why Kaalia hadn't gotten involved in the battle between Azel and Almeric. Almeric had shown up a good amount of time later after Azel's party started their surprise attack. Almeric had to help out in carrying out a magic ritual. It was being carried out in the building housing the seal. It had been a ritual that would call Atane to this place. Kaalia had realized this. This was why she broke through the barrier magic around the building, while Azel and Almeric fought. She was able to defeat the magicians within, and she was successful in stopping the ritual. Atane was carrying out an enormous magic ritual, so he couldn't leave the dragon demon castle. However, it was similar to what Sybane had found out before. Atane had been able to secretly use a secret research facility even as he carried out the dragon demon war. It had been possible for him to do it, because he possessed the dragon demon weapon called Darkness Incarnate. The dragon demon weapons of Atane and the dragon demon general weren't personal possessions. They were all bound to the great darkness. When Euron had awakened, his body didn't go through the process of inheriting the dragon demon weapons. However, he had been able to use them, because he gained access to the great darkness. The darkness incarnate had also become one with the great darkness. This was why Atane was able to manifest a clone from so far away through the Great Darkness. However, he still needed outside help for a full manifestation. Kaalia had actively interfered with that work. I see. Azel swallowed his breath. If it wasn't for Kaalia, Azel would have been taken completely unawares. What would have happened if Atane had made his appearance during his battle against Almeric? Everyone here would have been sent to an early grave. A Tyne's clone looked like his real self. His back was straight as he approached Almeric's corpse. He sounded truly regretful as he spoke. It is regrettable, but I know you did your best. Almeric, you were one of my closest friends. Atane had asked Almeric to survive. Almeric said he would, but instead of a promise, he said he would let fate decide it. Maybe, the two of them had a hunch that such an end was coming for him. For a moment, Deep sadness could be seen as Azel looked at Almeric's corpse. Then Atane looked away. Kaalia, this is sudden and unexpected, but I can now see that you are resolute in your decision. After experiencing so many lives, you've found something worth more than your life. I'm thankful. Kaalia answered him. If it wasn't for you, I would have never gained this opportunity. Thanks to you I was able to choose the path I truly wanted to take in life. I will respect your choice. You were my comrade, and at the same time, you were my endearing companion. Now we will be enemies that'll fight for our fate. One word couldn't describe the relationship between the two. If it wasn't for Atane, Kaalia would have died within the body of a human girl. 
She had tried to avoid death through multiple reincarnation, yet her life had almost come to an end. If Atain didn't take on Kealia as his third wife, he wouldn't have been able to revive in this era. He had learned the reincarnation technique from her, and the experience of using the technique for the past 220 years had been a key part in reviving his true body. However, the mutually beneficial relationship between the two had come to an end in this era. Atain had lived a very long time, so his personal feeling towards others had faded away. Despite this fact, he couldn't help but be deeply moved by his emotions. Azel Kazakh. Atain's gaze headed towards Azel. Azel felt his heart beat faster despite knowing that Atain's clone was powerless. It was merely an illusion. The two of them finally stood face to face. Azel was an old foe that had ended the Dragon Demon War. He was Atain's fated foe. Azel had met Atain before, but it was merely a shade of himself. This was their true reunion. Azel and Atain faced each other after 220 years had passed. For a brief moment, they were silent as they looked at each other. The echo of fate penetrated the heart of the two beings. I see. The first to speak was Atain. There was a smile on his lips as he spoke. I also have been looking forward to this moment. After I was revived in this era, I've been waiting for the day when I would meet you again, Azel Kazakh. It feels awful to say this, but. Azel grinned. I feel the same way. I really wanted to meet you, Atain. It almost makes me wonder if I fell in love with your stupid mug. Ha ha ha. I see. This also might be something arranged by fate. Above all else, I am thankful for the opportunity to converse with you before we try to take each other's life. I don't have much to say to you. Azel replied in an apathetic manner. However, he shook his head soon. He took back his words. I want to say that, but I can't. If you have something you want to say to me, you can. There will never come a time where I would indulge your words like this. I agree with that sentiment, so I'll speak. Atain let out a bright smile as he spoke. The first to disappear will be the dragons. What? Then the humans will walk down the same path. He had heard this before. When he was assessing the skills of the four Likadi siblings, dark thoughts had risen up from the destroyed waypoint of the Road of Darkness. The last to disappear will be the Dragon Majin. The only one remaining will be the parentless Dragon Demons. The Dragon Demons will be all alone, and they'll have to take on the fate of fighting the evil born by the past. You really are babbling away. What are you trying to say, Mad King? At Azul's question, Atain answered in a calm manner. I'm talking about the fate that'll be greeted by my race and your race. I've been looking forward to this moment, so I sent messages to you in the past. It was an attempt to make you understand my will. Messages. Demon King Balsirk of the Udusk Kingdom. Azel flinched when he heard the name of the demon. This particular demon had told him about the truth behind the demon race. Atain spoke. Then there was the wise dragon Alberton. It was all set up, so you'll have the basic knowledge. It was done because I want you to be able to accept what I'm about to say. That was you. He had always been curious about it. Azel had learned about the truths about the dragon demon race from Balsirk and Alberton. The existence of the dragon demon race had created a problem in this world. Who had arranged it so that Azel became aware of this problem? At first, he thought it was Carlos. However, when he met Carlos in the mountain peak of Laos, it was revealed that someone else had arranged it. At that point, he knew that there was a high probability that this mysterious person might be Atain. Atain nodded his head. That's right. You hate me, and you never plan on forgiving me. If I hadn't used such a roundabout and troublesome method, I don't think you would have even given me the chance to start a conversation. As soon as Carlos started his work on eliminating Azul's curse, Atain had begun making preparations. He wanted to make Azel understand his goal. Atain had spent time much longer than the lifetime of a man to prepare for this conversation. Azel, you were chosen by this world to be my fated foe. Please listen to my story. It is about the sad shift in the fate of the world. It is something we will all face. The truth about the world started to flow out of Atain's mouth. Chapter 239 fate of the races. 
Part 1. Suddenly, Ragus raised his head. Almeric. In the end, you died. What? Kieran became surprised at the words that had come out of nowhere. He was lying down on the ground, because he was exhausted. It wasn't because he had used extreme extinction. The problem arose after he destroyed the infinite beast with the extreme extinction. He had to destroy his dragon demon weapon Bleeding Star. An analogy was a dam holding back the water from a reservoir. The dam was the dragon weapon Bleeding Star, and the gathered magical energy was the water. When the dam was destroyed, the stored magical energy rushed out as a fearsome torrent. He only needed 10% of the stored magical energy to manifest the extreme extinction. Kieran was an outstanding magician, but even he couldn't control that much magical energy without a medium like the dragon demon weapon. Kieran desperately tried to use up all the magical energy. He sent spells out in all directions, and he had caused great destruction. It allowed the rest of his party to escape without much problem. Ragus spoke. He probably fought against Azel. Humph. That cheap bastard. He should have died after he fought me. Ragus and Almeric had been long-time foes before they became dragon demon generals. They had known each other for a very long time. At times, they had been foes trying to kill each other. In other times, they had been brothers in arms. They had willingly fought back to back with each other. This was why their relationship had been very complicated, and outsiders wouldn't be able to understand the difficult and complicated emotions being felt by Ragus. Still, he died fighting Azel once again. At the very least, he won't have any regrets. After speaking those words, Ragus silently looked into the distance. He was probably looking towards the direction where Almeric had died in his fight against Azel. Demon King Balsirk spoke. Demons do not lie. Azel had considered his words to be absurd. The demons may not lie, but they twisted the truth in an intricate manner. The demons slowly pushed people to their deaths using these false truths. This was why Azel didn't put much faith in what Balsirk had said overall. The only part that he hadn't found fault was the truth about the demon race. On the other hand, he was suspicious of the being that had made a deal with Balsirk. Balsirk had to tell the truth about the demon race to Azel. According to Balsirk, the person that sealed him was different from the person that made the deal with him. The one to make the deal had been an unbelievable magician, but he had been human. Now that I think about it, he skillfully avoided telling me a lie. The one to seal him was Atain, and the one to make the deal was Atain's reincarnated self. Am I right? Atain had captured and imprisoned Balsirk before the Dragon Demon War had started. After he was reincarnated as a human, he had tried to wrap up his unfinished business. In the process of doing so, he had made arrangements, so the demon would deliver a message for him. Next, he made a request to Alberton. This was around the time when he was trying to convince Rishu to come over to his side. If Azel thought about it, it all made sense now. Atain replied to Azel's conjecture. You are half right. What? You got everything right except for the fact that I didn't seal the demon. It was Baldazark. Basically, there was no lie in Balsirk's assertion. Atain laughed as if he found this amusing. Azel queried him. Why did you to that? Did you truly think I would work towards solving the problem with you if I saw the big picture? Did you really think I would be persuaded by that? No way. Atain shook his head as he spoke. However, I truly need you and the sky splitter. At the very least, I needed to make the attempt at trying to convince you. It was an avenue I had to pursue. You can think of it as a courtesy towards you. He knew he couldn't convince Azel, yet he had made an attempt in trying to convince him. It looked like a pointless gesture, but Atain didn't think of it like that. In the past, Azel had fought him for the fate of the world. If they were to fight once again for the fate of the world in this era, he felt the need to inform Azel about the reasoning behind his actions. Ornsaurus, Baldazark and I researched about the demon race for a very long time. We found out the identity of the demon race. We elucidated the problem that arose from the presence of the demon race. After a long research, they had found out many truths. They had found out how the demon race was born, and they learned about a world that could be described as hell. They even found out about how the dragon demon race was born. 
However, we still couldn't find out the initial reason that caused the demon race to form. They existed before me. It meant that someone created hell and the demon race before magic existed. After countless trial and error, I was successful in finding the very first demon. However, he knew nothing. Isn't there a simple answer to all of this? Azel shrugged his shoulders. Atain tilted his head in puzzlement. What's the answer? God made them. Atain, you are like a god in some ways. However, you are not a god. You found out the genesis of the dragon demon race, and you went further back to research the origin of the demon race. Do you know how this world started? Ah, do you know the genesis of the humans and dragons? What about the orcs and the wolfenoids? Are you trying to find out the genesis of each race? I do not know. My research stopped at finding the origins of the demon race and hell. Any stories that predate the demon race is full of holes. They are mere theories, and I'll have to research those topics in the future. Then you can think of the genesis of the world in this way. Nobody has directly witnessed the existence of the gods, yet there aren't many people that deny the fact that the gods made this world. Maybe, the gods made hell and the demon race. At his words, Atain laughed. I'm sad to say that I cannot refute your words. Hell and the demon race are extremely illogical existences, yet our lives and this world is illogical too. Isn't that the reason why you created such a ridiculous plan? You despaired at the fact that the world was wrong from the start. You were right. It took me a very long time to come to this conclusion. However, it is very difficult to make someone else understand the process in which I came to such a decision. At the very least, it'll be impossible for me to make you understand in this place. I do not want you to make me understand. Hurry up, and tell me what you came here to say. I'll do so. You heard it from Balserk and Alberton, right? The occurrence of the dragon demons is increasing as hell and the world is starting to converge more and more. Atain found his answer when the population of humans increased and when he was in his death and rebirth cycle. After I created the dragon slayer's ritual, the territory of the humans continued to expand. The population increased alongside it. As a result, there was a sharp increase in the occurrence of the demons. It was to be expected, the critical problem occurred at this point. At some point, humans died. A portion of them became demons. However, the concept of death didn't exist amongst the demon race. It is more correct to say that it used to not exist. I'll expand on that later on. As you probably know, demons cannot be destroyed. If a summoned demon is defeated in this world, they are merely returned to hell. This was why Baldazark had sealed Balsirk. If Balsirk was banished to hell, someone else would be able to summon him again. History would repeat itself. When a dead human becomes a demon, their true essence is not in this world. It is within hell. However, Baldazark found out that a demon was capable of possessing a body if the contractor died. He used this fact to seal Balsirk. The body of the possessed being was turned into an undead. In the process, it tied the essence of the demon to this world. One had to go through this cumbersome process to imprison the soul. Even if this process was successful, it isn't as if it could completely kill the demon. The demon stole the body of a human, but it didn't matter if the body was alive or dead. It was just a means to an end that allowed us to maintain the demon's true form in this world. However, the demon was eventually sent back to hell when the body was destroyed. In some ways, the demons were the true immortals. This would continue to be true until Atain researched a way to kill the demons. I promised Balsirk that I'll find a way to destroy the demon race. I would find a way to kill him. The method he developed was the Great Darkness. He bound Balsirk to the Great Darkness, and he dissolved Balsirk into the flow of information and power within the Great Darkness. In truth, it isn't a true death. However, I can imprison the demons, and I can destroy their sense of self. The problem was the fact that it was a very inefficient solution. There were countless demons, and they were constantly being created. Just eliminating one of them took an incredible amount of time and effort. One had to trap a demon in a living body, then one had to make the living body into an undead. It was something only archmages could do. After achieving this state, 
one had to go through a very lengthy process of subordinate the demon into the great darkness. Finally, one was able to kill the demon. Azel realized something at that point. I see. That is why you need the extreme extinction. Correct. Extreme extinction is a violent method that will allow us to solve the problem of the demon race. In my long-term plan, I want to find another solution that doesn't rely on the extreme extinction. However, I need a solution right now to stop the immediate problem. The reason why you need me is. You probably have the right idea. It is the sky splitter. I know Carlos Rizesta created a technique that could replicate the extreme extinction, but it requires the sacrifice of a dragon demon weapon, which is an invaluable commodity. On the other hand, the sky splitter could create the extreme extinction without any sacrifice. At this point in time, Azel was the only being that could create the extreme extinction using normal means of magic. Moreover, Carlos had received Azel's full help in his research. This was the only reason why Carlos had been able to recreate the extreme extinction even if the sacrifice of the dragon demon weapon was needed. If Atain didn't receive similar cooperation from Azel, he had no idea how long it would take him to reach the same point in his research as Carlos. Azel furrowed his brow as he asked a question. So why are you trying to acquire a method that will allow you to destroy the demon race? That is at the heart of the story I'm going to tell you. Atain spoke. Azel, you probably heard this from Alberton. The number of first generation dragon demons are increasing as time passes. He said it was proof that the number of convergence between this world and hell is increasing. This phenomena will continue to accelerate. The number of demons are continuing to increase. This is an entirely different problem from humanity expanding and growing in numbers. The beings, who have no concept of death, will continue to accumulate. Do you recognize the problem now? I'm not sure what you are trying to say. Hell is reaching its saturation point. At his words, Azul's eyes widened. Atain continued to speak. This world and hell has an organic connection with each other. When the humans die, the dead humans become demons. The demons observe the world, and when the opportunity presents itself, they are able to travel to this world. Atain was able to come to the conclusion that the space of the world called hell increased as the number of demons increased. The space in hell differed from the surface area of this world, but it was the space that could be occupied by the residents of hell. The population of the demon race is increasing faster than the increase in space within hell. Whenever the number of demons exceeds the area within hell, the phenomena where hell overlaps with reality occurred. Atain was the first dragon demon, so Hell had already been dealing with this chronic problem by the time he was born. As the frequency of occurrence of the demons increases, the saturation in Hell will worsen. It'll accelerate the problem I mentioned earlier. The dragon demon war had ended 220 years when Atain was revived in this era. He knew the problem had exacerbated itself during that time. The plague called the Black Darkness made human civilization take a big step backwards, but it didn't stop the acceleration. In fact, the plague had caused an explosive growth in demon population. Hell had suffered under the explosive population growth. Of course, it doesn't guarantee that a dragon demon would form if this world and hell converges with each other. In most cases, nothing occurs. However, the rate of the dragon demons forming would overtake the population of the dragons. Every dragon on this world would become a dragon demon. In some ways, the dragons would be able to achieve their wish of gaining wisdom. With that, the dragons would become extinct. Chapter 240. Fate of the Races. Part 2. All the dragons of this world would become a dragon demon. In some ways, the dragons would be able to achieve their wish of gaining wisdom. With that, the dragons would become extinct. From the perspective of humans, the extinction of dragons would have an extremely positive effect. A race capable of threatening humanity would be gone. Humans would be able to proliferate more than ever before. However, there is a process that they'll have to go through before that could happen. It was the relationship between the humans and the dragon demons. The blood of the dragon demons was stronger than the humans. If a dragon demon and a human copulated, a dragon magian was born. If one wanted a human descendant once again, 
it would take several generations of the dragon mage in coupling with humans to produce a human descendant. Even if the dragon magen's blood had thinned out as much as possible, a coupling between the dragon magen and the dragon demon would be able to produce a dragon demon offspring. It is true that the dragon demon race is much smaller than the human race. Will that hold true in the future? From my perspective, I see the dragon demon race increasing in numbers at an incredible pace. The population of the first generation dragon demons up until now had been a speck compared to the number of humans. When the civilization of humans was at its infancy, the humans had desired the blood of the dragon demons. The humans born from a coupling with the dragon demons were stronger than regular humans at birth. If dragon magens were part of one's family, their mere presence improved the lives of the community. As civilization developed, such desires diminished. However, human nature still remains on both sides. As time passes, humans would become jealous of the longevity and superior abilities of the dragon demons. Was this really unnatural based on human nature? The dragon demons would start to consider humans to be lesser beings, and they would want to rule over the humans. Was this really unnatural based on human nature? Sadly, I learned that these two behaviors amongst the two races were quite natural. You learned it through the dragon demon war, which you started. Azul's eyes turned fierce. Atain was unperturbed as he let Azul's sharp killing intent flow past him. That's right. The problem arises when the number of dragon demons increases sharply within humanity. The dragon demon race will start to prey on humans, and a generational change would occur. Wouldn't this process be more tragic than the dragon demon war? If by some miracle, let us say the best case scenario was picked each time. Still, blood would flow. The amount of bloodshed will be so large that one wouldn't be able to compare it to the dragon demon war. Azel was struck dumb by Atine's words. From Azel's perspective, the dragon demon war had been an unimaginable calamity. It had been the worst. It didn't matter where one went. One couldn't avoid fighting, and each day seemed like the last day. One couldn't avoid thinking about death. Sanctuary hadn't existed. That was why everyone fought desperately for their lives. The amount of blood that'll flow would be so large that one wouldn't be able to compare it to the dragon demon war. The most frightening thing right now was. He's right. He agreed with Atine's prediction. He had seen countless humans during his lifetime. He knew what choices humans would make when they were placed in extreme situations. He knew it so well that he was fed up with it. That is why Azel knew it to be true. If what Atain said was true, a hell-like future would unfold. Atain continued to speak. In the worst-case scenario, both races might wipe out each other. However, I gave you reasons why I believe humans will disappear first in the long run. The dragons would become extinct first, then the humans would become extinct. Of course, a very long time will be needed for the humans to disappear from this world. At the earliest, it would take over a thousand years. Maybe, when the dragon demon race gains the absolute dominant position, they might make a human reservation. They might try to preserve some of the humans. It is similar to what Alberton is doing, but it would be a more arrogant method. If one considered the relationship between the two races, the demise of humanity was inevitable. After a long time, humans will disappear. The dragon magens, who were positioned between the dragon demons and humans, will disappear. When the dragon magens became extinct, the dragon demon race would be the only race left on this world. The humans and dragons are the parents of the dragon demon race. When they pass away, the dragon demons will have to fight the evil created by the parents. At that point, wouldn't the problem of the demon race have resolved by itself? They'll try their best to solve it, but I believe the problem will remain. Moreover, it would be much more severe. It couldn't be compared to what we are facing right now. The concept of death didn't exist amongst the demon race. There was only one way the number of demons could decrease. It was when a dragon and a demon combined to produce a dragon demon. The problem arose when the dragons were gone. What happens when dragon demons could no longer form? As the population of humans decrease, there would be a steep increase in the number of demons. When the generational change occurs, the strife created by it would explosively exacerbate the problem, 
the saturation problem of hell would not solve itself. It would worsen. After the dragons became extinct, the convergence between hell and this world would increase in frequency. Wherever human strife occurs, this phenomenon would be observed more and more. Do you realize how serious of a problem this will be when humans and demons meet in such circumstances? I'm not sure. Are you worried about another being like Balsirk showing up? Azel asked him a question. It really sounded like a serious problem. The demon could appear in this world without the need of black magicians summoning them. The demons would be able to entice the humans. However, if one went by the tone of Atine's words, Azel realized that the problem might be more serious than he could imagine. As if to confirm this, Atain let out a sigh. You aren't a magician. No, even if you were a magician, you need extensive research into the demon race. It is a problem that can only be seen by those that understand the demons. Atain checked the face of Laura, then he looked at the other magicians in Azel's party. It seemed even the high-ranked magicians couldn't see the problem that Atain had identified. Azel, you don't know everything about the demon race. You only know about the one rule that governs the demon race. It is limited to what happens when a demon is summoned to this world through magic. The one to create this summoning magic was Atain. He traveled all over the world to research his own origin. He collaborated and researched with his comrades at the time. He created a magic that was capable of summoning a demon. Azel clicked his tongue. At this rate, it might be faster to list what you haven't created first. No, I wasn't the first in a lot of things. The few that I was able to create first was just memorable. Atain let out a bright smile. The main function of the demon summoning magic was to put as much magical restriction on the demon as possible. A demon cannot lie. If the summoner doesn't want it, the demon cannot merge with the summoner. Even if a deal looks unfair, there's always a given and take. Only when the demon's goal was achieved, it could snatch away the body of the summoner. These conditions cannot be erased in the summoning magic. However, the demons would be able to appear through the blurred boundary between hell and the world. They would no longer be under such restrictions. If the demons were summoned through black magic, they were forced to follow the rules. As a price, they would be able to gain a sound body. If they cross over without the summoning magic, they won't be able to acquire a body without damaging it. On the other hand, they would be able to lie as much as they want. There would be no restrictions that would protect the residents of this world. Finally, Azel was able to understand the seriousness of the problem through Atine's words. The demons can take over humans at will. It isn't just the humans. The dragon demons wouldn't be able to avoid this problem. Each time a demon merges with a human, an unimaginable calamity will occur. If such occurrences continue to occur, the danger caused by it would be unimaginable. Even I am unable to predict what would happen. Atain didn't know everything about the demon race. He was merely someone that knew the most about the demons in this world. I viewed this as a problem that will lead to the extinction of civilization. The dragons will be gone. The humans will be gone. And even the dragon magin will disappear. The demons will even eat the dragon demons, who are their children. It'll all be consumed by the demons, who are spectres of the past. This was why Atain decided to erase evil from this world. He was trying to use an extreme method to moderate the generational change that would occur between the humans and the dragon demons. In doing so, he would be able to significantly slow down the rate of demon outbreaks in this world. The residents of this world would gain a grace period where they'll have the opportunity to come up with a solution to the demon race problem. That is the reasoning behind my choices. Everyone was at a loss for words when they heard Atain's confession. In the Dragon Demon War, Atain had insisted on creating an ideal world, and his reasoning right now was different from what he had revealed in the past. It was so large in scale that it was beyond comparison. It was plan hatched by one being, yet thousands of years of research went into it. He was working towards the ideal future. He was afraid of loneliness and it was his wish that humanity continued to exist in perpetuity. He was able to foresee the destruction of this world. The destruction was baked into the destiny of this world, and he made a plan to stop it. Hundred years. No, 
It'll happen in a thousand year. Azul's voice rang out. He suddenly broke the silence. That, it is such a story of epic proportions that even the passage of time looks comical next to it. However, it is an inevitable future that'll come to pass. Even several hundred years feels so far away. It is distant like the stars in the night sky. Yes, it was too big of a story. I want to say that something so far in the future shouldn't matter, but it is reality to you. Azel nodded his head as he spoke. Atain spoke when he saw this. I know it is hard for you to accept this story. I won't require an immediate answer from you. What? You can give me your answer in our next meeting. No. I'll be waiting to hear the reasoning behind your choice. I hope you can do me that favor, my fated foe. Wait a moment. Azel was taken aback so he reached out with his hand. However, Atain didn't wait for him. His figure dissolved into the darkness. For a long time, Azel drowned himself in the silence. Then he mumbled to himself in disbelief. That bastard. I'm willing to give him an answer, yet he just left before hearing it. He just said what he wanted to say. After Atain disappeared, the party released the seal to the tree god. They left the place after destroying the tree god. The members of the Guardian Shadows including Biorin and the Lakadi siblings looked troubled. Their expression indicated that they were feeling complicated emotions. Every one of them held deep-seated grudge against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. However, they hadn't mobilized only out of personal grudge. They felt a sense of duty to protect the world from the Dragon Demon King worshippers. That is why Atain's story was shocking to them. Biorin, who was an old dragon magian, looked tired from the fight. He asked a question. What do you think about all of this, Chiron? Do you mean a Tyne's story? What else would I be talking about? There are always overlords in this world that act with good intentions in mind. One didn't need to go far to see one. Atain had made a move in becoming an overlord during the Dragon Demon War. It was the same with Nadik, who formed the Nadik Empire. They tried to conquer the world, so the world would fit their ideals. In the process, a lot of blood was shed. Those types of beings always thinks their presence is essential to bring about such an ideal. The world is full of people that aren't living their life right, so an exalted being such as himself is needed to lead the masses. If not, the world would end. Atain is one of those people. Is it so strange to hear such a story from him? It isn't a problem that we can write off so simply. In my opinion, it is such a problem. Chiron shook his head from side to side. He might spout a plausible story, but it doesn't change what he did in the past. His plan is so large in scale that his theories cannot be proven. He overturned the world in order to prove his conjecture. He can package it all he likes, but at the heart of it, it doesn't change that there is an intrinsic madness within him. Moreover, there is something you should keep in mind. What is it? He is speaking of an extinction that'll occur after you are long dead. It'll probably happen when your great, great, great descendant dies. At that point in time, your existence would have disappeared from the records. Atain's plan covered a large span of time. The event that'll happen first was the extinction of the dragons. That'll happen long after the people of this era were all dead. Biorin spoke. However, it'll happen some day in the future. Should we ignore the problem? Because it won't happen in our era. Maybe so, but we still don't know for sure that such events will come to pass. Chiron. I'm not joking around, Biorin. It is the same for any person. We don't know when we'll die, but we do know that there will be an end. It will be the same for humanity. There will come a time when humanity comes to an end. Maybe, the world would be destroyed before that happens. However, is that our responsibility? Should we try to fix it by sacrificing our present and future? Him. If you carefully listen to Atain's words, it is filled with selfishness and self-righteousness. He became disappointed in the humans, dragon magians and the dragon demons. Therefore, he plans on denying our potential and possibility of others. He is talking about the events happening over the vast reaches of time, yet he determined that no one will be able to find the solution. Only I can do it. The poor people of this world are foolish and incompetent. I'm the only one that can save them. How arrogant of a thought is that? Of course, 
I agree that he has the qualifications to be so arrogant, but... Chiron snickered. It was truly unfortunate, but he couldn't deny the fact that Atane was a transcendent being even if he was mad. Each of his achievements was almost mythological. Still, he is a mad sage that loves no one, and he trusts no one. I do not want to ask such a being to save us. Atain already jumped to the conclusion that our descendants would be useless. I will do the opposite. I want to believe that our descendants won't all be fuck-ups. What if things don't turn out well for our descendants? What if they become extinct? That's their fate. People can only do their best in the era they are living in. Even if we do everything we can to help the future generation, we have to entrust those living in the future to make the right choices. At such times, Biorin stroked his beard as he burst out laughing. You sound young. We are the same age, yet you are overflowing with the spirit of youth. I am envious. I am in my prime. You should leave the dangerous task to the young ones like me. You should stay in the rear and act as a support. It is a tempting suggestion. I like it. The two snickered at each other's words. It was as if they were transported back to several dozen years ago. Chapter 241. Fate of the Races. Part 3. What are you thinking right now? A very soft voice could be heard from his side. Her voice woke Atain up from his reverie. Atain was sitting lotus style in front of an enormous magic circle. On the surface of the magic circle, the light was being tossed around like a wave. He turned his head to look. He caught sight of the shy face of Ain Sarah. She was pushing a trolley containing his dinner. While he was progressing with his ritual, Atain couldn't leave the magic circle for an extended amount of time. He wasn't working on the magic circle 24-7, but problems occurred intermittently. He had to fix errors, and he had to provide magical energy when the flow of magical energy thinned out. He had to continuously make adjustments. While he was doing this, Ain Sarah waited on him. If something needed to be done, she didn't order her maids. She did it herself. She was acting very differently from how she normally acted over the years. The servants didn't know what to make of this stark difference. Thanks to the numerous sacrifices the ritual was able to move on to the next step. At the very least, I can now sleep in my bed for a couple hours each day. Atain let out a bright smile as he spoke. He could feel it at this moment. The great darkness was being filled. The dragon demon worshippers, who promised to follow his cause, continued to die. Their deaths were fattening up the great darkness. The spectres of intelligent beings were the essence that made up the great darkness. I lost the infinite beast and the tree god, but he had lost two pillars, and it was a very big loss. In losing him, he was no longer able to use their abilities. He would have to make up for the loss with his own magic. Time and effort had to be diverted to bridge this gap. However, the great darkness was stronger than ever, despite losing the two pillars. Unfortunately, this boost in power was temporary. In the long term, the loss of the pillars was larger than the gain achieved through the deaths of the dragon demon king worshippers. Still, it was enough power to stop the threat from his enemies. He would be able to finish his ritual. Suddenly, Atain spoke. Another one of my friends have left my side. You are talking about General Almeric. That's right. His fate didn't allow him to achieve his earnest wish. Beings that occupied the same time frame as him were dying one by one. Ornsaurus, Baldazark and even Almeric. Each death hurt Atain. The life of a human being was akin to a firefly in front of his eyes. They let out a bright light before they disappeared. It was exceedingly fleeting. This was why the existence of the dragon demon generals was precious to him. Atain was able to see the world only in the macroscopic view. That was why there weren't many beings that could occupy the same time period as him for an extended amount of time. If I kill Ragus with my own hands, there will be no one left. You have me. Ain Sarah embraced Atain. I will be with you until the end. Thank you. Atain smiled as he spoke. His eyes couldn't see Ain Sarah. His eyes were empty. She truly was a lovely mate. She was a precious partner that shared his cause. However, she could not exist in the same time frame as him. In comparison to the years he had to live, her life was fleeting. He was true to the love being felt in the present. 
However, he couldn't help but imagine the future where this love would erode away. This was the pain that Attain would have to bear. If you treat the world with hate, you have to be ready to be hated by the world. Suddenly, Attain mumbled the resolve that he had recited to himself during the Dragon Demon War. In truth, Attain hadn't come up with those words. In the distant past, a human had told him those words. From Attain's perspective, the youth had lived for a very short amount of time. He could no longer remember the name or the face of this youth. However, when he closed his eyes, he could recall the conversation. He could do it at will. Do you hate the world, magician Nim? You don't hate it. I'll be lying if I said I didn't hate it. It is a messed up world. Why do you live like this then? He was a youth that was born with nothing. He was born to a poor family, and he had lost his parents at a young age. He had lived an arduous life, and he got sick before he could achieve anything. In the end, he died before he could recover from the illness. Until the moment of his death, the youth lived to help the young homeless children of the streets. Attain had disguised himself as a human magician during his travels. In some small city, he had rescued a youth protecting a young girl, who had been selling her body in the back streets. The youth was being beaten as a price for helping the young girl. Attain had rescued the young man, and they had become friends. This was why Attain decided to stay near this city for a couple months. It was also the reason why Attain was able to hear the last will of the dying youth. If you treat the world with hate, you have to be ready to be hated by the world. Aren't you already hated by this world? I suppose so. Despite being hated, I cannot bring myself to hate the world. I refuse to hate the world even if the world hates me. If I do this, I know there will be people that'll love me. It was as the youth had said. There were a lot of people, who loved this youth. He didn't have any parents or relatives. When his body became so weak that he couldn't stand up, people willingly searched him out. They came to take care of him. When Attain held a funeral service for the young man, a great number of people had attended the funeral, and they had cried for him. The youth's last will was simple. I worked myself to death, yet the only thing I have is my house. Please use this house to help the children I fed. Basically, he wanted to give his home to the homeless street urchins. The life of this young youth was an example of ridiculous amount of selflessness and sacrifice. He hadn't been a philosopher or a magician. He was a poor youth that had a hard time making ends meet every day. This was why he had left behind a deep impression within Atine's mind. After countless years had passed, he still remembered the youth. Magician Nim, you are handsome, so you should laugh more. Women will line up for you. They'll love you. Even if I don't do that, there are many women that want me. Wow, you are so full of yourself. Well, I guess I can see it since you are a mage. Magician Nim, what is it? I don't know the source of your hatred, but you should hate in moderation. You should try to live without doing so. What if I said I'm incapable of feeling hate? How could you be considered to be a person if that is possible? For some reason, I know that magician Nim is different from other people. You really seem like someone that is capable of hating the world, despite the whole world hating you back. That is why you should reign in your hate. Magician Nim is a good person. After the youth died, Attain left the small city. He revisited the city after a couple of years, but the young man's home was no longer there. A criminal organization that ruled over that part of the city had started selling drugs to the residents. After making the residents addicted to the drug, the residents were chased out of the district. The crime organization made an entertainment district in place of the residential area. Some left in disgust and others were chased out with no place to go. Many people became ruined by the drugs, and they died in the streets. Attain checked up on the children that the young man had taken under his wing. He also looked for the young girl, who the youth had saved in their first meeting. She had been the last act of kindness carried out by the young man. Every one of them had become hooked on drugs, and they had been worked to death like slaves. In the end, they became ruined or they died. When Attain confirmed this truth, he killed all the members of the criminal organization that had been involved in their deaths. Then he killed all the men of influence that pulled the strings from behind the scenes. 
He knew it wouldn't change anything. But he couldn't help it. He killed them all. I can take on the hate of the entire world. If humanity can gain their future as a price. He couldn't remember the face or the name of the youth. He recalled the youth's words as he mumbled to himself. It'll be well worth it. In the middle of his torment, he reaffirmed his resolve. For some reason, his smile looked sad. The death of Almeric was an event worthy of a celebration to the members of the Guardian Shadows. However, they didn't pause in their work. They knew that they were given a finite time. Kealia spoke. The great darkness is getting stronger. The destruction of two pillars had been a huge loss. It was apt to say that the great darkness had lost significant portion of its function. However, this loss was being made up by the deaths of the dragon demon king worshippers. In terms of strength, Atain was becoming stronger. He was at the peak of his power. My power is getting stronger. Her essence was within the great darkness, so she could feel her power grow continuously. You can also observe it through the guardian shadows. You are right. They are capable of pulling this off now. Leticia nodded her head. It was as Kealia had said. The guardian shadows had gotten stronger too. Each spectre's ability was clearly becoming stronger. This increased ability allowed the user of the staff to manifest oneself through the spectre. It was a new supplemental power. They had discussed this new new phenomena with Kealia. This ability might be based on the changes Atain made. It is to help him manifest his clones through the darkness incarnate. It functions akin to Azul's Dawn's Defender. Leticia spoke in astonishment as she looked at the spectres that had taken on the form of herself. Each of the spectres was wielding a spear. Of course, their battle capability couldn't be compared to Leticia. At most, the spectres of the Guardian Shadow could use this new ability to copy Leticia's appearance and style. Still, this was enough. It was quite useful in many ways. She was quickly learning how to control the multiple Guardian Shadows thanks to Azel. It was similar in technique to his cloning technique. While she researched on how to make better use of this ability, she became deeply occupied in finishing her secret technique. Azel spoke. At this point, I think you can use it in a real battle. You want me to use the technique at this degree of completion? Leticia was cultivating a secret technique learned from Azel. She had been instructed on it from before, but it was such a high-level technique that she was only able to learn it recently. This was the first time Azel had said her technique was good enough to use in battle. Azel nodded his head. The most important part is your confidence and trust in your technique. You have to be confident that you'll be able to succeed in using the technique in any situation. We were going at each other, and you were able to succeed in using it in all ten attempts. That means you are ready to use it in a real battle. I don't think this is enough. Leticia still didn't look confident in herself. Azel cut her off. If two combatants are fighting equipped with long sword and armor, there comes a moment in a fight where a dagger might be useful. The degree of completion of your technique might look poor to you, but it can be used in a live battle. Hmm. Every technique doesn't have to be a killer technique. Each skill has its own role. You know this to be true. You are right. Leticia smirked. When she heard Azel's words, she realized that she had unnecessarily set her expectations too high. Her expectation was so high that she had missed the big picture. Suddenly, she asked a question. If I get into a fight with Rishu, will I be able to win against him? I do not know the level of Rishu's power. It isn't as if we are devoid of any information about him. There is the information we heard from Kealia. Azul's party learned about what had happened in the fight between Regus and Rishu. It was an extremely important piece of information. He would be too much for you. Even if you are being supported by Laura and Chiron, I think you might need one or two more of our members if you want to face Rishu. As expected, Leticia let out a cold smile at his honest answer. It is a good thing I asked you that question. If I asked Chiron, he would have tried to spare my feelings with his answer. I wouldn't have received a proper answer. Unexpectedly, the Duke is soft in some ways. He is like that even when he is harsh on himself. Azel smirked. As he looked at Leticia, he had a thought. I'm lucky. 220 years had passed, yet he still had good comrades by his side. It was the same during his era. 
He was surrounded by good people. It wasn't just the comrades that were alive right now. Carlos had endured personal hell to give Azel hope in the future. Then there were his descendants, who had given up their lives as humans. They had taken up the duty of finding someone that they could entrust the future. These were relationships that he would never forget. It was the same for the comrades that were currently next to him. If he hadn't met them, he wouldn't be alive right now. That is why I'll give you my answer as many times as you want, Atain. The traces of all these people were etched into his soul. That was why he wouldn't hesitate to answer Atain's enormous question. Moreover, that time wasn't too far off. Atain would hear his answer. Chapter 242. Fate of the Races. Part 4. The campfire was placed away from the stream, yet the sound of clatter could be heard. It was the sound of two people washing dishes. If I think about it, Arietta possessed an exalted background. She wasn't suited for such work as washing dishes, yet she was doing it. She spoke. In the past, I felt something similar. When Laura was washing the metal bowl as she tilted her head in puzzlement, she was using her magic to scrub away stubborn spots that she could easily wipe away with water. She had reached a point where she was adept at washing the dishes. It was my first live battle. It was as if the world had been flipped on its head by the power of fate. Arietta had a coming-of-age ceremony on her 15th birthday, and she had to step onto the battlefield as the dragon demon princess. It was her first mission, so the mission wasn't that dangerous. In truth, not a single hair on her had been damaged. Despite this fact, there had been a lot of deaths. They had killed many monsters, and the soldiers under her command had died in the expedition. Chiron had been strict in teaching her, yet she was traumatized by the deaths. The shock was beyond imagination. It had driven her into a spiral of confusion. I knew I couldn't live like how I lived the day before. I thought everything would change in the future. However, her prediction hadn't come to pass. I still talked with people that had nothing to with the battle. I slept when I got tired. I ate when I got hungry. It is obviously something a living body requires, yet at the time, I thought that was out of the ordinary. I expected things to be different. Her first battle had been that traumatic of an experience for Arietta. This was why she thought her whole would change, yet nothing had changed. When she realized this truth, she found it all to be a bit too weird. Arietta wiped away the remaining water from the dishes as she spoke. I'm feeling a similar feeling right now. We are facing a man that lived the life of a god, and he has a grand plan that would change the fate of the world. The fate of humanity is on the line, but we are washing dishes right now. This stuff accumulates. Him, Arietta became puzzled at Laura's sudden words. Laura continued to speak. Atain speaks in a cosmic scale, but in the end, events accumulates. Are you comparing his endeavors to washing dishes? Sleeping, washing, meeting other people and fighting. Hundreds, thousands, millions and billions of these events accumulate. Then we reach a point of grandeur spoken of by Atain. I see, you can think of it that way. If such trivial tasks do not exist, the grand plan has no meaning. Arietta looked impressed as she nodded her head. Laura asked a question. What do you think about it, Arietta? Are you talking about a Tyne's story? Laura nodded her head. Arietta thought on it for a moment before she gave her answer. I've always felt this before. From one to ten, that man looks at events in too large of a scale. Him, we criticized Atain for thoughtlessly messing with the underbelly of the world thinking he was doing it in the present. In truth, he was speaking in a scale that encompassed human history and civilization. Isn't it quite ridiculous? If one made a mistake, one should reflect upon one's actions. One should apologize, and one should think about making up for that mistake. A normal person would think like that. That thought process is missing from that man, and he is unapologetic about it. His view is so macroscopic that it is hard to tell where his thought process had run awry. Arietta shook her head from side to side. He is trying to make the entire world fit around him. He doesn't put any importance to the standards that had been developed in this world. You can see it in how he talks about the dragon demon war. I'll sum up his words. He made a mistake, but he wasn't in the wrong. Still, 
he would take responsibility for his mistake. He would do this by making another big mess in some other way. Laura blinked her eyes. Arietta wasn't wrong, but Laura wondered if it was okay to summarize Atine's words like that. Arietta snorted. I cannot trust someone like that. He isn't family. He isn't from my kingdom. He speaks as if he is loves, humanity, and that we should support his cause. I am not that open-minded. In order to secure the future of humanity, he is planning on stepping on the throats of the people of the Rulin Kingdom. I cannot allow that. Arietta, you. Laura just blinked her eyes, and she spoke as if she was impressed. You have a lot that you consider to be precious. Him, what do you mean? I just, I just want to reach the end of this fight, and I want to see what's beyond it. It didn't matter what happened. Arietta had things that were precious to her. This was why her will to fight Atane wouldn't falter, since she had to protect what was precious to her. Laura didn't have any of that. Of course, there was something that was precious to Laura. You all. She treasured Azelle and her comrades. However, Laura wasn't fighting Atane for them. This was why she was envious of Arietta. However, she heard something unexpected when Arietta opened her mouth. I am envious of you, Laura. What? Laura's eyes turned round. Arietta let out a gentle laughter as she spoke. When this fight end, you will be free to do what you want. I am jealous of that freedom. The end of this fight would basically be an end to the curse. Afterwards, you can go wherever you want. You can be with whoever you want. Arietta, you. When she saw Arietta's smile, Laura realized one fact. Laura knew why Arietta was truly envious of her. However, she knew it wasn't a good idea to voice such thoughts out loud. Laura was taken aback at emotions that she was unfamiliar with. Arietta picked up the washed dishes. She laughed heartily as she stood up. After washing the dishes, it is time to pass the night in the open air. I feel a bit sad when I think about the fact that such days like this will come to an end soon. Yes. Laura nodded her head as she swallowed the words that was hovering around inside her mouth. Chiron spoke. Since we've defeated Almeric, Atane doesn't have many cards left. The problem remains. As we destroy his cards, his personal power becomes stronger. The loss of the pillars causes a problem in the long term. But he is sacrificing his underlings to strengthen the great darkness. As of now, they had destroyed five pillars. Creator of Dragon Weapon Ixeru. King of the Dead Belrun. Steel King. Infinite Beast. Tree God. There are seven pillars left. Azel replied to Chiron's mumbled words. If it is as Kaalia had predicted, it doesn't matter how much resources is put into the Great Darkness. If the Great Darkness loses half of its pillars, its foundation will start to shake. Basically, we have to destroy one more pillar. However, the problem remains in that we don't know how much time we have left. Atane was carrying out his ritual. Kaalia had an inkling as to what was going on, but she didn't have any specifics. She could only guess. In her opinion, Atane must have finished the first step of his ritual by now. He probably moved on to the next step. If he finishes the ritual, it'll be the end. Before her rights were restricted, Kaalia had found out that Atine's ritual had a total of four steps. When he finishes the four steps, it'll be irreversible. Azel was sure of it. Atane would use a massive system called the Great Darkness to manifest a miraculous magic. The spell would scar the world. As Atane had done several times before, he would change the balance of the world. Even if Atane was defeated at this time, it would be a loss. The probability of our victory is uncertain. Chiron made a decision after he thought hard on it. We have to put it all on the line. Finally, the date with destiny was at hand. The forest was underneath the night sky, and the ghost-like figure of Kaalia was floating in the air. She suddenly raised her hand, and she placed her hand over the luminescent moon. She was seeing it with her eyes, but it didn't feel real. The light from the moon went through her hand. At such moments, it brought home the fact that she wasn't really alive. This wasn't her world. Her world was within the great darkness, and the great darkness held only those that were gone from this world. Still, there was a reason why she couldn't leave this world. She only had one reason. Kaalia, is the meeting done? Kaalia asked the question in a welcoming manner when she heard Azel call out her name. 
Azel spoke as he sat on a nearby boulder. Yes. Please let me know what I have to do. You have to travel with this for now. I see. Kealia didn't ask for more details. Kealia and Atane could see into each other, so she was a risk. This was why the party didn't tell her anything important. Azel's party was fighting for their lives, so she did feel left out. However, she didn't care. The fact that Azel trusted her was enough for her. The fact that she would be able to fight the end battle with him was enough for her. I want to ask you one thing. What is it? She was like a fish swimming in water. She flew through the air, and she brought her face right in front of Azel's face. If she still breathed, they would be able to feel each other's breath. However, they could only look at each other. She couldn't feel anything. She had no breath nor body temperature. At such a moment, I really resent the fact that I'm dead. At the very least, I would be able to kiss you if I was alive. Would it be inappropriate to say that I'm sorry you can't do it? Don't say that. Kalia burst out laughing as she circled around him. She was being illuminated by the moonlight, so there was a white halo behind her. She looked like a forest fairy. She suddenly looked up at the sky as she asked a question. What are you curious about? You. Azel hesitated for a brief moment. He was careful in his choice of words. After she joined up with him, he had always had this question. He couldn't be callous in how he asked this question, so he had buried it until now. Still, he felt like he had to ask this question right now. Why did you choose to die? Didn't I tell you my reasons? I'm not talking about the past. I'm talking about this era. Azel spoke in a heavy tone when he saw her eyes turn round. Soon, Kealia let out a timid laughter. She looked like a cute girl. You know about it. I guess it isn't a secret that is hard to figure out. I should have expected it. Kealia clasped her hands behind her back, and she acted as if she was kicking a rock with her foot. Of course, her foot couldn't interact with her surroundings, so her foot passed through the rock. Silence continued to hang between them. Azel waited for her to talk. Finally, Kealia let out a sigh as she opened her mouth. I'm already dead, so it isn't right to characterize it as me choosing death. I didn't ask the question, because I want to hear you make plays on your words. I didn't plan on doing that. Him. I just want to make it clear that it isn't what Azel Opa thinks it is. Kealia wasn't part of this world. Her world was the Great Darkness. This was why her existence would end when the Great Darkness was destroyed. If they wanted to stop Atine's plan, they had to destroy the Great Darkness. It was a must. When the King of Death, Belrun was killed, the ability to deny death was gone. However, it wasn't a guarantee that Atain would be able to overcome this problem with magic. In the end, Atine's plan would only end when the Great Darkness was destroyed. Regus Opa and I are in the same boat. For Kealia and Regus, the act of destroying the Great Darkness was an act similar to suicide. They were putting their lives on the line for this fight, yet their reward would be their death. How ridiculous was that? The people in our world are already dead. We just want to greet the end of our lives doing the right thing. In the past, she had let her hate and despair choose her path for her. However, she was always suffering as she walked down that path. At the end, she died with regret and doubt in her heart. This time she didn't want to repeat her past mistakes. When she died, she was able to escape the torturous emotions that had taken hold of her heart. She was able to see into her heart, and she was able to make a decision. Until the end, she would walk down a road that wouldn't make her regret. Kealia, I feel it every moment. I no longer belong to this world. My world is like a dream. It is merely a shadow of this world. It was like watching the outside world through a window for Kealia. She could only intervene using magic. She couldn't touch or feel anything in the other world. I realized that my old relationships are my only ties to this world. It was too cruel to ask of her to find meaning through the people of this era. The past was her only connection, and the people from her past was the only thing tying her to this world. I didn't choose death. Azel Opa. Kealia let out a bright smile. Not a single ounce of regret was within her smile. I want to complete my life that I was unable to finish. Azel was at a loss for words when he was faced with her smile. 
he could only show his respect towards her. They could no longer give more time to Atene. That is why they had to end this even though their victory wasn't guaranteed. They had to hit the dragon demon castle hard, and they had to take down Atene in one fell swoop. The killing of Atene wasn't the highest priority. It was to destroy the ritual that was being carried out. If one considered the fact that the dragon demon castle was the headquarters of their enemy, they would be able to celebrate even if the destruction of the ritual was the only thing they achieved. If that happens, the fight will change into a battle of attrition. If Atene was still alive and the dragon demon king worshippers were intact, the war wouldn't end just by stopping the ritual. Atene would once again make preparations to make another ritual, and the dragon demon king worshippers would launch a fierce counterattack. Until now, they wanted to fight their battles away from the eyes of the world. We were able to dictate where the fight would happen. What would happen if they gave up on defending the road of emptiness? From the beginning, they had decided to avoid attention from the broader world. They wanted to cause chaos from behind the curtain. The chaos, which had been caused by them, hadn't subsided yet. What if the elites of the plane of darkness no longer cared about staying hidden? What would happen if they started attacking all of society? The ones that had wanted to fight a stealth war would run full tilt into the fight. Most of the members of the Guardian Shadows were highly influential people in human society, and they might have to pull themselves out from the front line. They had other duties they had to fulfill. It will happen eventually. We are pushing them into a corner, and there is a high probability that they'll go all out. At that time, their power would be weakened. However, it'll be hard to take care of consequences that happens afterwards. In the end, the best plan is to kill Atene in this fight. At Leticia's words, Chiron nodded his head. However, it won't be easy. Still, the other members of the Guardian Shadows will attack the waypoints to draw their attention away. We also formed an elite force that'll accompany us to the Plane of Darkness. We are still gathering some supplies, so at the very latest, we'll carry this out within four days. Excuse me. At that moment, Kealia suddenly poked her head into the meeting. This was the first time she had interrupted a meeting, so the party members looked at each other in puzzlement. Kealia hesitated before she opened her mouth. There is something I must inform you. What's going on? Regus Opa said he'll destroy a pillar. He already left. What? Chiron got up in surprise. He had made intricate plans in his head. At that moment, the sound of his plans being obliterated could be heard within his head. Chapter 243. Darkness Incarnate. Part 1. The elite troops of the Plane of Darkness were dispatched to the Pillars of the Great Darkness. The largest number of troops were dispatched to the Bear's Kingdom, and it was where the God of Rest was sealed. Since the nearby waypoints were all destroyed, no further reinforcements could be sent in. Four days had passed after Chiron had contacted Ragus to wait a little bit. Chiron had asked for time. He needed time to complete his plan. However, this didn't mean Ragus had commenced his attack on a whim. He had his own reason for doing this. It is a reason that makes sense only in his mind. That's the problem. Kieran felt a migraine coming on, so he furrowed his brows. I'm here, you bastards. You better be on your toes. Fight me. Ragus sauntered out of the forest as he revealed himself. He was bold as he announced his presence. Wasn't he just giving his enemies time to set up the defense? Kieran let out a sigh. Somehow, I now know what my ancestors felt when working with him. It was the same as last time. There were only three of them, yet they were going up against several hundred foes. Moreover, they were going up against elite's troops placed behind a location hardened for defense. This was also why Ragus didn't bother with an ambush. It would be almost impossible to ambush such a place. He boldly revealed his presence as if he was visiting his friend's house. He would charge in when his enemies had enough time to bring up all their defense. If only he wasn't the legendary dragon demon general. Kieran firmly massaged his temple with his fingers. When he was carrying out a mission for the plane of darkness, he would have executed any ally that would act like that. He wouldn't have hesitated. However, his ally was the dragon demon general Ragus. He was called referred to as the hammer that swallows up the scream of the land. 
he couldn't be controlled with words or strength. Basically, one just had to follow his lead. Nothing else could be done. Regus was sauntering forward when an explosion detonated beneath his feet. The hidden magic circles detonated all at the same time. Regus was assaulted with thunderbolts, flames and light-based attacks. Oh ho! It seems they knew I was coming. Regus had wanted his opponents to finish making all their preparations for battle. He hadn't expected them to have already finished making their preparations. This was why Regus was taken unawares by the ambush. The Dragon Demon King worshippers had acted as if they were disorganized. They made it appear as if they had been surprised by Regus's appearance. However, they had been prepared for this possibility. They had been thorough in their preparations for Regus. Regus had fallen into a trap, and the magicians focused their bombardment on Regus. It was such a swift attack that Regus didn't even have the opportunity to swing his soul hammer. You bastards. You really have an insight into my personality. You guys are pretty good. It feels awkward telling you this, but, in the midst of the enemy, an old dragon magian with grey horns appeared. He had a cold expression on his face. He was chains. During the Dragon Demon War, he had been an officer under the command of Regus. The sound of huge explosions were detonating around them, so they couldn't carry out a normal conversation. Chains used his dragon arts to deliver his voice to Regus. His body had weakened, and he had retired as a warrior. However, he was quite advanced in how he handled his magical energy. Your personality is the easiest in this world to discern, General. How can you actually say that out loud? I cannot refute that point. Still, I was called a ball of charisma in the past. I was told that I'm unpredictable. No one said that about you. In your mind, the probability of fighting General Rishu was the highest in this location. However, you were able to hold yourself back for quite a while. I was able to put up the best possible defense thanks to your patience. I don't know how I should feel about that. Chains shook his head from side to side. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Chains understood Regus's personality better than anyone in this era. When he heard the details of what had happened during the extermination of the Infinite Beast, Chains determined that the probability of Regus coming to this location next was very high. I would have been disappointed if you went to a different location or if you were able to be patient until the end. This is more like you. General Regus, you've become a bit arrogant now that you have some wrinkles on your face. I have one question for you, Chains. Regus resisted against the storm of magic spells as he asked the question. At the same time, Chains furrowed his brow as he raised his hand. A translucent beam of light pierced through the storm of spells as it hit Regus. Regus had released the power of his soul hammer. Within the big cloud of dust, Regus was getting ready to unleash a terrifying attack. Is your life fun now? It was what Chains had said when Regus was revived as an undead. He said his life wasn't fun, and if he was with Regus, he would have the chance to go out hard even with his old body. Chains had a twisted smile on his face as he spoke. I'll make an honest confession. I thought hard on it. He wondered if he should follow Regus and oppose Atain. Or maybe he should he follow Atain to go against Regus. Other members of the Plane of Darkness didn't even bother with such a dilemma. Atain was like a god to them. However, it was different for Chains. Regus was a bigger presence in his life than Atain. When I thought about it, I realized that I wanted to try it once. What do you mean? I'm as old as I can be, and I have lost my strength. I've been passing the time as I schemed from the back, but I always wanted to fight you. I want to fight the person that's forever my hero. Oh ho, you are still a man. I haven't been one until recently. However, my heart started beating faster when I made the decision. Is my life fun? Yes, it is fun. It became fun at this moment. I see. Congratulation. Regus let out a heroic laughter as he brought down his soul hammer. The earthquake generated by the attack spread outwards in a conical shape. The attack swallowed up several hundred meters of ground. However, magic circles had been prepared for this scenario. The magic circles activated, and it killed most of the power of the attack. At the same time, Regus's magical energy started being drained away. 
The magic circles were targeting him, and his magical energy was being forcefully suppressed and absorbed by them. That wasn't all. A thousand elite troops had positioned themselves to protect this location, and the magic circles were boosting their attack power. Regus had a sense of deja vu. This is. Do you remember this? Chain's hair whipped around in a wild manner. He hadn't unsheathed his sword, but he didn't back off. There were several hundred meters of space between Regus and him, yet Chains knew he couldn't put his guard down. It is the tactic that got you killed. During the Dragon Demon War, the human allied forces had prepared this trap to kill Regus. Chains had recreated that trap, and he had strengthened it. He was able to strengthen it, because Regus had moved slower than he had expected. I like it. Will you answer me this one question? Him. Unfortunately, General Rishu isn't here. Shit. This place was a dud. He had been driven into a corner, yet Regus's question didn't fit the situation at all. However, Chains immediately recognized what Rayugs was trying to ask. He took it as par for the course with Regus. Chains' underlings listened on in bafflement. Suddenly, Chains mumbled to himself. They are here. From where Regus had come from, a darkness started to surge forward like wildfire. Niberus and Kiran Baldazark, the two young dragon demon had been high-ranked officers in the Plane of Darkness not too long ago. Of course, Chains hadn't forgotten about them. Regus had been pinned down by the magic circle, and 500 of his troops kept up their attack on Regus. However, Chains had dispatched a troop of hundred to stop the two young dragon demons. Since the king took General Rishu, he sent enough troops to make up for that loss. I admit these brats are skilled, but will they be able to turn the tide of the battle? I won't give you the chance to use the extreme extinction. Chains fully acknowledged the threat posed by Niberus and Kiran. However, this battle was completely different from the battle where the infinite beast had perished. Chains had a detached force that'll take care of Niberus and Kiran. Moreover, he had analyzed the power of these two, so he had come up with a plan that'll take them down. Moreover, there were skilled undeads on his side. These were beings that had participated in the Dragon Demon War. The only thing left is to stop the general from completing his transformation. They had to stop Regus's transformation. If he transformed into a state where he could use his Dragon Demon magic, their preparations would not be enough. However, everything had proceeded as Chains had planned. The magic circles were suppressing and absorbing Regus's power. He wouldn't be able to transform. If he wanted to transform, he had to go through the process of raising his magical energy to the extreme. This piece of information had been verified several times. I'll finish you here. Was it because he was trying to end Regus, who he admired? There was a bitterness to the words mumbled by Chains. Him. Suddenly, Chains' expression turned rigid. Since magicians were dispatched in the surrounding, they were using a communication spell that allows Chains to get an up-to-date information. He was able to give orders after assessing the information. However, an unexpected variable had made an appearance. Why? The detached force had surrounded Niberus and Kieran, but they were starting to be killed in ones and twos. A powerful magician, who was twice as strong as him, had made an appearance. When Chains saw who it was, he yelled out in shock. Why are you here, Prince Sibane? He was a middle-aged dragon demon with a beard. He had his long black hair tied backwards. He was destroying the dragon demon king worshippers with his overwhelming power. When Sibane was accepted as a resident of the Alberton Forest, he made a pact that he wouldn't interfere with the outside world. Even if it was his daughter, the pact wouldn't allow him to do anything. This was why Sibane made another deal in order to break that pact. When Alberton accepted the deal, Sibane was released from the pact. He searched out his daughter, so he could fight by her side. This was also the main reason why Regus had mobilized. A powerful ally had joined his side. He no longer needed to wait. He brutishly charged towards a pillar in order to destroy it. Sir Regus, you never change. Sibon let out a bitter laughter. A pitch black dragon was coiled around his entire body. Regus was unchanging. When Sibane saw him, he was reminded of the days before his despair. 
It felt as his old self was being revived. It was a time when he fought the world with genuine fervor. Your Highness, you weren't dead. There was some amongst the detached force that recognized Sibane. They expressed their shock. Sibane let out a bitter laughter. If possible, I didn't want to overturn that belief. In truth, he had run away to the Alberton forest after he fell into despair. If he had kept to his original plan, he would have lived in the Alberton forest until his death. However, his precious daughter moved him when she displayed a cold and firm resolve. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were confused only for a brief moment. They quickly made a decision. I don't know what is going on, but we cannot forgive you if you've joined the enemy. Sibane had ambushed them from outside of their encircling net. This was why he was able to kill the members of the detached force one after another. However, there were ways to counter him now that they became aware of his presence. Chapter 244. Darkness Incarnate. Part 2. Sibane had ambushed them from outside of their encircling net. This was why he was able to kill the members of the detached force one after another. However, there were ways to counter him now that they became aware of his presence. It might have been possible if you were your past self. However, you've lost your book of darkness. You are merely an outstanding magician now. Before Sibane went missing, it was true that Sibane had been the strongest magician within the plane of darkness. He was the son of Atane, and he possessed overwhelming amount of dragon demon magic. In terms of magic, he had been close to reaching the zenith. However, Sibane no longer had his dragon demon weapon. This difference of having it and not having it was stark. The present dragon demon king worshippers were the elite troops of the plane of darkness. Several of them possessed dragon demon weapons, so they would be able to go up against Sibane without much problem. At the very least, that was what they had believed. A terrifying sound rang out. Two warriors and two magicians had surrounded Sibane. They attacked from all four directions with exquisite timing. One of them was able to pierce through Sibane's defensive magic, and he was about to attack Sibane's body. However, the result was completely different than they had expected. What is that? The magicians were taken aback. One warrior had attacked from the front. He couldn't break through the barrier magic, so he was bounced off. The warrior in the rear was able to break through, but he was suddenly caught in the air. The warrior was caught in the jaws of the dragon made out of pitch black darkness. All his bones were crushed by the dragon. It was a grisly sight. It is true. Sibane had a cold expression on his face as he spoke. That I no longer have my dragon demon weapon. Dragon demon energy erupted out of him like a tsunami. In terms of dragon demon magic, he easily had more than Nibiris when she was using the Book of Darkness. When he activated his dragon soul, he had power that exceeded even the dragon demon generals. This was all possible because the dragon souls had a special attribute. The owners of dragon weapons maintained their power separately from their weapon. It was merely a tool that allow him to store their dragon demon magic over time. They were like a container. On the other hand, the dragon soul was an extension of their owner. They arose from within the owner's energy pulse. Its function deteriorated when the owner's status deteriorated. In return, one gained the benefit of one's energy pulse being expanded to twice its size when the dragon soul was deployed. If one only looked at the ability to boost the output of dragon demon magic, the dragon soul was superior compared to the dragon demon weapon. This was why Chiron was able to fight on equal ground with Almeric in the past. He had been able to pull up his output of dragon demon magic. The warrior let out a blood-curdling scream as he was eaten alive by the Dragon of Darkness. The Dragon Demon worshippers froze when they saw this. They were used to seeing gruesome deaths, but they just witnessed their comrade being eaten alive. Of course, they were shocked by it. At that moment, something black hit them. The magicians screamed. A cursed sword made out of darkness had planted itself on top of their barrier. It was Sibane's specialty spell called the Dancing Macon. Just a single blow from sword had almost broken the barrier, yet countless swords had appeared afterwards. They flew faster than the speed of sound as they assaulted the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Sibane continued to use new spells as explosions rang out. Fire, 
thunder and the power of curses detonated against his enemies. While he was putting pressure on his enemies, the darkness started to encroach over them like a wave. Shit. Block it. He steadily deployed spells to put a groundwork for a large-scale magic. When his enemies realized this, they became desperate. A dragon mage and warrior was about to turn around when a sharp blade of darkness pierced through his body. The dragon mage and warrior looked behind him in disbelief. He looked into Nibiru's cold eyes. You dare ignore us. If the detached force had been faithful to the plan, they would have been able to kill both Kieran and Nibiru's. However, Saibane's appearance had created chaos, and a crack had opened up in their encircling net. Some decided to attack Saibane. They were basically begging Nibiru's and Kieran to attack them. Saibane continued to kill his enemies without being pressured. He didn't go out of his way to kill or maim his enemies. His sole purpose was to sow as much chaos using his high-speed dancing makens. He kept using a combination of minor spells to push his enemies backwards. As he was doing this, he was steadily creating his great magic spell. The Dragon Demon King worshippers couldn't overcome their nervousness, so they pushed as one towards him. At that moment, he activated the fatal traps that he had placed in between using his minor spells. He started killing them in droves. However, his enemies were the elites of the Plane of Darkness. They knew how dangerous a high-ranked magician could be. They used their comrades as fodder. The warriors rushed in using instantaneous movement. I caught you. Even if Saibane was a scary magician, his physical ability and reaction time couldn't be compared to a high-ranked dragon arts user. Saibane could bridge this gap using magic, but the dragon demon king worshippers sacrificed their lives to open up a path through the wall of magic erected by Saibane. It created a brief sliver of opening that allowed the warrior to reach Saibane. It was possible to cut Saibane down with his sword. In the next moment, the warrior's vision turned black. From the darkness surrounding Saibane, the dragon soul struck out like lightning, and it bit the warrior. The dragon soul could keep up with the movement of a high-ranked dragon arts user. The bone-chilling sound of the warrior being chewed up could be heard. Thank you. Saibane wasn't letting his dragon soul eat the warrior alive to instill fear into his enemies. The completion time of my spell was lessened by seven seconds. Saibane's dragon soul could heal other beings, but it also had another ability. It could suck out magical energy and life energy from the being it ate. It could transform that energy into dragon demon magic. It was an ability that was akin to black magic. Queen of Darkness. A tsunami of darkness spread outwards with Saibane at its epicenter. His dragon demon magic took another jump as countless corrupted beings started to form. While he was doing this, countless cursed swords continued to fly around. The screams of his enemies rang out. A-H-H-K. Saibane was slaughtering his enemies with overwhelming power. He was attacking them from outside the encircling net, and his spells were creating holes within their lines. Their formation was being collapsed by his attacks. Father. She was also draped in the magical energy of darkness. She was using almost the same magic as him. Father and daughter met each other in the air. Saibane spoke. I never expected a day to come when I would be able to fight by your side. I, Nibiris was about to say something, but she shut her mouth. She just put on a light smile. For the two of them, this was enough. Chain's battle plan was wrecked. Saibane was too big of a variable. Saibane had given the Book of Darkness to his daughter, yet he was still terrifying. It was almost unfathomable as to how he had picked up the nickname of Simpleton Prince. His abilities was that awe-inspiring. This. A wretched expression appeared on Chain's face. He watched the battle crumble around him. He suddenly looked backwards. As expected, he isn't someone I can end. The battle wasn't being lost all at once. His side had the absolute advantage in numbers, and they were all elite troops. However, the result was already determined. Others might not know this, but as the strategist of this force, he knew this to be true. Ha ha ha. We've built all of this for the past 200 years. We are merely capable of buying time. Chains smiled as he felt his end coming. It was an empty smile. He unsheathed his sword for the first time, and he waited for the right opportunity. 
I never expected you to come, Prince Saibane. It isn't something I've imagined happening even in my dreams. I've made all the preparations, yet the only thing I can do now is to leave it all up to fate. When Saibane entered the battle, the encircling net around Nibiris and Kiran had collapsed. When the three of them gained some respite, they started attacking the encircling net around Ragus. Saibane used his overwhelming magical energy to summon beings that could fight independently. He was able to have his fingerprints all over the battlefield all at the same time. This was something Kiran and Nibiris couldn't do. In the Dragon Demon War, Saibane had gone through all kinds of battle. He fought small and large battles. This was why he was able to effectively lead Kiran and Nibiris. It also helped that Nibiris had the same magical energy attribute as him. The three of them were able to work synergistically. In the end, a crack formed in the encircling net around Ragus. Roar! Accompanying Ragus's shout, a wave of translucent light shot into the air. Then, soul hammer. The ground flipped over, and earthquake spread outwards. A radius of 100 meters was destroyed around Ragus. The magic circles were broken, and the soldiers from the plane of darkness had to stop their assault. They had to defend against the attack. That was a pretty great welcome. You bastards. Ragus's voice rang out as earth shot into the air. Massive amounts of soil and rocks were sent flying in all directions at high speeds. It killed the panicked dragon demon king worshippers. Screams rang out. However, Ragus didn't attack them himself. The soul hammer created the wave of earthquake only once. Earth and rocks were used to kill unsuspecting enemies. Ragus was hidden from view from his enemies, and he wasn't fine. The magic circles had forcefully drained away his power, and he had suffered under the assault of 500 elite troops. Half of his armor was broken, and darkness was leaking out from inside the armor. He swayed on his feet, but he kept his body upright. Shit. I never expected to need strong fortitude to move my body even after death. He did not possess a living body, yet he felt pain from the magical attacks. His body could be damaged. Moreover, the magic circles still had residual effects on him, so his recovery was slowed. Monster. However, his enemies couldn't see him thanks to the cloud of dust. This was why the dragon demon king worshippers couldn't stem their fear. It was such a fierce attack that it could have pulverized a dragon several times over. They never expected him to be able to use an attack that could change the tide of battle. The only one that could assess the situation with composure was Chains. Don't stop attacking him. We cannot give the general time to recover his strength. Ragus had suffered a lot of Damga. Chains had prepared a trap that was more meticulous than the one used by the Human Alliance in the past. This was possible, because Chains knew Ragus's power better than anyone. However, Chains wasn't able to capitalize on this opportune moment like the Human Alliance during the Dragon Demon War. Ragus wasn't alone. In the past, he had ignored his orders. He had jumped into the trap without any allies by his side. On the other hand, Chains still had 5,000 troops at his disposal. We have to take down the general first. If we are able to kill the general in the allotted time, Saibane won't be too big of a threat. Chains moved hundred troops towards the edge of the encircling net. They were ordered to attack Saibane, Nibiris and Kiran. The remaining 400 troops would once again focus their attack on Ragus. Chains gave his orders. Even if he was able to buy time, it would be their victory. If they were able to hold out for a certain amount of time, they would be able to use an ace up their sleeve. It would guarantee their victory. However, Chains wanted to end the fight with Ragus before that happened. He wanted to end Ragus with his own hands. Chapter 245. Darkness Incarnate. Part 3. Even if he was able to buy time, it would be their victory. If they were able to hold out for a certain amount of time, they would be able to use an ace up their sleeve. It would guarantee their victory. However, Chains wanted to end the fight with Ragus before that happened. He wanted to end Ragus with his own hands. Ah, soon, Chains realized that there was a fatal flaw to his plan. His assessment of the situation was correct. He gave the best possible orders he could give. However, 
His soldiers couldn't properly carry out his orders. They were elite troops, but only a few of them had experienced the Dragon Demon War. Most of them didn't have experience in fighting extremely strong foes. Moreover, Regus was a legend in their eyes. When faced with these two realities, the shock and confusion felt by his troops was taking too large a toll. The swiftness and the precision needed to carry out the plans suffered as a result. Moreover, they weren't facing easy opponents that would let such an opportunity pass them by. Soul Hammer. Show me your will. Before the troops around him could increase the intensity of their attack, Regus started to rush forward within the cloud of dust. He minimized the magical energy allocated for his defense, and he tried to dodge as many attacks being rained down upon him. He compressed his power, and he brought down his hammer using all his strength. He wasn't attacking in order to affect the entire region. The seismic wave spread in a conical shape. Sir Regus. Go. Cybane started a fierce attack against the confused enemies. Corrupted beings and vindictive spirits wielded their cursed power against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. The horrible screams of the Dragon Demon King worshippers rang out. It really looked like hell had manifested in this world. Ha 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 ha. Black magic was known to violate death. It infringed upon what was called the final rest of living beings. There was someone laughing like a madman as this dark power defiled the battlefield. It was Chains. Regus was coming for him. Regus was destroying all the traps prepared for him. He was pushing through the troops under Chains' command. This truth made his heart race in a crazy manner. How long had it been since he'd experienced such excitement? Ha! It feels amazing. Yet I'm having a hard time breathing. This is why it sucks to have an old body. However, it is better than becoming a shriveled up undead. Are you insulting me? If you think that was an insult, I'm fine with that. Chains pointed his sword towards Regus, who was closing the distance at high speeds. The troops, who were tasked his guarding Chains, rushed forward to greet Regus. Regus sent the lead warrior flying. It was as if he swatting away a fly. However, these were elite troops. In an instant, they focused on their movement. They split off in both directions as they tried to attack from both sides. You should know your place, you brats. Regus used one of his shoulders to receive an attack. The attack glanced off his shoulder, and he used that same shoulder to blow away the head of an attacker. He let the other side of his body take on another attack. The powerful sword strike left a deep mark, but it couldn't penetrate the armor. The warrior was surprised by Regus's preternatural sturdiness. He tried to back out, but it was too late. Regus brought up his knee, and the warrior's body was pulverized. The magicians continued to let out beams of light as they tried to gain distance from Regus. He brought down his foot, and an explosion erupted underneath the magicians. Earth and rocks assaulted them. As expected, Chains laughed as he watched his underlings lose against Regus. There had been twelve troops guarding him. It took Regus less than ten seconds to break through them. Regus didn't even change direction as he fought them. The only thing that changed was the fact that his speed had decreased a little bit. Regus continued to charge in a straight line as he slaughtered everyone in his path. He approached Chains. Regus was clearly weakened. His armor was in tatters, and his magical energy was noticeably lower. Still, he was on a different level. He was all brute force. He was like a walking fortress, yet he was surprisingly fast. There was precision to his movements. He had cultivated his techniques until it could be called a work of art. Chains had raised his sword against such a being. He used his dragon arts to shoot out continuous beams of light. It was as if a dozen archers was shooting at Regus. It was a continuous stream of attack. Regus didn't stop let's go. Chains. Regus didn't care if the beams of light hit him or not. He didn't slow down at all as he arrived in front of Chains. Chains had stopped giving a fuck at that moment. He knew it would be useless, yet he attacked Regus when he came in range. He charged forward as he let out a sword strike containing all the power within his body. He greeted Regus, who was taking big strides towards him. An explosion rang out. In a flash, Chains' vision was dyed with darkness. He didn't feel any pain. He lost his five senses. 
He lost his sight, hearing, touch, smell and taste. When he regained them, his senses were so faint that he could no longer get a grip on reality. Ha ha ha. Chains laughed. He could see the sky. His messed up senses was starting to deliver their bleak information. His body had been sent flying. The battle was decided with a single strike. He thought about his past self as he put every ounce of his power into the attack. Regus answered him with a heroic counterattack. The attack ruthlessly broke his body, and he was sent flying for several dozen meters. It was a wonder that he hadn't died on impact. However, it wasn't a miracle. Chains knew this would happen from the start. He had made preparations, so he would be able to have a final conversation with Regus. A large shadow appeared above the dying chains. Chains saw two burning red orbs within this dark silhouette. When he saw this, he knew it was Regus. Him. What the hell? Your body is old and withered, but your spirit remains strong. Ha ha. Chains was laughing, but he suddenly vomited blood. He was dying, but he fought to stay conscious. He used his dragon arts, so his words were clear. Thank you for the compliment. It is shameful, but my spirit isn't strong. I'm a coward. Yes, your actions up until now was cowardly. You are still quite ruthless. Still, you fought like a man right now. You are going to the other side before me. Find a place for us, and wait for me. The day of our reunion won't be far off. Chains saw an illusion through his blurred vision. He didn't see the undead skeleton of Regus. It was a vision of Regus when he was alive. He saw Regus grinning towards him. In the past 220 years, he had gotten old, and he had lost his honor. He had fallen. He told himself that he had no choice, but he knew it was a poor excuse. If he had a firm resolve, he would have been able to choose a different path for himself. He used his injuries as an excuse. He told himself that he had to get along with the others. He used it as an excuse to not change the flow of events. He let himself be dragged along. This was why he was happy right now. Regus hadn't changed. Regus had died. He jumped 220 years to appear in this era as an undead, yet he remained the same. Regus was still his hero. I was afraid of standing by your side. Chain's vision became blurry as he confessed his true feelings. If I chose that path, I would have merely been an old man that had nothing. I would have become a burden that would be of no help to you. This was why he chose to go against Regus. In his ugly descent into corruption, he had built up a lot of things. He was able to become a powerful foe that could become a threat to Regus. Instead of dying as a useless burden, he decided to put everything he had on the line. He wanted to become a threat to Regus. He knew it was a cowardly choice. He knew this to be true, but he was already walking down that path before he knew it. It is the same now as in old time. You have too much unnecessary thought. That's your problem. Regus was baffled so he laughed. Then he spoke. Anyways, I had fun. What about you? I. Chain's voice faded away as he spoke. He smiled. It was fun. It really has been so long. These were his last words. A darkness erupted beyond the corpse of Chains, and it started to surge forth in front of Regus. Rishu returned to the plane of darkness when he received a Tyne summon. He should be protecting Seal of the God of Rest, but there were two reasons why he had left the job to Chains. First, Chains had prepared a trap for Regus if he decided to come that way. The other reason, Atain. Regus looked at the dragon demon that appeared from within the surging darkness. Atain floated in the air as his black hair whipped around him. He looked down at Regus. The surging darkness looked as if it would disperse into the surrounding, but it suddenly changed direction. The darkness gathered around Atain. No, it wasn't gathering only around Atain. A portion of the darkness was being sucked into Regus, and it helped in his recovery. As his magical energy was replenished, even his destroyed armor was restored. This is the darkness incarnate. Were you preparing this? This darkness was part of the great darkness. Regus was part of the great darkness, so he was able to receive benefits from it. A Tyne's dragon demon weapon had appeared in front of Regus. The darkness incarnate resolved itself into a clone. However, 
The clone was different from the one that had appeared when Almeric had died at the hands of Azel. Kaalia had interfered. Sir Atain couldn't manifest the clone fully. Atain was able to manifest a perfect clone here. Chains had bought enough time in his fight against Ragus. A silence descended upon the battlefield. Sibane stopped breathing for a moment. Father. Atain was his father. He was his teacher in magic. Furthermore, he was like a godlike figure in his eyes. It had been 220 years since he saw Atain last. He thought time had eroded his feelings, but he felt long-lost emotions come alive within his heart. Confusion and fear spread like a wildfire within his soul. Suddenly, Sibane flinched. He looked to his side, and he could see Niberus holding his hand. She was looking at Atain, but he could feel her hand shaking. When he saw this, he amazingly felt himself calm down. In place of fear and confusion, the new resolve he made when exiting the Alberton forest returned to his heart. Him. Atain had been looking at the empty air before he spoke. To be precise, his clone, which had manifested through the darkness incarnate, spoke. I never expected this. He never expected the process of manifesting the darkness incarnate to heal Ragus. Atain's consciousness had been sent to this place, and the first thing to catch his interest was this phenomena. As expected, you didn't intend to do it. I knew it wasn't like you to do so. You don't like a fair fight. If it is a fight against you, I might do something unreasonable like healing you. There are times when I do treasure my feelings over logic. The situation turned quite interesting. I was disappointed that Rishu wasn't here. It seems I was too hasty in feeling that way. Has it been 270 years since we've last met each other as enemies? It doesn't feel that long ago to me, but in reality, it has been that long. At times, Atain and Ragus had been allies. However, there were numerous instances where they had fought each other as foes. These two beings lived for a long time. The lifespan of a human wasn't comparable. Their stances and circumstances changed over time. Above all else, Ragus wanted to fight powerful foes. He would make up excuses to fight powerful foes. This was why he had challenged Atain numerous times. Atain spoke. I have seven wins, two losses and one tie against you. We will renew our fight, but it will also be our last fight. Don't give me that bullshit. Who said I won two times? I lost all ten times. Ragus refuted Atain's words. Chapter 246. Darkness Incarnate. Part 4. Even in the last fight, Ragus was unable to win against Atain. They fought ten times, and Ragus had lost all ten times. It really depended on what one considered to be a victory. Atain's criteria for winning was the achievement of his goal, and he looked at the terms of the fight. On the other hand, Ragus only determined the result of a fight based on whether he won an individual fight or not. There was a saying that said one could lose the battle but win the war. There were times when Atain won his personal fights, but his group lost the battle. That was why he considered it to be losses. However, Ragus disagreed with that assessment. I see. However, this will be a first for me, Ragus. What do you mean? This is the first time I'll be fighting you with the intent to kill you. Come dragon demon weapon. Darkness engraver sword. Sky's fortress. Son of earth. Atain summoned consecutive dragon demon weapons. He was holding a longsword made out of complete darkness, and it was like an absence in space. A translucent wall made out of light surrounded him, and an enormous hand made out of boulders erupted behind him. Ragus did nothing as he watched Atain summon his dragon demon weapons. Sibane, Niberus and Kiran didn't urge Ragus to attack Atain. They knew Ragus's action was foolish, but they could only swallow their sighs. I hoped he fixed that bad habit. Sibane let out a bitter laughter. When Ragus met a powerful foe, he waited until his enemy could be at his peak power. Even if he pushed an enemy into a corner during battle, he would stop if his enemy wanted to pull out an ace in the hole. He let his enemy use it against him. This flaw in his personality had not changed over the years. It didn't feel like distant memories to Sibane. He was deluged with memories that gave him stomach ulcers. However, it wasn't as if Ragus was doing nothing. While Atain summoned his dragon demon weapons, 
a change occurred within Regus. When he partially absorbed the great darkness, he dramatically recovered his magical energy. He amplified his magical energy to induce his transformation. His armor covered his skull, and his armor was dyed white. The magical energy of an undead changed into dragon demon magic. In a flash, his body contained power that couldn't be compared to his past self. Atain looked a bit surprised. You did it faster than expected. Regus had finished his transformation faster than expected. There were two reasons why he was able to do this. First, his reservoir of magical energy was filled to the brim when he absorbed by the great darkness. Secondly, Regus was used to his transformation now. If one thought about it, Regus had to adapt and evolve at breakneck speed after he awoke as an undead in this era. He had to get used to his undead body, and he had to optimize his battle techniques to fit his new body. His essence was within the great darkness, so he had to learn how to draw power out from the great darkness. At a glance, he looked like a simple brute. However, that was just his style. Regus was one of the experts that reached the zenith during the Dragon Demon War. His experience and talent didn't erode away just because he was an undead. You get used to doing things if you continue to do it. Regus used instantaneous movement as he brought down his soul hammer against the surprised Atain. He was so fast that it looked as if he had skipped a step. An explosion rang out. When the soul hammer impacted on the ground, it created an earthquake. However, the earth didn't get overturned. Atain had stealthily placed magical traps, and Regus's attack activated them. The magical traps created a dimensional distortion. I may be dumb, but do you think I'll fall for the same trick multiple times? Regus laughed. As soon as the dimensional distortion was used, Regus planted the soul hammer on the ground. The rebound caused his attack to change direction. He once again pushed off the ground as he used instantaneous movement. He attacked Atain. There was a wall of light around Atain. It was the dragon demon weapon called Sky's Fortress, and it blocked Regus's attack. After receiving a strike from the soul hammer, the wall shook fiercely, but it didn't break. It was too sturdy. However, the energy created from the impact wasn't entirely dissipated. Atain had been in the air, and the attack dropped him close to the ground. The shockwave tried to encroach into Atain's space. Hmm. Atain kicked off the ground as he moved backwards. He tried to let the attack flow off from him. Regus appeared in front of him. The soul hammer ruthlessly accelerated without reserve. It was a spectacular swing with massive power behind it. However, one could barely see the attack, because it was too fast. After his transformation, Regus became much stronger than his past living self. It wasn't, because his reservoir of dragon demon magic had increased. This was a difference caused by being an undead. Every ability of an undead was determined by how much magical energy one possessed. This was why his physical ability increased in an overwhelming manner. In the end, the sky's fortress was broken. Regus stomped on the ground once again, and the ground exploded. Earth and rocks started to attack Atain. However, the attack rapidly dissipated as it approached Atain. Atain had a dragon demon weapon that dealt with the power of Earth. It was possible to neutralize Regus's attack, because Atain had summoned the Son of Earth. Humph. However, Regus expected this move. While the Son of Earth blocked the soil and rocks, he made a frontal attack against Atain. Atain couldn't dodge it. When he came to this conclusion, he brought up his darkness engraving sword, and he charged forward. The shockwave assaulted the ground around them. Regus yelled out loud as he was sent flying. A streak of darkness moved through the air. It was as if someone was drawing in the sky with a brush dipped in black ink. It was a darkness that was absent of all light and mass. This alien darkness streaked all over the sky as a Tyne's clone appeared and disappeared like illusions. It was a Tyne's dragon demon weapon called Darkness Engraver Sword. After he regained his bearing, Regus landed on the ground, and he caused the ground to shake. Earth erupted upwards as it blocked the streaks of blackness. What is this? Are you trying to mimic a zell? It was as if the streaks of darkness was turning the day into night. The darkness engraver sword was creating this phenomena, but according to Regus's memories, 
This dragon demon weapon didn't have this ability. Atain appeared in front of Ragus. That's right. Atain's expression didn't change as he admitted his plagiarizing Azul's technique. Atain was the creator of magic, and countless beings had copied what he had created. This was why his pride wasn't hurt when he copied someone else's ability. In the next moment, Atain's fist pierced through the wall of earth erected by Ragus. His fist impacted on Ragus. Ragus had raised his arm to block the attack. Shockwave erupted outwards centered around the two of them. The sound rang out almost simultaneously. The first sound erupted when Ragus hit the ground several dozen meters away. The second sound rang out when Ragus slid for several dozen meters. Atain had used his dragon arts to pierce through Ragus's defense. It was a technique that could pierce through a dragon's hide to destroy its innards. However, Ragus used his sublime defensive technique to deflect the attack using his shoulder. However, that wasn't all he did. Hmm. Atain groaned. After deflecting the attack, Ragus returned some of the damage. He was able to damage Atain. What an old and tired technique. Ragus let out a heroic laughter as he kicked the frozen Atain. Atain broke apart into darkness, and several dozen magic circles appeared in the air. Ragus wasn't flustered. The destroyed clone was there to draw attention away from the real Atain, who was preparing to carpet bomb Ragus with spells. Dozens of fireballs, thunderbolts and cursed essences impacted on Ragus all at once. An incredible explosion rose into the air. When the spells detonated, part of the mountain nearby was destroyed. The aftereffects of the attack caused a landslide. Atain had hit Ragus with the full force of his attack, yet he didn't show any reaction. He just got ready to use his next attack. The earlier attack by Atain wasn't meant to be a killing blow. It was meant to stop Ragus from moving. The real attack would be coming next. He used the aftereffects of his previous spell to chain his next spell. It truly was a high-level magical tactic. The energy created by the carpet bombing was sucked into a tine surrounding, and it was gathered at a single point. Solar gaze. The energy was amplified to the extreme, and a destructive beam of light was shot towards Ragus. It was an attack so hot that it would vaporize rock. The beam pierced through the prior explosion, and a new explosion of light occurred. By the time the surrounding people realized what had happened, the heat and the destructive force of the attack had changed terrain of the battlefield. Ah, amazing. Kieran had been barely able to bring up his shield. He groaned. He was speechless. It was such an amazing way to use magic. He wasn't surprised by the destructive capability of the spell. He was surprised by how fast and easy Atain was able to use such spells. Moreover, Atain hadn't stopped his assault. Come dragon demon weapon. Gatekeeper of emptiness. Atain had been continuously changing his spell. He suddenly stopped manifesting his spells, and he summoned another dragon demon weapon. A portal made out of darkness appeared in front of him. It manifested as a large sphere with a diameter of 10 meters. At the same moment, an off-white colored beam of light shot towards Atain. It roiled around like lightning. An explosion occurred several hundred meters behind Atain. The gatekeeper of emptiness had the ability to connect two location. Atain had sent the light-based attack to a different location using the portal. Ragus, what happened? This isn't the you I know. Atain was truly puzzled as he appeared in front of Ragus. There wasn't a single scratch on Ragus. If it was me before my fight against Azel, I might have suffered significant damage against such an attack. When he fought Azel, Ragus had used the new ability of his soul hammer. He was able to redirect the damage using his soul hammer, and he was able to survive against Azul's sun lightsaber. However, he was a wreck after taking on that attack. Ragus knew his skill was lacking. This was why he worked on his defensive technique, and he was able to take another step forward. It didn't matter how fierce the attack was. If the attack was straightforward, he could predict the path of the attack. Ragus would be able to slip the attack. In the previous exchange, Atain had realized that his carpet bombing of spells would be unable to pierce through Ragus's defense. This was why he decided to use focus his attack. Ragus could have taken that attack head-on with his body, but he decided to defend against it. 
He was able to slip Atain's devastating attack while taking almost no damage. Atain let out a bitter laughter. I wanted to end this fight quickly, but it seems fights with you always devolve into a prolonged fight. I don't know. It isn't as if there aren't ways to end this fight quickly. Ragus raised his soul hammer as he spoke. I just have to pulverize you quickly. Ragus was about to kick off the ground, but suddenly, he flinched. He stopped in place. What? Atain spoke in a questioning manner, but he didn't finish his sentence. He immediately realized what had happened. You got me. Did you hide another force nearby? While he fought Ragus, Atain had kept an eye on Cybane, Nibirus and Kieran. He was able to do this through incarnation. It was possible using his clones. However, someone he hadn't sensed had broken the seal of the God of Rest. No, that's not it. Soon, Atain realized that he had guessed wrong. His gaze headed towards Cybane. It was you, Cybane. 